And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the universe of the uncanny. We live on such a tiny surface of space and time and try so hard to shut out the mass that lies beyond. But when the whispers die out and the echoes cease, a force still fills the void that remains. Evil spirits, malignant and destructive, waiting in limbo to be summoned by the foolhardy. In our tale, a young and talented student of the Talmud turns to a secret body of occult doctrine, the Kabbalah, to conquer death itself. Simon, why do you punish yourself so? To reach an exalted state. I wish, I wish to attain the possession of a clear and sparkling diamond and melt it down in tears, then inhale its essence into my soul. I want to attain the rays of a third planet of beauty. I want to... I, I want to... I, I want two barrels of golden pieces for him who can only count in gold. Oh, please, Simon. My father is not greedy. He only wants a bright future for me. And your bright future is paved with gold. Be careful, my son. You are on a slippery road. No holy powers will help you achieve what you want. If the holy powers will not, then I must... Don't, don't say it, Simon. You terrify me. Then I must find my way along another path. Our mystery drama, The Demon Spirit, was especially adapted from the classic S. Ansky play, The Dibbuck, for the Mystery Theater by Milt Wissoff and stars Norman Rose and Mason Adams. Black magic is rooted in the darkest corners of our mind and emerges only when we feel the insatiable need for power, money, love, any desire that becomes obsessive when withheld. It has always been so. Man has invoked the aid of spirits since he first evolved. What could be more natural for primitive man than the urge to call upon the supernatural when confronted with the sinister demons of wind, fire, and water? Civilization has only spread a thin veneer over this ancient instinct, a veneer that vanishes completely in our tale concerning a young theological student, pure of spirit, who invokes terrible forces in his quest for love. It's Simon, Rabbi. I've returned. May I come in? Simon, Simon. Oh, come in, my son. Come in. Well, so you've finally come back. You look so pale and drawn. I've had a long, hard trip. Why did you stay away so long? It's been almost a year. We missed you. Yes, you mean you missed me. That's not true. Many regard you highly. But not enough to consider me as a prospective son-in-law. But Leah thinks well of you. Not enough to oppose her father's wishes. There are traditions, Simon. A daughter must obey her father. Well, it's time we change them. Uh, look, Simon, Sender is no monster. He merely wants what he thinks is best for his daughter. Uh, come, Simon, let's talk about you. There's not much to say. You're a fool. A bright, intelligent, scholarly fool. Your brilliance was the talk of the community. And then you disappeared. Where did you vanish to? At first, I just, I just wandered aimlessly. And then, one day I heard about this small village where a great scholar and wonder worker lives. A man so steeped in the ritual and lore that he can make miracles. Mm -hmm. And did you find him? Yes, yes, Reb Meyer. I found him after months of wandering. Is he truly a worker of miracles? Even more wondrous than I had heard. Ah. Is your wonder worker a student of the Kabbalah? A master of it. He taught me that man can develop the divine spark within him until he masters the entire universe and all its forces. Mm, you're meddling with something beyond you, Simon. It shows in your fevered eyes, your gauntness. 
Don't dwell too deeply on these mysteries. Why not? The Kabbalah tears your soul away from the limits of the earth and lifts you to paradise. Now remember, only four wise men succeeded. Only one went in and came out again unscathed. One died, one went mad, and one lost his faith. I'm not frightened. They may have failed because they entered paradise for the wrong reason. I want to offer myself as a sacrifice, like the like the great one who succeeded. But how can you compare yourself I to... make none. I will follow my own road. Good night. It's Leia. Oh, come in. Come in, my child. Ah, uh-huh. how nice to see you. I'm not disturbing you, am I? Not at all. Uh, you remember Simon? Oh, well, of course I do. You've been away, Simon. Then you... You noticed. We missed you, even though you left without a word. There was nothing more to say. Red Meyer, you promised to show me the embroidered curtains of the ark. And so I shall. Aren't aren't you afraid to be in the temple so late at night? No. No, not afraid. Sad and touched. The walls look as if they've been wept over. I wish I could put my arms around this... Ancient, tear-stained wall and never leave. Tears are everywhere, Leia, not just here. And happiness, too. How does our Simon seem to you after his long absence? Pale. Have you been ill? Yes, but not of the body. But why do you punish yourself so? To reach an exalted state. I wish... I wish to attain the possession of a clear and sparkling diamond and melt it in my tears. Then inhale its essence into my soul. I want to attain the rays of the third planet of beauty. I want... I want... I want two barrels of golden pieces for him who can only count and gold. Please, Simon. My father's not a greedy man. He only wants a bright future and for And your me. bright future is paved with gold. Be careful, my son. You're on a slippery road. No holy powers will help you achieve what you want. And if the holy powers will not, then I must... Don't say it, Simon. You terrify me. And I must find my way along another path. Red Meyer! Red Meyer! Ah, good day to you, Sender. What brings you to the marketplace? Don't you trust your servants? I was looking for you. I'm bursting with good news. Yes, I know, I know. How could you? I've just... In a closed community, nothing stays secret very long. Congratulations. Who is this paragon you've betrothed your daughter to? A ah, fine young man. Completely worthy of becoming part of my family. Mm, I was curious. Uh, tell me, why did you stand in the way of Simon? Simon, but he's only a poor student. How would he fit... With the rich house of Sender? He loves Leia, and I'm sure that she loves him. She will love her bridegroom as well, I assure you. How can you guarantee what you cannot control? A heart is not a machine. I know my daughter. Red Meyer, I would like to talk to you about the arrangements for the wedding. No, 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 not here, Sender. Here one buys food and drink, not a life. Come to the temple, and we will talk. Simon, I have some food for you. And some news. Uh, Ramire, I'm not I'm not hungry. I'm afraid the news I have for you will it's not... not news to me. I was there with you at the market. But... I was there in spirit. I heard everything. Uh... Let her in, Simon, before she tears the walls down. Help me, help me with your prayers. Intercede for my daughter, the forlorn widow who was at death's door. Please, I beseech you, help me. We will help. pray and hope for the best. No, I need more than hope. I need help. And you shall have it. No, please, don't interfere, Simon. I must. Now. Take this diagram I've drawn, mark it out around your daughter's bed, the circle completely around, and the six-pointed star with a point toward her head. Slaughter a young fowl and touch her forehead with its freshly drawn blood. Stop! Stop that! I forbid this! What am I to do? He offers hope. I give you your daughter's life. Give me the diagram, Simon. I will follow you, and God bless you. Simon. 
Simon, I asked you not to interfere. You have gone too far. Not far enough. I still have a long way to go. But I am drawing nearer all the time. Watch, Rabbi. This is the Lord of the Gods. Lord of the universe, he whom the winds fear, thee I invoke, the bornless one, thee that didst create the earth and the heavens, the night and the day. Thou art the truth and matter, into the magic circle, power the hazel wand, shroud me with a cloak of darkness. Simon, Simon, come back before it is too late. He has covered me with the raven's wings. He has whispered the unnameable to me. I am master of many arts and skill. The black arts. No, Rabbi. When the curtain parts, all is visible. Black and white alike. No. No, Simon. It is time to sleep now. I am tired. You must go now. I'm no longer welcome here. You are to me, my son. But not to this temple. Go now! I'm here, Reb Meyer, to discuss the arrangement. Uh, Sender, you are certain that you want to go through with the marriage? As certain as I have been of anything in my life. Sender! Sender, I have something to show you. Hmm? Look at this object in my hand. Why? It's a golden amulet. Don't you recognize it? Hmm. It looks like the one I presented to you on your birthday. But it cannot be. Well, why not? Because that was not gold, Reb Meyer. But it is the same amulet, Sender. Sender, I have worked a miracle. Something many men have tried to do all of their lives. I have turned base metal into gold. I don't believe it. But it's true. Give me any object and I will convert it to gold for you. Think of it. I can make you rich beyond your wildest well, I dreams. I couldn't allow you Please, to... Sender, take my offer. Please, all I want is Leia's hand in return. Impossible, I have given my word. Weigh your word against gold, no, Sender. No, I must weigh it against my daughter's happiness. And that is my concern above all. Thank you, Simon. I bear you no ill feelings, but my daughter will be married as soon as Reb Meyer can make the arrangements. How can that be, Reb Meyer? I've done everything. The fasting, I've worked with the word, the spells, the symbols, all in vain. Uh, what will be, will be, Simon. Stay with me now. But what remains for me? What is there I can still do? Black Rider, fling back your hood. Demon and master, show me the way. Sh sh ah, I see. Thank you, the secret is revealed. I see you now. I see him, and I... Uh, I see... Oh, Simon. Uh, Simon, what is it? I have won. Ramaya, I have won. The bride is mine. It is said there are four indispensable conditions to knowledge and power in the black arts. An intelligence illuminated by study, an intrepidity which nothing can check, a will which nothing can break, and a steadfastness nothing can corrupt. Simon, it seems, was master of all. Will he then prevail even after death? We shall know more when I return shortly with Act Two. How can we explain the strength of superstition? Shall we ascribe it to the primitive, the ignorant? Then how can we explain the fact that British witch covens celebrated All Hallows' Eve before tremendous crowds with rites involving the magic circle, the magic knife, weird incantations, and all the other trappings of the occult. Many believe the origin and development of superstition are rooted in fact, that it exists and makes itself known to us. Perhaps we can shed some light on the subject. Red Meyer, it's so hard for me to believe that he's gone. He is, my child. 
He's buried there. Ah, poor Simon. Everything he did, he did with such intensity. He studied longer, prayed harder than any of my pupils. And his love? Was deeper than most. He died for it. I had a dream that I was wandering in the meadow when a storm arose. And I hid in a small hut until the rain stopped. It was very early morning and the vapors rose over the fields. And as they swirled, they took shape. Fred Meyer, it was Simon that appeared in my dream. He called to me, but I couldn't hear. And then he, he beckoned to me to follow him. But when I did, I awoke. It was a dream. Nothing more. We must leave here at once. Answer me, Red Meyer. Is Simon stronger than death? Is he still here? No. No, Leia. He is dead. You must remember that. He is dead and he will never come to life again. And you must live, my child. You must live with the living. Come now. Let us go. I thought I heard him so clearly. We'll meet again, my bride. My beautiful Leia. No one can take you from me now. I'm so happy you could come, Reb Meyer. This would be no wedding without you. How could I miss such an event? Did you happen to meet the groom's party? They should have been here by now. The bridegroom will arrive on time. That's not what you need worry about. What do you mean? Uh, nothing, nothing, Sander. I meant nothing. Return to your festivities. Uh, so I shall. Everyone! Everyone into the house! There are silver coins waiting for all of you there! Red Meyer, please stay with Leia until I return. I will be here. Leia. Leia, child, you're white as a sheet. Did they tire you with the dancing? Well, it was all so violent. My head swam. I grew faint. And then someone lifted me high in the air and carried me far, far away. Perhaps you should rest a while. I'll wait outside. No, no, Red Meyer. Stay. Don't think about demons and evil spirits. Go, Leia. Change your dress. The dancers have stained it. Freshen your beauty and prepare to meet your bridegroom. No, not yet. Will you come with me in the cemetery? Why? To visit my mother. She died when I was still so young. I want to invite her to join my father in leading me to the wedding canopy. And afterward... She will dance with me. No, no, Leia, I forbid it. But it's the custom, Red Meyer. Customs are not rigid, my child. You will not dwell with the dead, but with the living. Then I will invite her from here. Beloved mother, I invite you to my wedding. Come and stand near me under the canopy. <laughs> Your father, dear. May I come in? Oh, father, of course. Why are you still sitting here, child? Oh, I was just thinking. Grandmother says I must go to the graveyard. Mm, you have my permission. But Red Meyer says I should not go. Ah, he's an old man, set in his ways. Go, child. Go to your mother and shed your tears. May I invite her to the wedding? Of course. And your grandfather as well. And I would also like to invite someone who is not related. It is forbidden. If you invite a stranger, the other dead may take offense. He's not a stranger. In our house, he was like one of us. Uh, I think I hear... Yes, it is the wedding party. Your bridegroom, Menasha, he's arrived at last. But, Father, not I want now, to Not ask... now, Leia. I must meet the wedding party. Hello. Wait there, I'm coming. Welcome, Menasha. How was the trip? Oh, we had a hard and bitter journey. We lost the road and wandered about the fields for a long time. Menasha, you're shivering. Are you cold? Yes, I felt this chill since I approached your town. Penetrates the marrow of my bones and fills me with a, an uncertain and unknown dread. What is it you fear? I, I don't know. Ah. Come, let's have a drink on your safe arrival. It will warm you and drive away the demons. 
Who is it? Open the door, sender. What? What? What a shame. What? What's happened? What is it, Redmire? It's Leia. Bring her in. What? The... Put her on the couch. My baby. What has happened? You can go now, all of you. What? What is it, Redmire? My God, is she? No, 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 no. She's in a coma. How still she is. How lovely. How did this happen? She, she went to the grave despite my warning, and wept. And then suddenly she started to talk incoherently. No one could make out a word she was saying. And then she fainted. Oh, oh. Leia, huh? Leia, do you hear me? Everything will be all right. Who is the, this man? This is Menasha, your bridegroom. No, that's a lie. He's not my bridegroom, nor will he ever be. My child, <laughs> my child. What has come over you? I will not marry Menasha or any other man I do not choose. Sleep. Sleep now, Leia. Sleep and rest. We will talk about this in the morning. But we were to be married at noon. Yes. Is it wise to delay? Not wise, perhaps, but necessary. If you value the life of your daughter. Where is the physician? He had to leave. There was no point in keeping him any longer. Did you do as I told you? Yes, yes, I summoned the wise man of Bratislav. He will come, but it will be days before he's here. Oh. Oh. Leia. Oh. Leia, oh. how do you feel? Oh, tired. I'm so tired. Where am I? Where you have always been, in uh, your home. Turn down the lights. Mm. My eyes are... I've been in dark places so ah, long. You're, you're back now. God be praised. It was so cold where I've been. You'll feel better now that you're with us again. I feel nothing, Father. <clears throat> empty. Everything is so <clears throat> empty. I must go back again. Try I... to get out of bed, child. I have no place here. What's happening, Reb Meyer? Her voice, there. <clears throat> Leia, open your eyes. I cannot stay. I cannot stay. Wake up. Wake up, child. Listen to your father. You are not my father. You are not any part of me. Burning sulfur. I am filled with the smell of burning Leia, sulfur. in the name of God, Leia, come back. Oh, if I do, it will not be in that name. Redmire. Two days she lies there, and still no sign of the wise man. He will come, Sender. Be patient. Be patient? How can I? She was all I lived for. I have no patience either, Redmire. I love her so deeply. I cannot wait until we are man and wife. But you hardly know her. I know her as well as I have ever known anyone. She is dear to me. What more can I say? Open the door, Menasha. Good day to you, Reb Nissen. And a good day to you, Reb Meyer. Thank God you've come. We've waited so eagerly. That's not an easy journey from Bratislav, you know. You don't. Uh, can I offer you something? No, no, no. I wish to examine your daughter first. Oh, poor child. She hardly seems more than that. How, how long has she had that mark on her cheek? I have never noticed it. It, it seems more like a shadow. Yes, a dark shadow. I've seen it before. I will try to rouse her. God's world is great and holy. The holiest land is the land of Israel. In the land of Israel, the holiest city is Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the holiest place was the temple. Holy. Holy. Unholy. Religious evil is the whole. Where have you come from, spirit? I have risen from repose to bring an end to all this. Who are you? I am Leia, daughter of Sender, beloved of Simon. Beloved of Menasha. Be quiet, Menasha. Do not interfere. Rest easy, spirit. Hear me out. 
At the edge of the world stands a tall mountain, and on the mountain lies a great rock, and from the rock flows a clear spring. At the other edge of the world is its heart, and it gazes at the cool spring, and cannot have its fill of looking, but it cannot take the slightest step toward the spring. But I can't... Um, you uh, are awake, uh, my child. Have I been sleeping? Yes, yes, you have for several days. I, I feel so oh, tired. I'm so tired. I, uh, Is she all right? Uh, yes, yes, she sleeps naturally now. Oh, thank you, Redness. And Once she awakes, can we have the wedding ceremony? We must wait and see, Menasha. No, no, Redmire. We must not wait. We must try the wedding as soon as possible. There is no time to lose. Help me, Father. I feel so weak. Of course, my darling. I should have known. Here, take my arm. Stand by me, Mother. It is such a difficult way for me. She is here with you, as are all who love you. Friends... Friends, it's time for the ceremony. There's your Menasha. Look at him. So tall, so handsome. Quicker, Father. We must hurry. As we stand under this canopy. I will not stand under it. Come, closer, Leia. No, Come under the canopy. I will not. Send her, send her, usher her under. Ready the candles for the sleeping dead to wake till they are burnt down and spent. This is our final song until we return where we belong. Be still, my child. In the name of the King, our Lord, be still. Close the steps carefully, for this place is chosen ground. Seven times we turn around within the magic circle. Seven times we turn about. Malasha, do you take this woman to be your wife? With all my heart. Leia, do you take this man for your husband? Never! Leia! Never! He is not my bridegroom! Remire, Remire, continue! Never! Holy bridegroom, protect me! Holy bridegroom, save me from this! I call upon you! Save me! Remire, pronounce them man and wife! Remire! You will never pronounce them man and wife. They do not belong with each other. Simon, is that you? Aye, it is Simon Redmire. Come back for my destined bride, and I will never leave her again. You must not do this, Simon. Simon, what is happening here? Yes, Simon, my greedy friend. Simon, you murderer. You killed me, but you could not kill our love. Goodness, and my daughter... She's gone mad. No, no, Sender, not mad. She has been possessed by a Gibbuk. An evil spirit has control over her. The belief in possession is an ancient one. From the earliest times, men have been fascinated with the possibility that our earthly shell can be taken over by an alien form. And the horror of it haunts us, even today. How does a body become possessed? And how can we exercise it? We shall find out when I return shortly with Act Three. How did this act of possession begin? Certainly the setting of the Dybbuk was its basis. A closed world which, despite its proximity to the 20th century, had not as yet purged itself of faith in magic making. A world heavily tarnished with superstition. And yet, it was a world pervaded by a mystic sense of the immediacy of God, of the miraculous, and the power of man. In such a world, the natural and the supernatural, the living and the dead, seem to flow across one another in a continual contact. A world where the daily routine of life absorbs and becomes a symbol of eternity. Please, Reb, listen. I know you're tired, but my daughter lies in grave danger. Her soul is at stake. I know. I know. The misery and anguish of the world reach out to me. Every plea pierces me as a needle, and I... 
I have no more strength. I can go no further. Rabbi, you cannot desert me in my hour of need. Help me. Save my child. If I can. Now, the Dibuk. You knew him well. He ate at my house regularly until he left one day. When he returned to our town, he was meddling with the Kabbalah and came to grief. By what powers? They say by evil spirits. Did you cause him pain or shame? Now try. Try to remember. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. All right. All right. Bring in the girl. Come in, Leah. Come in, my child. Don't you hear me? Come in. I won't. Leia, dearest, have pity. Don't shame me. Come in. I want to obey, Father, but I cannot. Maiden, I command you, come in and sit down. Let me go. I refuse. Dibu, I command you to say, why did you enter the body of this maiden? I am her destined wife. Our holy Torah forbids the dead to abide among the living. I am not dead. You are departed from our world. You are forbidden to return until the great ram's horn is heard. Therefore, I command you to leave the body of this girl. Rab, listen. I know how powerful you are. How invincible. I know that you can command the angels. But you cannot sway me. Wandering soul, I feel great pity for you. I will try to release you from destroying angels. But you must leave the body of this girl. I will not leave. Dibuk, soul of one who left our world, I command you to leave this body, and in leaving not to harm her nor any other living creature... If you do not obey, I will proceed against you with anathema and excommunication with all the powers of exorcism. I do not fear your anathemas, and I do not believe in your assurances. In the name of Almighty God, I charge you for the last time. Go, or I will give you over into the hands of the destroying angel. God, I am joined with my destined bride, and I will not part from her forever. Send her. Send her. Have white robes brought. Bring seven ram's horns, seven black candles. Then take from the holy ark the seven sacred scrolls. Wait. Revenison, do you believe in justice? In justice and in truth? And I demand that Sender be brought before a rabbinical court. I demand a trial. On what charges? I charge Sender with spilling my blood. I am the son of Abraham ben Rifkin. I bring charges of an obligation that Sender had to my father, which he did not fulfill. In that case, I will postpone the exorcism until tomorrow noon. Sender, do you remember the Dibuk's father, Abraham? But he's dead these many years. Know then that you will be summoned to trial to answer his charges. Heaven help me. What does he want of me? What should I do? You must accept the summons. I will do as you say. Send for the bridegroom and Nasha. He must be at the trial as well. When the Dibuk leaves, the marriage will take place. Almighty God, help me to find peace. <laughs> Judges... Judges, sit beside me. We can begin the trial. I call upon Sender. I am here, Reb Nissen. Will you accept the verdict of this court? Yes. Will you carry out our decision? I will. Sender, Abraham claims that in your youth, you were students, that your souls were bound together in loyal friendship. You were both married in the same week, and each of you pledged that if his wife should conceive and bear a child, the one a boy, the other a girl, the children should wed. Yes, it was so. He died soon after, but you grew rich and Abraham's son was poor. You turned your gaze from him and sought 
other matches for your daughter among families of wealth and station. Abraham saw how his son was plunged into despair and went wandering, seeking new ways. And the powers of blackness spread their nets for him and captured him. <laughs> Sender. Sender. Did you hear the charges? What do you have to say in your defense? I have no words for my defense. None. But I beg my old comrade to spare my child. For I did nothing out of ill will, I swear to you, Abraham. After you departed, I did not know what happened to your wife. She left our village for the home of her people. I never knew she had a son. Abraham asks why, when his son was received into your home, sat at your table, you never inquired who he was. I do not know. But I can swear I was always drawn to him. Mm. Abraham declares that deep in your heart you recognize Simon. That is why you never asked who he was. You sought riches for your daughter, and in doing so, you thrust his son into the abyss. I cannot say. I have no answer. This tribunal has heard the arguments and now delivers its verdict. Sender, you are held guilty on the charges brought by Abraham. <laughs> you will give half your wealth to the poor, and as long as you live, you will light a memorial candle on the anniversary of the death of Abraham and Simon and recite the prayers for the dead as though they were your own children. Yeah. Now, let us proceed with the marriage ceremony. <laughs> Dibuk! Dibuk! In the name of this holy congregation and the great Sanhedrin of Jerusalem, I command you for the last time to depart. I will not leave. Members of the congregation, don your robes. Sender, distribute the seven horns and the seven scrolls. Yes. yes. Stubborn spirit, since you are not humble unto our command, I give you over into the power of the higher spirits to expel you by force. Blow the ram's horns. Let me go. Do not drag me. I will not. I cannot leave. Since the higher powers cannot conquer you, I will give you over into the middle powers that are neither good nor evil. Let them, by whatever cruel means at their disposal, tear you out. Sound the horns! Angels and hosts, help me! And I declare you excommunicated from all of Israel by the sentence of the angels, by the decree of the saints. We anathemize, cut off, and curse you. The Lord blot out his name under heaven and set him apart. For destruction. Uh, uh, Sound the horns. Uh, uh, I can struggle no more. Do you submit? I submit. Do you promise of your own free will to depart and never return? I promise. Recite the prayer of the dead for me. My appointed time runs out. Say Kaddish for his soul. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, I'm so sad. Help me. Do not be sad. Let your heart be light, and may holy cherubim cradle you in their wings. Do you hear? They're going to dance around the holy grave so that my dead mother may rejoice. Do not tremble, child. Do not be afraid. You are guarded by 60 giants with drawn swords. Our holy patriarchs protect you from evil. Leia. Simon. I hear your voice. 
face, but I... I cannot see you. A forbidden circle rings you round. Your voice sounds as sweet as the weeping of a violin on a silent night. Oh, who are you? I have forgotten. Only in your thoughts can I remember myself. I remember now. My heart was drawn to you as a bright star. On silent nights, I have shed sweet tears. And always in my dreams, I saw... Was it you? It was. Yes, I remember. Your hair was soft and it glistened as though with tears. Day and night I thought of you. Return to me, my bridegroom, my husband. I will carry you in death in my heart. And in my dreams we will rock our unborn babes. We will sew them clothes and sing them lullabies. The wedding procession has started, Leia. We must go. They come to lead me to the canopy with a stranger. Come to me, my bridegroom. Oh, I see you. A light upon the wall. The barrier is broken. Come to me. I am coming. A great light flows about me. I am joined with you, my destined bridegroom. Too late. Blessed be the true judge. May their poor souls find rest. And so the demon bridegroom and his bride are joined until the great awakening. A small gravestone marks the place where Leia, daughter of Sender, is interred. But none of the villagers in the closed world believe it is her final resting place. Steeped in superstition, they cast an eye over the shoulder when they pass the grave. I'll be back shortly. scoff at the supernatural, but not in the dark, when strange sounds echo, and even the most rational of us find more and more natural what was once deemed the supernatural. Minds have been linked across great separations of space without visible means of contact. If mental telepathy and magic shapes exist, why not other forces still branded as the supernatural? Our cast included Norman Rose, Mason Adams, Marion Seldes, Nat Poland, Joe Silver, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Wheaties presents Night Beat. On stage tonight from Hollywood, Night Beat, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Night Beat.
Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories begin in many different ways. And sometimes when you start digging for the facts behind a story, you end up by finding that you've dug yourself a grave. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. On a hot August afternoon back in 1936, young Bobby Feller stepped out on the mound and started his first major league game as a Cleveland Indian. He was just 17 years old. Bob, step up here and tell us what happened that day. Well, Ed, I was really loaded with Wheaties for that game. I struck out 15 St. Louis Browns. You uh, think the Wheaties helped, eh, Bob? Ed, I'll tell you, Wheaties always help. I've been eating them for pretty near 20 years, four or five times a week. And Wheaties with milk and fruit are still my favorite breakfast dish. That's wonderful, Bob. Thanks for stopping by, and best wishes to our real Wheaties champion. Yes, thank you, Bob Feller. And folks, did you hear what the man said? Wheaties always help. Now, you may not play baseball for a living, but you can use whole wheat energy, too. You try it. Breakfast of champions. Have some and see yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. If anyone had told me once about seeing flying saucers in the sky, I'd have tagged him either as a joker or a candidate for the booby hatch. But nowadays, anything is possible, apparently. You know, you could tell me that you saw a little man from Mars three feet high, and I, I wouldn't disbelieve you. Because tonight, I saw someone almost as strange. Fred Mola's bookshop is a shabby little place amidst a teeming stretch of tattoo parlors and penny arcades. It was the book in his window that caught my eye as I was passing. An early edition Bible, richly bound in antique leather, hand-tooled and inlaid with heavy gold leaf. It stood out against the books that surrounded it like a 90-carat diamond in a display of 10-cent jewelry. I looked up. And there was Mr. Mola watching me through the dusty window with the smile of a man holding in his fear. And I went in. Hello. Uh, a little early, aren't you? Early? <laughs> it's almost 10 o'clock. I know. I'm just looking at that old Bible in your window. You are a collector of old Bibles, no doubt. No, no, not, uh, not exactly. I, <laughs> I just happened to see that same book on Mr. Ron Heileman's living room floor the night he was murdered about six months ago. I am aware of that. Uh, oh? Uh, you mind if I have a look at it? You brought the money with you? No tricks? No tricks. Look, all I want to do is see the book. One moment. Uh, how much do you want for it? The price is still $50,000. 50, uh, 50 Are you kidding? I said no tricks. You've already agreed on the price. Oh, you've got your wires crossed. I haven't agreed to anything. Who do you think I am, anyway? Aren't you the man... The name who... is Stone, Randy Stone of the Chicago Star. Oh, a newspaper reporter. I'm sorry, Mr. Stone. I thought you were a messenger from one of my customers. He was supposed to be here at 10 o'clock. Yeah, sure, uh... If you don't mind my asking, why is this book worth $50,000? Why, uh, this, sir, is one of the finest volumes of its kind in existence. Published in 1513 by Martel, the contemporary of Caxton. Yeah, but uh, I know enough about books to know that $500 would be plenty. Uh, do the blood stains on the cover increase the value? Blood stains? It was lying on the floor in Heilemann's study when the police found the buddy. Ron Heilemann had been stabbed with a pair of desk shears. Yes, sir. Terrible thing, murdered by his uh, houseboy, wasn't it? Uh, a man named... Canto, uh, Willie Canto. That still doesn't make the book worth $50,000. Well, there's something different about this book. Oh, is that so? Oh, this book is the black gospel. Uh, oh, don't, fine. Thanks. Don't rush away. It's very interesting. For instance, the first 12 sections are the first 12 books of the Bible. Uh, can you read this old English script? Well, not as well as an old Englishman, but I can try. Read it. And he burnt the house of the Lord at... What's this other stuff that follows on the next page? Hail to thee, Lucifer. What is this, anyway? Uh, don't you see? It's the beginning of the black gospel. The devil's Bible. What's that? Well, you see, in the year 1513, possession of this sort of literature was a sure passport to the gallows or the stake. Hmm. Now, here's the invocation to Satan himself. 
summoning him up from hell, which was considered the most potent of all the spells used in which... Press them all away, you're trying to keep me here. Well, uh... You're not sure whether this messenger you're expecting at 10 will come with money or a gun, is that it? Oh, really, now? Well, if you're afraid, why don't you call a cop? I got work to do. I can't stay here and play bodyguard. Wait, uh, please. The police wouldn't understand. Well, if it's that kind of a deal, then all I can suggest is uh, you make with a spell, call up the devil, let him protect you. I'm going. Some of these prayers to Satan are remarkable, Mr. Stone. Here, uh, let me read you one. Oh, well, if it'll make you feel better. Hail to thee, Satan, Lord of Death. Praises to thee, Prince of Destruction. Uh Uh-huh. Let transgression of the wicked be glorified and the purple testament of war be proclaimed. Take us, Lucifer, son of the morning, for we are thine. Good evening. Mola's eyes popped at the apparition that had appeared behind us. He'd come in soundlessly through the open door, a bearded man in a black turtleneck sweater, dark trousers, and black sneakers. What do you want? The book. I came to get the book. What? What book? The one you have there. The Devil's Bible. Who sent you? Don't answer that. Mr. Stone, if you don't mind, sir, this happened to be my business. Virgil said it would be here. Who? Virgil, my guide. Who are you? Mr. Stone, I'm I'm going to close in a few minutes, if you don't mind. Good night. Oh, so this is your messenger. Now it's time to get rid of me. Is that it, Mr. Mona? What's your name, pal? Dante. Uh, Dante. Did you bring the money? Money? What money? Well, this doesn't look like your $50,000 to me, Mr. Muller. I need no money. Get out of here. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Dante, what's your last name? I am Dante Alighieri. Uh, oh, the 14th century Italian poet who wrote the Divine Comet. Oh, he's a madman. Yeah, but he writes like a dream. It was Virgil who took me to purgatory. My Beatrice led me through paradise. We walked with the angel. First it's a newspaper report, and now it's a lunatic. Princes of hell, Zamiel, Asmodeus, and Apollyon, they are powerless before me. Their testament is mine. Now give it to me. Get out of here. I tell you, it's mine. Mine. Keep your hands off it. Easy, Danny. Let go. That's better. Now get out. The fawn in the turtleneck sweater left reluctantly, looking back over his shoulder as he eased out the door and slipped off into the night. And as I watched him go, I had a funny feeling that somewhere, sometime, I'd seen that strange, thin face with the high cheekbones and the pointed ears before. I headed for the garage to pick up my car. I wondered where he'd gone and where he'd come from. And then suddenly... There, across the street, leaning against a lamppost, staring back at the light still shining in the bookshop window a block away, I spotted him. I stepped off the sidewalk and hurried toward him. He turned abruptly, and I called, Hey, Daddy, wait! But he fled into the darkness. When I got to the office, I figured that Mola's little bookshop might make the basis of a human interest yarn if I tied it in with the breakup of the late Ron Heilemann's famous book collection. So I had our librarian, Benny Marcus, dig out the files on the case from the morgue. I found something that made me do a fast take. What is it, Randy? Well, I just looking at the picture on this story. Huh? Oh, Mrs. Beatrice Heilemann, huh? Ain't bad, is she? Young enough to be Heilemann's daughter instead of his widow. Well, they say he was the connoisseur. No, that's not the picture I'm looking at. This one, Willie Canto. Huh? Hey, what are you doing? I'm just drawing a set of whiskers on Mr. Canto's skinny face. Randy, what kind of fool look, is this? Look, look, Benny, look. I just brought a dead man back to life. What are you talking? Willie Canto with a beard or his double. If it is, Willie, I'd better get over to Mola's bookshop, but quick. Well, why? He's killed one man already. Fred Mola could be number two. I'd have called the police if I hadn't been afraid of raising a false alarm, which proves that silence is sometimes a poor substitute for brains. It was raining as I pulled up in front of Mola's bookshop. I saw that his lights were still on. The black gospel had not been replaced in the window. When I went in, it was neither on the counter nor anywhere that I could see. The place was deserted. I walked to the door of the back room and knocked. Mr. Mola? Mr. Mola? 
Where's that light switch? Ah. Well, it's his office. He must have... Mr. Moeller. The old man lay sprawled on the floor. I knelt beside him. His body was still warm, but he was quite dead. A small black bullet hole in the center of his forehead explained why. General Mills is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Hi there. This is Frank Martin, the man about the Wheaties. You know, I like talking about Wheaties on Night Beat because our star really eats them. And incidentally, I eat them. The burning question is, do you eat them? Truth is, millions of Americans do. Do eat Wheaties. And I have a hunch one reason is that Wheaties taste so good. Nothing I can say about crisp flakes and all that will tell you half so much as the fact that millions of us eat them and love them. So, not one more word will you get out of me right now on the good, solid, whole wheat taste of Wheaties. You try them and you'll know all. Now, of course, there's another reason why so many millions of us dip into Wheaties come breakfast time. It's the whole wheat energy. The wonderful energy that makes the whole morning go better. There's a whole kernel of wheat, for goodness sake, in every flake of Wheaties. That's why they give so much. That's why they're so poppin' full of vitamins and minerals for your good morning. That's why Wheaties with milk and fruit starts a breakfast to remember. So why don't you join us tomorrow morning, us millions of Wheaties eaters? Make yours breakfast of champions, too. Join us, and you'll see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Do that, huh? Now, back to Night Beat and Randy Stone. When Willie Canto showed up at Old Man Mola's bookshop, I didn't recognize him at first. After all, he was supposed to have drowned himself after he killed his boss, Ron Heileman. I hurried back to the bookshop and found that Mr. Mola was dead, a bullet through his head, and the book he'd been trying to sell for $50,000 gone. I reached for the phone. Hmm. The phone is dead. You must have cut the wire. Yes, I did. Oh. Willie Cantle. My name is Dante Alighieri. Yes, yes, I remember that. You've been standing behind the door all this time pointing that gun at me? Yes. Now, look, uh, Dante. Don't come any closer. I, I must kill you. Why? You usually kill your friends. You're no friend. But I am. Oh, then why did you plot to harm my Beatrice? Beatrice... Oh, yes, Dante and Beatrice, I, I forgot. You have made spells against my Beatrice, but you are finished. You must die. The book can't save you now. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's talk some more, Dante, old boy. So you've got the book, huh? N- no. Virgil has taken it. Virgil, oh. Oh, sure, Virgil, of course, your guide through hell and purgatory. Um, where is he now, in the Chinatown at night? Well, that's enough of talk. It makes my head hurt. You must die. You don't want to kill me, Daddy Chum. If you killed me, you'd be a murderer. No. You'd never see paradise with Beatrice. You'd go to hell. No. Give me the gun, Cano. No. No. We stood facing each other about 12 feet apart while he struggled with himself. I couldn't afford to wait. A little pressure on that trigger and I'd be featured in the obituary column. I tense for a spring and then... Willie Cantle's gun hand fell to his side, and his dark eyes were suddenly filled with tears. I stepped forward and took the automatic from his long finger. I should kill you, but I... I cannot. I cannot. Oh, don't feel too bad about it. I don't. Now, let's get on out of here and go for a little drive. The fresh air will do us both good. Ah, the rain stopped. There's my car. We... Hey, Willie, come back here. Cato, come back or I'll shoot. I wasn't going to, of course, but on the bare chance it might give him pause, I pointed the gun to the sky. The shot seemed to give him jet propulsion. He dived into an alley and vanished. I turned around and headed back toward my car. 
I got there just as a couple of prowl cars pulled up behind mine. Down. Oh? Well, Sergeant Blank. Sergeant, oh, you call the police. Why didn't he give you a name? You bashful or something? I haven't had a chance to call anybody yet. Well, somebody called and said that some guy just killed a fellow that runs this bookshop. What are you doing with that gun? Oh, don't look at me like that, Buzz. It belongs to a fellow who was found dead in the river three months ago. Well, who gave it to you? He did. Huh? What are you talking about? Willie Canto, the fellow who killed Ron Heileman. He's as big as life and he's twice as crazy. You're the one who's crazy. Everybody in the Heileman household identified Canto's body. His wife, his secretary, John Talbot, the butler, the gardener. So they uh, made a mistake. Then we better go out and have a talk with Mrs. Beatrice Heileman. If Cantor's on the loose, he may be planning to call on her. Mind if I come along? The Heilman estate featured a lot of formal gardens, two or three guest cottages, and a mansion about the size of Mount Vernon. The only thing that could have made the interior more early American was a stuffed Indian over the mantelpiece. Tears shimmered in Beatrice Heilman's lovely violet eyes as Sergeant Black told her what had happened. Oh, poor Willie. I guess I was wrong when I identified that body as his. But even John Talbot, my husband's secretary, thought it was he. I don't want to alarm you, Mrs. Heilman, but there's a chance Canto may show up here. Oh, but Willie wouldn't harm me. Why, he was always devoted to me. He was devoted to your husband, too, but look what happened. I still can't believe it. My husband was so kind to him, so... so gentle. He even tried to teach Willie to understand some of those... dull books of his. Like Dante, hmm? Dante? Why, that was my husband's nickname for Willie. How did you know? Willie thinks he is Dante. Oh? Mm -hmm. Ron was always giving people the names of characters in his books. Sometimes I don't think they were very complimentary. But I was never too sure. Uh, who was Virgil? Virgil? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's what he called his secretary. John Talbot? Yes, Mr. Talbot. John Talbot, Virgil. Hmm? I suppose he doesn't work here anymore. Well, yes. I've needed him to help me wind up my husband's estate. There were so many things to be done. Why? Does he live here on the premises? Yes, but he isn't in town now. Poor man's been working so hard cataloging the rest of those books that I, I told him to take a week off. He left yesterday. I see. Where'd he go? He mentioned something about fishing in Minnesota. Well, thanks, Mrs. Harleman. Homicide will probably talk to you about this further. But in the meantime, keep your doors and windows locked, just in case. Oh, I'll be careful. Thank you. When we stepped out into the night, it begun to rain again. Sergeant Black drove off to make his report to headquarters, and I stopped to light a cigarette and try to make some sense out of the mess. And then I saw a dim figure emerge from a side entrance to the big house. The figure of a man standing momentarily in a yellow fuzz of light that shone from the open door. A small, familiar silhouette. The door closed and the darkness swallowed him, but there was no doubt about it. It was Willie Cantor. I jumped out of the car. Willie! Willie! I caught sight of a shadowy figure as he whirled and ran toward the back. Willie! He headed toward the guest cottages, barely visible in the faint glow of a distant street lamp. And for a moment, I lost him. Then I heard him leap across the veranda, one of the cottages, and I charged after him. He didn't have time to bolt the door in my face. Willie, what's the matter with you? Just want to have a word. Where are you? Turn on the light. Where's the switch? Wait. Well, that's better. What are you scared of? You... You're the police. What gave you that idea? I heard you. In the house, you were talking to my Beatrice. Oh, I see. She knew you were there all the time, didn't she? Why, yes, of course. I was in the next room. Well, I'm not with the police. I'm just a broken-down reporter. So put that nice big knife down, Willie. Hmm? First a gun, then a knife. You're a bad boy, Willie. What do you want of me? That knife, put it on the dresser, and then we'll talk. Now, that's better. Now, what were you doing out there in the rain? Going away. Far away. Why? She says, if I love her, I will go away. Farther than before. Than before? Where was that? Where have you been spending the last six months? On the island. What island? Where Mr. Heileman has his summer cottage. So she told you to go there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's so kind. She gives me money. She sends me food. But 
It's so lonely. I, I, I had to see her. Why, why does she tell me to go? She told me before she loved me. Beatrice doesn't change. She's kind and generous. Her heart is like gold. Yes, yellow and hard. What? Did she ask you to kill Mr. Harlan? Oh, no. I, I, I wouldn't kill her. Yes. Yes, I killed him. It was me. I killed him. Pretty mean, wasn't he, Willie? Oh, no. He was a nice man. You kill people who are nice to you? No, I... I wouldn't. I killed him. Beatrice wouldn't want you to lie, not even for her sake. She'd want you to tell the <laughs> truth, Willie. Did the secretary stab Mr. Harleman? No. But he killed a man in the bookshop. Yes. And you know who killed the man who was so good to you, Mr. Heileman, don't you? Don't you, Willie? You know. You saw it, didn't you? You know who killed him. Yes, I know. Go on, Willie. Tell me. Tell me what you saw. I... I saw through the door into the library. Mr. Heileman was there and Beatrice. Yeah? What were they doing? He says he knows about Beatrice and Virgil. He says he will get a divorce. Yeah? Go on. Then what happened? She... She picked up the scissors and... Uh, no, no, I, I did it. I did it. She told you to say that, didn't she? Uh, I, I... What happened uh, after she stabbed him? She... She... She ran out of the room. I... I went in. And Mr. Heilerman was trying to get up. He said... He said, Willie, get me some paper. Some paper. Well, there was no paper. There was... There was only the book. <laughs> My book. And I put it on the floor so that he could write. The Black Gospel? Yes. Yes, he wrote in it. On the empty page in front, he said. Give this to the police. They will know who killed me. Well, why didn't you? I, I, I was afraid. For, for Beatrice. And she comes in again and Mr. Talbot is with her. They say that I must go away. You never told them what Mr. Heilerman wrote in the book? No, of course not. They'd never sold it with the rest of the collection. Well, I, I don't remember. Everything is all mixed up. So that's why it was worth 50 grand. What? What do you say? Nothing, nothing, Willie. So they identified that body as yours, hoping the police had dropped the search. Oh, you're lucky to be alive. Uh, Mr. Stone. Everything falls into place. Not a pretty picture, but it's clear enough. That's unfortunate, Mr. Stone. <laughs> It was our old pal, John Talbot, the secretary. He stood in the open door of the next room, framed against the darkness. I hadn't seen him since the inquest on Heilerman's death, but he hadn't changed. He was a slender, handsome man, looking like a college professor in tweeds and rimless glasses. The type generally pictured carrying a pipe or a book. But what he was carrying was a snub-nosed 38 revolver. A touching little tale, Willie. Virtue! Does that gun mean I should have knocked before entering? Opportunity is always welcome, Mr. Stone. Whether it knocks or not. Opportunity for what? To dispose of an unforeseen problem. Oh, meaning me, I suppose. Meaning both of you. It's Beatrice. Her footsteps. John, it's all right. They're gone. I've been waiting for you. They... Oh, Mr. Stone. Willie. Beatrice, I was going away, but Mr. Shut Stone... the door. John, what is this? Why the gun? It seems that your faithful Dante has been talking to this newspaper fellow. What? Rather extensively, I'm afraid. Willie, have you gone crazy? Oh, Mr. Stone wouldn't harm you, Beatrice. You wouldn't touch her, would you, Mr. Stone? Uh-oh, -uh, not without gloves. What did he tell you, Mr. Stone? That lunatic. And you believe him? John, is that why you're holding a gun? You fool. What does it matter what Willie said about me? There's no proof. You consider yourself safe just because I destroyed that wretched book. Oh, no, my dear. That's not enough. I've got to silence them. Put away that gun! Let go of me, you little fool! This fellow knows too much! I can't stand anymore! Let I can't go. stand it! Let go of my arm! So many terrible things! I can't stand it anymore! I said let go! Oh. You! You hit her! You hit her! Willie, no! I'll kill you! Get back and drop that knife! Oh. Willie Canto staggered as I leaped forward and knocked the gun from Talbot's hand. Talbot reeled backwards and sat down heavily on the sofa behind him. It was then that I saw the dagger in his side and the red stain spreading. Beatrice stood with her back against the wall, her eyes wide, staring at Talbot. And then at Willie, lying doubled up on the floor. And suddenly she gave way. I snatched up the gun and went to the phone. 
As I reached for it, I saw that Willie had risen to his hands and knees, his thin face glistening with sweat. He began to crawl towards Mrs. Heilman, one hand reaching out for her, his eyes glazed with pain. Beatrice. My Beatrice. No! Beatrice. Don't touch me. Beatrice. Keep away. I can't stand you. No! 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 Beatrice, come back. Oh, please, please. My Beatrice. Dante's Inferno. Hello, operator. Get me the police. Well, the clock hands are converging on four, pinching out the last hours of the night. The rain has stopped and a new moon is out. No lover's moon, but thin and curving. Like a knife or a dagger. The curved dagger that Willie Canto used. Poor Willie. He wasn't the first who was betrayed by what he thought was love. Love is like eating mushrooms. You don't know whether it's the real thing until it's too late. Oh, well. Copy, boy. You are listening to Night Beat on the Wheaties' Big Parade. If you're a mother or a father with a warm spot in your heart for pink-cheeked, happy-eyed youngsters, here's something you should know. Good food builds good health, and Wheaties are good food. Now, I don't know what you've been doing about breakfast with the kids, but did you know that there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake? With a sunny, wholehearted goodness of field-grown wheat in every flake? With the full strength of whole wheat vitamins, minerals, proteins in every flake? It's true. Whole wheat in all its richness. That's what you furnish when you fill the cereal bowl with Wheaties. Don't slip up. See that they get Wheaties. Crisp, sunshiny, good. Pour on the milk, put on the fruit, and know the youngsters are getting all that whole wheat can give. Do that now. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. <laughs> Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis and edited by Larry Marcus. Tonight's story was written by Irvin Ashkenazi with music by Frank Worth. The part of Willie Canto was played by Ben Wright. Beatrice Heileman was Lorene Tuttle. Others in tonight's cast were Fritz Feld, Herb Ellis, Tudor Owen, and Lou Krugman. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Three Secrets, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen also on Tuesday, that's tomorrow night, to the Penny Singleton Show on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. This is Frank Lovejoy reminding you of today's biggest bargain, United States savings bonds. You pay for three and you get four. Save with United States savings bonds and build your own future. Night Beat came to you from Hollywood. Stay tuned for the first piano quartet on NBC. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight's presentation, The Little Prince, by the late Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. an accident with my airplane in the desert of Sahara. Something was broken in my engine. Being alone, I set myself to attempt the difficult repairs. It was a question of life or death. I had only enough drinking water to last about a week. 
The first night, I went to sleep on the sand a thousand miles from any human habitation. You can imagine my amazement when at sunrise I was awakened by an odd little voice. If you please, draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet completely thunderstruck. I saw a most extraordinary small person who stood examining me with great seriousness. He seemed neither to be fainting from fatigue or hunger, or thirst or fear. When I was able to speak, I said, What are you doing here? If you please, draw me a sheep. I... I don't know how to draw. That doesn't matter. Draw me a sheep. When I was only six, I had drawn a picture of a boa constrictor. From the outside, digesting an elephant. The grown-ups couldn't understand it. They told me it looked like a hat. They advised me to lay aside my drawing and devote myself to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. I did because it's tiresome for children to be always and forever explaining things to them. Would you please draw me a sheep? The little fellow was so insistent I took out my pen and some paper. Since I had never drawn a sheep, I drew for him my picture of the boa constrictor that looked like a hat. No, no, no. I do not want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is very dangerous, and an elephant is cumbersome. Where I live, everything is very small. What I need is a sheep. Please draw me one. I made several attempts. Then, being in a hurry to start working on my engine, I tossed off a drawing of a box that had some air holes in it and explained that the sheep was inside. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think this sheep will require a great deal of grass? Oh, there will surely be enough. It's a very small sheep I've given you. Not so small. Look. Look through the air hole. My sheep has gone to sleep. It took me a long time to learn where he came from. It was only from words dropped by chance that little by little everything was revealed to me. I learned, for example, that the little prince came from another planet and that his planet was scarcely any larger than a house. I should remind the grown-ups that in addition to the great planets, there are hundreds of others, some too small to be seen through telescopes, called asteroids, which are designated by numbers. The planet the little prince came from is asteroid B612. As each day passed, I would learn more about the little prince's planet. On the third day, I heard about the catastrophe of the baobabs. Isn't it true that sheep eat little bushes? Yes, yes, that's true. Then it follows they also eat baobabs. Baobabs? But it would take a herd of elephants to eat anything as gigantic as a baobab. Before they grow so big, don't baobabs start out by being little? Entirely correct. But why do you want the sheep to eat the little baobabs? I knew a planet inhabited by a lazy man. He neglected three little bushes. What happened? Catastrophe. The baobabs spread over the entire planet, bored clear through it with their roots, split it in pieces. So you must be careful. It is a question of discipline. I must attend to my planet each morning, as I do myself. It's tedious. I need the sheep. On the fifth day, thanks to the sheep, the secret of the little prince's life was revealed to me. If a sheep eats little bushes, does it eat flowers? A sheep too? eats anything it finds in its reach. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes, even flowers that have thorns. The thorns? What use are they? Don't you ever let go of a question once you've asked it. Can't you see I'm busy fixing my plane? There's so little drinking water left, I must finish the repairs. But you haven't answered my question. All right, all right. The thorns are of no use at all. Flowers have thorns just for spite. Oh, I don't believe you. Flowers are weak creatures. They are naive. They reassure themselves as best they can. They believe that their thorns are terrible weapons. 
And you actually believe that the flower... No, 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 I don't believe anything. I answered you the first thing that came into my head. Now, don't you see, I'm very busy with matters of consequence. Matters of consequence? You, you talk just like the grown-ups. The flowers have been growing thorns for millions of years. For millions of years, the sheep have been eating them just the same. It is not a matter of consequence to try to understand why the flowers go to so much trouble to grow thorns which are never of any use to them. Now, just a moment. If I, like... I knew one flower which is unique in the universe, which grows nowhere but on my planet, which one little sheep can destroy in a single bite some morning without even noticing what he is doing, you think that is not important? I don't. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize. Now, the flower you love is not in danger. I, I, I'll draw you a muzzle for your sheep. I'll draw you a railing to put around your flower. I didn't know what else to say to him. Night had fallen. I had let my tools drop from my hand. Of what moment now was my hammer or thirst or death? There was a little prince to be comforted. I felt awkward and blundering. I, I didn't know how I could reach you. It's such a secret place, the land of tears. So that's why you left your tiny home on asteroid B612. It was love. Love for a flower. A flower unique in all the universe. At first, I was captivated by her beauty. Very quickly, she began to torment me with her vanity. And soon I came to doubt her. Was she the only flower on your planet? Oh, no. But the others are very simple. They take up no room. Cause not one bit of trouble. Your flower was different. Very. She came from a seed blown to my planet from... Who knows where? From the moment she first showed herself, she became demanding. She commanded all of my time. Even that time I had always devoted to the baobabs and my volcanoes. Volcanoes? I have two active volcanoes. Very convenient for heating my breakfast. I carefully clean them out every morning. If they are well cleaned out, volcanoes burn slowly and steadily. Without eruption. I... I see I also have one volcano that is extinct. I clean it out, too. One never knows. No, one never knows. You were telling me about your flower. I ought never to have run away from her. I ought to have judged her by deeds and not by words. I ought to have guessed that behind her poor little stratagems lay real affection for me. But I was too young to know how to love her. The fact is that I did not know how to understand anything. And so it was that the little prince fled from the proud flower he loved but could not understand. To escape from his planet, the little prince took advantage of the migration of a flock of wild birds. He found himself in the neighborhood of asteroids number 325, 326, 27, 28, and 329. He began to visit them in order to add to his knowledge. The first asteroid was inhabited by a king clad in a royal purple and ermine who was seated upon a magic throne. The king was elated when he saw the little prince coming. Ah, the subject. A proof, so that I miss you better. The king felt consumingly proud of being at last king over somebody. The little prince looked everywhere for a place to sit down, but the entire planet was crammed and obstructed by the king's magnificent robe. So he remained standing. Since he was tired, he yawned. Oh, it is contrary to etiquette to yawn in the presence of a king. I forbid you to do so. I can't help it. I have come on a long journey and have had no sleep. Ah, then I order you to yawn. Come now, yawn again. That's an order. That frightens me. I cannot anymore. Well, then I... I order you sometimes to yawn and sometimes not to. 
Doctor, look here. I insist that my authority be respected. I tolerate no disobedience. I am an absolute monarch. However, I always make my orders reasonable. That is very wise. Oh, of course. If I offered a general to change himself into a seabird and he did not, it would be my fault, not his. May I sit down? <laughs> yeah, I order you to do so. Here, I shall move my robe. Yeah. Sire, I beg that you will excuse my asking a question. I order you to ask me a question. Sire, you are alone here. This planet is tiny. Over what do you rule? Over everything. Over everything? You mean the other planets and all the stars? Oh, over all that. Oh, that's marvelous. You can see a sunset whenever you wish. Oh, sire, I should like to see a sunset. Do me that kindness. Order the sun to set. If, if, if I ordered a general to fly from one flower to another like a butterfly, or, or write a tragic drama, or change himself into a seabird, and if he did not, which of us would be wrong? You. Exactly. One must require from each one only the duty he can perform. I have the right to require obedience because my orders are reasonable. But my sunset? You shall have it. I shall command it. When, sire? Mm -hmm, hmm. Well, I, I, I shall consult my almanac. Uh, hmm. Uh, hmm. Uh, ah, yeah, here we are. Uh, that will be this evening about 20 minutes to 8. And when I give the order, <laughs> you see how well I'm obeyed. I see. Oh. I have nothing more to do here, so I shall set out on my way again. Oh, do not go. Do not go. I, uh, 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 I'll make you a minister. Minister of what? If minister of uh, justice. Yes, yeah, that's it, minister of justice. But there is nobody here to judge. Hmm? Well, then you shall judge yourself. It's far more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. I can judge myself anywhere. I, uh... I have good reason to believe that somewhere on my planet there is an old rat. You can judge this old rat. And from time to time you will condemn him to death. You will have to pardon him on each occasion. He must be treated thriftily. He's the only one we have. I wouldn't like that. I think I will go on my way. Oh, no. I am ready to depart. If your majesty wishes to be promptly obeyed, he should be able to give me a reasonable order. Oh, well... Very well. I order you to be gone by the end of one minute. <laughs> the conditions seem favorable. And hear this. I make you my ambassador. The grown-ups are very strange. The second planet was inhabited by a conceited man who thought the little prince had come to admire him. Ah. Oh. I am about to receive a visit from an admirer. Good morning. That is a queer hat you are wearing. It is a hat for salute. I raise it in salute when people acclaim me. Ho oh, ho. Unfortunately, nobody at all ever passes this way. Oh? Clap your hands one against the other. All right. You see? I now raise my hat in salute. Again? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wouldn't you like to applaud me again? Well, no. <clears throat> but uh, you really do admire me. What do you mean? Well, you regard me as the handsomest, the best dressed, the richest, and most intelligent man on this planet. <laughs> but you're the only man on your planet. Uh, well, do me this kindness. Admire me just the same. Very well. I admire you. Ah, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you, and goodbye. Now, what is there in that to interest him so much? The grown-ups are certainly very odd. The third planet belonged to a businessman. This man was so much occupied that he did not even raise his head at the little prince's arrival. 
three and two make five. Five and good seven. Morning. Tw- uh, good morning. Good uh, morning. Your cigarette is gone out. 22. I haven't had time to light it again. That makes. Um, five hundred one million six hundred twenty-two thousand seven hundred and thirty-one. <laughs> five hundred million what? No, I can't stop. I've got too much to do. I'm concerned with matters of consequence. Five hundred million what? During the fifty-four years I've inhabited this planet, I've been disturbed only twice by inconsequential balded ash. This is the third time. Now, I was saying five hundred one million. Millions six- of what? Those little objects one sometimes sees in the sky. Fly? No, little glittering objects. The ones that set lazy men to idle dreaming. You mean the stars. That's right. And what do you do with the stars? Nothing. I own them. But I have already seen a king who told me... Kings do not own. They reign over. It's very different. And it makes me very rich. What good does it do you to be rich? Well, it makes it possible for me to buy more stars, if any are discovered. How is it possible for, for one to own the stars? To whom do they belong? To nobody. Then they belong to me, because I was the first to think of it. Uh, I suppose that is true, but what do you do with them? I administer them, count them, recount them. It's difficult, but... I am a man who is interested in matters of consequence. You cannot pluck the stars from heaven. No, but I can put them into the bank. Whatever does that mean? I write the number of my stars on a paper. I put the paper into a drawer and lock it with a key. Is that all? That is enough. That is rather poetic, but of no great consequence. Your ideas about matters of consequence are quite different from those of grown-ups. Wait! I myself own a flower, which I water every day. I own three volcanoes, which I clean out every day. It is of some use to my volcanoes and my flowers that I own them. You are of no use to the stars. Boulder Dash! Now, let's see, where was I? Uh, 342, 77 plus 89... The grown-ups are altogether extraordinary. Tell me, how did you come to visit this planet, the Earth? It was recommended by a geographer on the fifth planet I visited. Do you like it? Do you intend to stay? It has been almost a year since I left my home, my flower, my volcanoes. I'm worried. Baobabs? I left them under control. Your flower, then? On my journey, I learned many things. I learned that flowers are in danger of speedy disappearance. Soon I must return. It had been eight days since my accident in the desert. The last drop of my water supply was gone. The little prince seemed not to guess the danger. A little sunshine was all he seemed to need. He was recounting some of his experiences after coming to our planet. I met a friend... My dear little man, this is no longer a matter that could have anything to do with a fox. Why not? I am about to die of thirst. I'll tell you about it as we go, then. Come, let us look for a well. It's absurd to look for a well at random in the immensity of the desert. When arrived on the earth, I was surprised not to see any people. It was explained to me that I had landed on the desert. Your friend the fox told you this? No. It was a little gold-colored snake. A funny little animal. No thicker than a finger. A little yellow snake, but they're deadly. Not deadly, but more powerful than the finger of a king. He could have struck you fatally. He told me he could help me someday. If I grew too homesick for my planet, he told me all I need do is come back to the place where I descended. He would meet me there. Are you so homesick then? It is very close to the anniversary of my arrival. At that time, my planet will be right overhead. I... I shall be unhappy if you go. That is what the fox said. It was his fault. He wanted me to tame him. Tame him? It was when I wandered into a garden filled with flowers. There were thousands of them, precisely alike. 
They called themselves Roses. I was brokenhearted. Because of the roses? They were all exactly like my flower. A flower I thought to be unique in all the universe. Oh. The fox made me understand to have hope again. He wanted me to tame him because it would establish ties and make him different from all the other foxes. I'm beginning to understand. I looked again at the roses. They were beautiful, but one would not die for them. My rose is more important than all the others because it is she that I have watered. It is she I have put under a glass globe, sheltered from the wind behind a screen. Listen to when she grumbled or boasted. She is my rose. And your friend the fox? When I met him, he was as yet nothing. Just a fox like thousands of other foxes. But I have made him my friend. And now he is unique in all the world. You have learned a secret. A simple secret. It's only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Men have forgotten that you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. I am responsible for my rules. When we had trudged along for several hours in silence, the darkness fell and the stars came out. The little prince dropped off to sleep. I took him in my arms and set out walking once more. I felt the need of protecting him as if he himself were a flame that might be extinguished by a little puff of wind. I walked on, and I found the well at daybreak. Now... You must keep your promise, you know. The muzzle for my sheep. I remember. I... I'm afraid it's not very good. This will be all right. You have plans I don't know about. Tomorrow will be the anniversary of my descent to the earth. And your star will be just above... You must return to your work on the engine now. I will be waiting here. Come back tomorrow evening. I... I'm a little frightened. Remember the fox. One runs the risk of weeping a little if one lets himself be tamed. I was not reassured. I did not want to lose my little friend. I pretended to go but returned and hid behind a rock. I could not see to whom the little prince was speaking. This is the exact spot. The right time. You have good poison. You are sure you will not make me suffer too long. My heart jumped to my throat. I looked around the rock. Before me, facing the little prince, was one of those yellow snakes that take just 30 seconds to end your life. I dug into my pocket for my gun and started to run. The snake let himself flow across the sand like the dying spray of a fountain and disappeared among the stones. What does this mean? Why are you talking with snakes? You will find out what is wrong with your engine today and you can go back home. I, too, am going home today. It is much farther much more difficult. I want you to stay a while longer. I have your sheep and the sheep's box. And I have the muzzle. Little man, I want to hear you laugh again. Tell me it's only a bad dream, this affair of the snake, the meeting place, the star. At night you will look up at the stars. My star will be just one of the stars for you. You will love to watch all of the stars in the heavens be your friend. <laughs> I am making you a present. Little prince, dear little prince, I love to hear that laughter. That is my present. Just that. What are you trying to say? For most people, the stars are silent. You, you alone will have the stars as no one else has them. 
I don't understand. In one of the stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I shall be laughing. It will be as if all the stars were laughing when you look at the night sky. Only you will have the stars that can laugh. I, too, shall look at the stars. They will all be wells with a rusty pulley. You will have 500 million little bills. And I shall have 500 million springs of fresh water. Now, let me go by myself. You... You're afraid, little friend? I am responsible for my flower. She is so weak, so naive. She has four thorns of no use at all. Don't go. Please. Don't go. I seemed unable to move. The little prince hesitated, took one step. There was nothing there but a flash of yellow close to his ankle. He remained motionless for an instant. He did not cry out. He fell gently as a tree falls. There wasn't even any sound because of the sand. Now, years and years have gone by. Until now, I've never told this story. My sorrow is comforted a little. Not entirely. But I know he did go back to his planet. His body was not there at daybreak. At night, I love to listen to the stars. It's like 500 million little bells. But there is one extraordinary thing. When I drew the muzzle for the little prince, I forgot to add the leather strap to it. He will never have been able to fasten it on his sheep. So now I keep wondering what's happening on his planet. Perhaps the sheep has eaten the flower and the little bells are changed to tears. Here then is a great mystery. Nothing in the universe can be the same if somewhere a sheep that we have never seen has, yes or no, eaten a rose. And no grown-up will ever understand that this is a matter of so much importance. CBS Radio Workshop has presented The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. The script was adapted for radio by Frank Tossing. Richard Beals was heard as The Little Prince with Raymond Burr as our narrator. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Joseph Kearns, and Hans Conrad. Music for tonight's workshop was composed by René Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when from New York we present H.L. Mencken, the story of a journalist. That's next week on the CBS Radio Workshop. Five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Thank you.
out as Margaret. Margaret Clitheroe, you've been brought from the Castle of York to this guild hall on this, the 14th day of March in the year of grace, 1586, and you are indicted of felony for that you have harboured and maintained Jesuit and seminary priests, traitors to the Queen's Majesty and her laws, and that you have had mass said. Margaret Clitheroe, how say you? Are you guilty of this indictment or no? Woman, you should not be standing before the judges with that on. Take it off. I'm sorry. I, I will remove it. Now, Margaret Clitheroe, what say you to these offences? I know of no offence for which I should confess myself guilty. Woman, how will you be tried? Having made no offence, I need no trial. The law lays down that those who refuse to submit their case to a jury shall be executed with greater cruelty. You must be tried. Then I will be tried by none but by God and your own consciences. I have done no wrong. If then you will not put yourself to be tried, hear your judgment. You shall return to the place from whence you came and taken to the lowest part of the prison. There you shall be stripped naked, laid down, your back upon the ground, and as much weight laid upon you as you are able to bear, and so to continue three days without meat or drink, except a little barley bread and puddle water, and the third day be pressed to death, your hands and feet tied to posts, and a sharp stone under your back. Look to her, Master Sheriff. Agnes Tesh! How did you get inside this cell? I was told by the jailer that none is permitted to speak with me, but such as are appointed by the Council of the North. Margaret, I must give you a warning. A couple by the name of Yoward are going to be put in this cell to spy on you. They are being transferred from the debtor's prison. Oh, thank you for the warning. I also wanted to help you make this cell a little more habitable. This low prison is put a little above the mud of the River Ouse. We'll put this pail underneath the drip. That's better. <laughs> the whole city is in an uproar about the sentence. But the council are countering by saying you are possessed with a merry devil and seek your own death. Why did you not plead? I knew that if I should have put myself for trial by jury... Evidence must needs have come against me, which I know none could give but only my children and servants. Oh, thank God I can no longer be the occasion of another's death, or bring them to sufferings, or be the cause of the shipwreck of their faith. Margaret. Oh, Shh. What is it, Agnes? I thought I heard something. No. No, I must be mistaken. But you haven't told me yet how you find yourself here. I was arrested on Saturday and was accused of having been seen hearing mass in your house. Oh. I don't know how long the jailer will let me stay. You've bribed him. He provides the meanest food at the most exorbitant price and denies us the very necessaries of life. Alas, the only way he has of making a living is by the money he gets out of his prisoners. Margaret, someone is coming. I brought you two cellmates, Mistress Margaret Clitheroe. I'm Mrs. Yoward, and this little fellow that's half my width and half my height is my good husband, Mr. Yoward. How do How you do? do? Uh, which one of you is Mrs. Clitheroe? I am. My wife and I were informed you not to have any visitors, Margaret Clitheroe. Now, husband, come off your eye horse. Mm. This lady's time is short enough. We are the likes of us, Papa, you know. We are not of the old faith, Mrs. Clitheroe. We accept the new established church, as ordered by Queen and Parliament. I think, in fairness, I must make this clear. Thank you for telling me, Mrs. Yoward. I'm a woman who speaks her mind. Which makes two of us, Mrs. Yoward? You pluck, young lady. At my pluck. Well, me and Mr. Yard will leave you now to your business with your friend. And we'll try to keep out of your way, and unless you want us for anything. Well, that's very kind of you, Mrs. Yard. Well, come on now, husband. Mm -hmm. Let's make this new roof over our heads a little like a home. Agnes, 
sickness. How long do you think I have to live? The talk is they want you dead within the week. Oh, I knew they sought my blood, but I didn't think they sought it so swiftly. Agnes, I crave your prayers that I might persevere. You know you have them, Margaret. I want you also to get word out to Father Mush, desiring him to pray earnestly for me. I'll see that it is done. Agnes, God sent you here to my side. Your company has always brought me cheer. But I want to take advantage of these fleeting moments. You know, Agnes, I see a pattern in my life. It's as if someone on high has taken me by the hand and, and led me on a marvellous journey, clearly laid out and signposted. I want to go back with you over this wondrous journey. I would have been about ten years old. There was a torchlight procession approaching the marketplace. First came a cart and a horse, and then the sheriff and the officers of the archbishop. They were escorting a shrunken, sullen-faced man, carrying a pile of leather volumes. Behind him were other officers carrying beautiful mass vestments. The sheriff climbed onto a cart, while two men with torches set light to a brazier full of faggots. Take my eyes off the sullen-faced man. The flickering flames etched deeper into his face. He held up his hands in supplication towards the sheriff. No more, sheriff. I've sold him a soul. What more do you want of me? What you have sold in private, you must repeat in public. And then everybody knows. Afterwards, you're a free man. Free? To wonder a man branded as a traitor to all he once held dear. Now you pull yourself together. It'll soon be over. Citizens of York, gather round and come and see what we have here. Not too close, not too close. Spread out now so that you can all see. <laughs> as you all know, or all should know, by Acts of Parliament, the supremacy of the Church in England has been restored to the Crown. Which means... That in matters pertaining to religious practice, we do what Her Majesty the Queen of England, our gracious Elizabeth, lays down for our benefit. Why, when did she become a bishop? <laughs> did I hear treason spoken? Under the guidance of our gracious Queen Elizabeth, we have the second book of common prayer to guide us in our worship. The mass is abolished. No one can abolish the mass. Christ himself instituted it at the Last Supper. The Queen and Parliament have decreed that saying mass and hearing mass is no longer lawful. The bishops who have refused to accept this fact and who have not taken the oath of supremacy upholding the Queen to be head of the church in England have been deprived of their sees and arrested. The clergy who have not obeyed their instructions to tear down altars and rude lofts and destroy vestments, bells, censers, crosses, candlesticks, holy water stoops, statues and service books of the old faith are now coming under the scrutiny of the commissioners for causes ecclesiastical. This prisoner is one of them. Bring him forward. Look at the wretch. His name is Edward Reeks, and he was a priest in Barrowbridge. He thought he knew better than Queen and Parliament and concealed in his house forbidden books. Now, Edward Reeks, by the wisdom of the commissioners, has been condemned to a practical form of penance, which will serve to instruct at the same time you who are still steeped in ignorance and superstition. You're about your business, disobedient priest. Destroy the books. Oh. It's a beautiful illuminated missile for saying mass. This is what we do with all useless articles of popery and superstition. Burn them. Sacrilege. Stop it, Father. Don't do it. You'll do what is told, woman. Don't go away, ladies. We're coming to the most interesting parts. Bargains for you all. Now, look at these fine cloths. Oh, 
vestments. Chasubos made of the finest silk, satin, and velvet. Look at the craftsmanship, ladies. Ladies, you're not going to pass up such good bargains for old superstitious fears. Superstition, is it? The mass has been said since the apostles. Why should it be wrong now? Are you questioning the Queen and Parliament? Can even queens change the laws of God? Arrest that woman! She's talking treason! Come on, Come on. Let me be! Oh, Father, you can't do this. Reading from those holy books, wearing those vestments, you have served our Lord's designs, lending him your body and your voice. In persona et in nomine, Christi. What is that you said in Latin, Reeks? I was summing up what she said and what used to be the teaching. And what does it mean? In the name of Christ, in the person of Christ. Look at him, look at this miserable wretch, and ask yourself if he could ever stand in the name of Christ, in the person of Christ. <laughs> You'd better lend yourself to this, Reeks. Here's a knife. Please, Father... No more sacrilege. Take that woman away. <laughs> Come on, Don't away do it, here. Father! Cut out all the linings and the interlinings so that we can sell the stuff for dresses for wives or coverlets for beds. You'll be back where you started if you don't. Well, Reeks, haven't you had enough? Do you want to go back for more? <laughs> Make the cuts, Reeks. Go on, cut the vestments. Cut, Reeks, or there'll be other punishments. <gasps> Again, Reeks. <sighs> and what have you to say as you rend them? Don't forget the words, Reeks. The mass is abolished in England. The mass is abolished. The sheriff and the officers threw water on the brazier to put it out. It all seemed so harsh and destructive. I remember sitting by my father's bed just before he died and asking him why those beautiful things had been destroyed. He was a sheriff of York too. I'll try to answer for both our sakes as honestly as I can. It means going back to the days of the Queen's father, Henry VIII. Mm. Henry wanted to divorce his wife, Queen Catherine, but the Pope refused. So he broke with Rome and made himself head of the church within his realm. He believed in the mass and the old religion, but he didn't accept the Pope as head anymore. Then who abolished the mass? His son, Edward. But why? Politics. These are above the understanding of the likes of us. So you men would have your women folk believe, Father? Ah, if you want an explanation, think of the new religion as a middle road. What if the middle road leads to the wrong place? Look, Margaret, I saw Robert Ask lead a pilgrimage of grace in King Henry's time... And I remember his rotting corpse hanging in chains from the castle tower. But where do your sympathies lie, Father? Uh, how can a wax chandler like me become enthusiastic for a new religion that does away with the burning of candles? <laughs> you make light of the question, Father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've already wit, Margaret. And God's given you a comely face and beauty correspondent. But be careful what you say touching matters of religion. These are dangerous times. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have liked nothing better than to endow a chantry so masses could be said for the repose of my soul. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to promise, Margaret... Yes, Father. ...that if the time comes when masses... Once more said in England, you'll have masses said for me. I will, Father. I will. I want, I want to rest now. Mm. 
Is, is that your mother I hear? It is, good husband, it is. Both of you sit with me for a while. Oh, you look tired, Thomas, dear. I, I, I'd like the vicar, Thomas Grayson, to pay me a visit this night. Thomas Grayson? I hear that he may soon be in trouble for keeping Catholic books with a friend in the country. Well, not him. That's why I want him. Tell him I'm in need of the last rites of the old faith. Uh, if I'm to depart this world, I'll go anointed as my father and his father before him. I'll have no new rites concocted by hedge priests and the queen's ministers. And light candles for my extreme. My father died shortly afterwards. The church seemed cold and empty, stripped of all its altars. No requiem was allowed. But as the solemn procession left the church, the choir broke into the plain chant of the old, forbidden Dies Irae. Dies Irae, Dies Illo. There seemed a link with all the previous centuries as the notes echoed round the ancient church walls, filling in the gaps in time and directing minds to first beginnings. It filled my mind still as the will was read. I, Thomas Middleton, wax chandler of this parish, and a sheriff of York, leave to each of the four wards of the city three shillings and four pence for the poor, and ask them to pray for me. To my youngest daughter, Margaret, I leave one silver goblet and half a dozen spoons. To her goes the right of inheritance of the house in Davygate, York, after the death of my wife, Jane, her mother. Pray for me. Talking about your father, Thomas Middleton, Mrs. Clitheroe. A fine man he was. Yes. Though your mother wasn't very long away there, was she? Our new Lord Mayor Henry May soon saw to that. Your mother's money took Henry May from the beggar's staff and provided the means of advancement, I'll be bound. I want you to meet your new father, Margaret. Mr. Henry May. <laughs> Father has been dead only four months, Mother. We need a man about the house. I need a husband, you a father. And I promise you I'll treat you like my very own flesh and blood, young lady. Mr May is a very fine man, Margaret. He'll look after both of us. I didn't like the way he looked at me. And I always felt uncomfortable when he was near me. I was so happy when I was 17 and my marriage was arranged... And I was able to get away from my innkeeper stepfather. I may be some years older than you, Margaret, but I promise I'll be a good husband to you. And I a good wife to you, John Clitheroe. Oh, you're a merry lass. <laughs> and I'll see you have a happy life. 
We'll go to banquets and feasts where wives are shown the greatest honor. And where we can renew neighborly love and friendship. Good food, good wine, good company. And we'll all be merry together, eh? <laughs> <laughs> like the guests at our wedding. Aye. Listen to them. And you'll be the prettiest, wittiest, comeliest of them all. I will try to be a good wife. I know that as a purveyor of meat, you have to travel often. Aye. And when I'm travelling in rain and wind, snow and hail, sometimes drenched, sometimes sweating, I'll think of my good wife and the ease and the joys and the pleasures you'll do me on my return. If it's cold, I'll have a good fire where your shoes will be removed, your feet washed and have fresh shoes and stockings. And then you'll sit down, be given good food and wine and be well served and well looked after. And finally, I'll see you well bedded in white sheets and nightcap. <sighs> Methinks, as my mother has told me, such service maketh a man to love and desire to return to his home and see his good wife and be distant with other women. And methinks this marriage has indeed been made in heaven, even though it was arranged and I've not sung thee warful ballads and sighed like a furnace. Oh, I've looked forward to becoming a wife. And have need of neither size nor balance. <laughs> I have vowed to love, cherish and obey you, John Clitheroe. And that I will, in that same order. Well, the Lord certainly blessed your union and made you a plentiful mother and children, Margaret. God be thanked. He's been so good to me. I remember the firstborn as if it were yesterday. Oh, I'm so happy, Mother, so happy. He's wonderful. And so are you, Margaret. Do you know, Henry, she's taken over the care and education of my first wife's children. She's taken charge of the shop downstairs and she manages to keep a sharp eye on the servants and apprentices. <laughs> I commit all to her trust and discretion. And on top of it all, she's provided me with another son. <laughs> I think it calls for a celebration, Henry. Let's have some wine. So be it, John. <clears throat> John loves company, Mother. I have never been to so many parties and banquets. I am happy for you both. He's opening his eyes. Oh, Henry Clitheroe, what will life have in store for you, I wonder? Uh, you'll all be uh, attending the execution at the pavement, I trust. Oh. Execution? Uh, being in childbirth, you must have missed the news. Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, is being publicly executed as one of the leaders of the rebellion of three years ago. I thought he had fled to Scotland. <laughs> he had, but he was purchased from the Scots for the sum of £2,000. But when was his trial? Well, none was needed. He'd been condemned by act of attainder. Ballads both sides of the border cursed both buyers and sellers. I doubt the wisdom of this public spectacle in the marketplace. <laughs> he won't die. He'll recant. Pity, though. An execution's good for business. What's the thirst? Henry, the Earl is much loved by many people. Aye, yeah, by papists. He tried to help that papist whore, Mary, Queen of Scots, escape. <sighs> if it had anything to do with me, I wouldn't give him any choice but the headsman's axe. What choice will he have? If he agrees publicly to conform, he'll be set at liberty. There's nothing like the beheading of an Earl to bring out the crowd. Oh, I bet we're doing a roaring trade back at the inn. We really should be there now. Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, you are condemned to be beheaded for the heinous crime of treason. But before this vast multitude who have come to see you die, I am empowered to offer you life and liberty on certain conditions. But you must renounce the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church and agree to be an obedient servant of Her Majesty and from henceforward attend the services of the new authorised religion of this realm. Do you, Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, accept Her Gracious Majesty's clemency, renounce the Pope, and agree to go to the new services as laid down by Queen and Parliament? No, I cannot. I must stand by that church which throughout the whole Christian world, is knit and bound together under one universal head. 
In this same faith, I'm about to end this unhappy life. But as for this new English church, I do not acknowledge it. You are dying an obstinate papist, a member not of the Catholic, but of the Roman Church. That which you call the Roman Church is the Catholic Church, which has been founded on the teachings of the Apostles. Jesus Christ himself being its cornerstone, strengthened by the blood of martyrs, honoured by the recognition of the early fathers. And it continues always the same, being the church against which, as Christ our Saviour said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now, before my death, I beg all present to forgive me, and I declare that I... For my part, forgive all from my heart. He knelt down and remained a few moments in silent prayer. Then he made the sign of the cross and folded his arms in the form of a cross on his chest. Laying his head upon the block, he prayed again. The executioner raised his axe. Lord, receive my soul. O oh God, receive his soul into eternal rest. O oh God, I was becoming aware that the old Catholic faith was the faith of our fathers and had been since the world was first delivered from idolatry and paganism. I was also finding no substance nor comfort in the ministers of the new gospel. So I carefully employed myself to know about this heritage and become a member of the true church. In those days, the fury of the persecution was only just beginning, Catholic times being fresh in the memory of all. I remember the first time I saw the chief divisor and contriver of our troubles, Henry Hastings, Earl of Huntingdon, Lord President of the North. It was shortly after his appointment when he invited the leading citizens to meet him. There was to be a banquet with the Lord Mayor afterwards. John and I were invited, and so was my stepfather, Henry May. The Lord President swept in, acknowledging no one, and began immediately to address us all. My Lord Mayor, aldermen and prominent citizens of York, as a cousin of Her Glorious Majesty the Queen and the new President of the Council in these parts... I bring you her greetings and a special message. By former commissions, the Queen's Council within your divisions commanded you to certify what persons, misliking the doctrine now taught and the religion now established, do absent themselves from the new services. In the execution of this, some of you have been remiss, careless and negligent. We therefore charge and command you that before the 15th day of December next, you do provide the names, qualities and degrees of every such person who absents himself or herself from the new services, whether he be knight, justice of the peace, squire, gentleman, freeholder or other. Fail you not in the diligent execution of this, for you will answer the contrary at your peril, given under our signet the 27th day of October, the 16th year of our reign. <coughs> you look taken aback by the message, my Lord Mayor of York. We feel rebuked, Lord President. Rebuked, Lord Mayor? You should feel more than rebuked for your past indolence and indifference to the orders of Her Majesty and Council. You should feel threatened. Threatened? Threatened. Then you will know how to pass the fear in your stomach on to these recusants. Lord President, we have already jailed many of them. But for how long? Have you exercised the powers you have to keep them in prison for life, if necessary? That is clear you have not. Well, gentlemen, we will lose no time initiating a campaign against recusants. You, the corporation, will compel church wardens to report to you, along with parish constables and other discreet and honest persons of every parish. Your parish committees will also certify the names of all who are fugitives and fled out of the realm for religion or any other cause or notorious crime, and of such as do lurk and be kept secret in any house, town or other place, and in whose houses they be so kept and maintained. The said malefactors are to be apprehended and brought in safe custody to the council. Do you understand? I do not hear you. 
Gentlemen, from your lips must come the words, we understand and we will carry out your instructions, Lord President. Then be about your business, Mayor and Corporation of York. Hunt down these papists in our midst. Worried men bowed their heads in silence as he stormed out. My husband and my stepfather couldn't get him out of their minds, even at the banquet. He beareth the very countenance of a tyrant. He has much power. He's also a kinsman of the Queen, John. Should any man have the power and influence to make us into common informers against our neighbours? Be careful what you say, John. You come from a papist family. Don't we all, Henry? John, be quiet for both our sakes. You cannot say such things with impunity in so public a place. Especially when we will be among those discreet and honest persons who make these inquiries. Nay, not me, Henry. Nearly all the butchers' wives in York remain loyal to the old church. Ah, recusants and papists, you mean. Mm. John, all here will be expected to take part in the Earl's campaign against the papists. If you don't, you'll be immediately suspect. And your chances of attaining any further offices in the corporation will be negligible. You must be on the committees. It would be only a token gesture. A token gesture? They're all that are wanted. You must show openly your father counsel. Now... Let's give them the lip service they require. <clears throat> uh, you have here <clears throat> two who will hunt down these infamous papists, my Lord Mayor. I, Henry May, am my friend and relation by marriage, John Clitheroe. There you have a man who speaks for England. I think we've just taken a most judicious step towards where power, preference and influence lie in this city. You have, Henry. You have. I still hesitate. John, your own brother William is a priest. How can you join those bent on persecuting him? I won't persecute anyone. But you volunteered. And one of your duties will be taking names and reporting anyone who does not attend the new services. Better me doing it than anyone else. I shall be a very poor informer, Margaret. You'll also be a very poor Catholic while you're working for the Lord President. This is a time of storm, Margaret, and while this storm rages, I don't see how anyone can continue to be a Catholic. Not with a fines, forfeiture of goods, and finally imprisonment for life for those who persist. No, we'll yield, we'll bend to this storm, until that storm is overpassed. Oh, John, you're so lukewarm, you're so confused. Storms are nothing new. Civil authority crucified Peter, the first bishop of Rome. He didn't bend to the storm. The early Christians were thrown to the lions. They didn't run away or bend to the storm either. We have to stand up and face the fury of this present storm. You're asking me to risk losing everything. Yes, to gain everlasting happiness. We have to be practical. But, but I am practical. I look after the shop, the house, and all the daily chores. I see to the children. In the thousand and one affairs of each day, I am practical. Yes, I admit you are practical in all these things. Oh, John, I am also practical in my desire to get to heaven and to take with me all those I love the dearest. Riches I desire none, for we have already too much. You yourself, John, cannot lift up your head to God for the weight of your worldly goods. Oh. I'm trying to talk with you about spiritual matters is like, oh, wrestling with the wind. So I tried to remain constant while John tried to bury his conscience. But he always quietly supported me. In some ways, he suffered more than I did. As for me, my many periods of imprisonment proved to be a most happy and profitable school where I learned to read both English and Latin and to develop commodiously the Christian virtues. They persecuted me and I thereby learned patience. They shut me up into close prison and I thereby learned to forget and despise the world. They separated me from house, children and husband and I thereby became familiar with God. Oh, but the joy of returning home to John and the children. How I missed them. To Margaret. To a life of happiness 
and fulfilment. We'll all drink to that. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart, especially my good husband, John, and his friends, Thomas Fisher and Thomas Temple, here present, for pledging themselves for the bond for my release. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you home again, Margaret. Nothing's been the same without you. All right, Lucy. What a good husband I found for you, Margaret, eh? He pays your fines, he suffers your absences, he goes before courts and councils on your behalf, and he still thinks you're the best wife in the world. <laughs> she is. Now, when she's here, <laughs> I couldn't put up with an empty marriage bed like you do, John. You've shown you can't put up with an empty bed, Henry. It's hardly been empty since Margaret's mother passed on. Oh, are you referring to the two serving wenches who provided me with certain... Comforts and consolations during the lonely days following my sad bereavement, Agnes? Well, I... Uh, ah, I... see? You're embarrassed. I'm not. Gossip doesn't worry me. Oh, in these days, in the circles I move in, it would do me more harm for them to know I've been dining with papists like yourselves <laughs> than sleeping with my serving wenches. Henry. Eh? <laughs> and for your information, one of those serving wenches, Anne Thompson, I intend to make an honourable woman of. And marry her, huh? <laughs> Aye. Now, who's going to propose a toast to my intended nuptials? I hope you will be very happy, Father. Thank you, Margaret. Aye. I'm glad you're concerned for my happiness. It's a pity your husband didn't follow my path. Your path wasn't mine, Henry. I will the greater the pity, John Clitheroe. Oh, well, you too might be now within reach of the highest office of this city. The office of Lord Mayor? Yes, the office of Lord Mayor. Yes, I'd heard rumours, but has the Earl of Huntington approved of you? Oh, why shouldn't he? The Lord President of the Council of the North and me are good friends. My readiness to apply the laws against recusants, unlike many important men of this city, brought me to his notice, as I knew it would. Aye, and... Uh, Though I had to prove that despite a stepdaughter I'd brought up properly in the new religion and who, because of evil influences, had returned to the superstitions of Rome, that I myself was a man to be relied upon. So I organised raids and made many arrests, though I was able to turn a blind eye in, uh, in certain cases. Oh, yes, the Earl of Huntingdon, Lord President of the Council in the North, a kinsman of our great, gracious Queen... It's backing Henry May. <laughs> In other words, you're looking at the next Lord Mayor of York. Now, let's drink to that. Oh, come on. What are you waiting for? Oh, I know you're going to give me that. What doth it profit a man if? If what? I'm not interested. If he gained the old world and suffered the loss of his own soul... No, I'm still not interested. I'd gain the world if I could. Aye, I'd hold it all in my hands today. Give me it. Now! The world, the flesh, the power. I'll take me chance with eternity. You're a bigger fool than I thought, Henry. Fool? I'll show you who's a fool. I'll hunt down all papists and traitors and you... Stepdaughter Margaret Clitheroe, in my year of office, are going to conform. I'll see to it. Even if your husband there's too soft and blind to it, your stepfather Henry May isn't. Aye, I'm leaving. Now remember, here in mass is treason and a hanging offence. And which of you here, apart from John, doesn't hear mass? Eh? Mark my words. All offenders will be brought to justice. Every one of you will either end up rotting in prison or dancing from the end of the gallows. Sleep on that, the lot of you! I'll be hanged if they'll stop me hearing mass. Oh, <laughs> I see prison has not deprived you of your sense of humour. No, prison provided me with time for meditation. Before I left prison, I made two resolutions. Speak not of them openly, Margaret. What we do not know, we cannot be forced to utter. Then one I will tell you, because it concerns you, and one I will keep in the innermost corner of my soul. As there is no mass centre in these parts of York, I intend to have a secret place constructed, a mass said in this very house. I was told he wanted to see me. 
Yes, Father John. Now that I am temporarily delivered from prison, I have straight away set about to provide places for Mass. Places? More than one? Two places. One is to be a secret chamber in the roof adjoining this house, where I might go at any time without being seen by watchers or informers. I am hoping I will be able to go to Mass each day with my children and others. And the second place? It will be some distance from here, but it will only be known to those who are faithful and discreet, so that Mass can be said there when it is no longer safe to be said here. It will also require two lots of vestments, chalices, plates. Oh, they will all be plentifully provided for both places. Margaret, but you do know the new penalties. Yes, but I am not afraid to have Mass said and do well. This is a time of war and trial in God's church. And if I cannot do my duty without peril and dangers, then by God's grace I will not be slacker because of them. If God's priests dare venture themselves to my house, I will never refuse them. John, you are making an early start. I am ready and my horse seems impatient to be on its way. Oh, must you go? I must, my love. I've been neglecting so much of late. It's many months since I visited the estate at Cornbury. I'll be back within the week, but Margaret... Yes, John? Don't venture away from the house at any time. If you're outside on your own, they are bound to arrest you. Promise me to be most careful in all that you do. I promise you. Above all, promise me this. That you won't go out and take part in... in certain practices... You mean, go out to Mass? Margaret! They have informers everywhere. And if the authorities here whispers that we have been even discussing this practice, it's enough to bring a raid upon my house. So please, Margaret, do not go out to Mass. I promise you, John, while you are away, I will not go out of the house to Mass. Qui pridie quam pateretur, who, the day before he suffered, took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and with his eyes lifted up towards heaven, heaven giving thanks to thee, God, to his Father Amen. Almighty, Benedixit, he blessed it, broke it, it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, take and eat ye all of this, hoc for est this is my body. It was a joyous time, Agnes. I was able to attend daily Mass and I found the sure, safe way. What way is that, Margaret? Finding a good priest to be my spiritual director and then being obedient to his advice. The path becomes so clearly defined, so easy to follow. Father John, I feel there is something wrong in me that I should amend. My spiritual efforts seem little or nothing. On the contrary, Margaret, you're progressing well. Oh, don't say that, Father. I know how unworthy I am in the sight of the Lord. Tell me what faults I must overcome. Well, let us go over your plan of life and see how it's working out then. Starting in the morning? Every morning I I make my morning offering and kneel in prayer one hour and a half, meditating upon the passion of Christ. And I talk to him about himself and myself, what help I can give to my persecuted and imprisoned brothers and sisters, words I can say that will bring waverers closer to him and pass on my inner joy and tranquillity in the midst of these troubled times. You do well, and after your prayer and meditation you hear Mass. Thanks to you priests who courageously continue to offer the Mass. I pray each day for all God's priests, especially you, my spiritual director. And how I need your prayers, Margaret, how we all need them. But tell me... Why at Mass do you usually choose the place next to the door to kneel, behind all the rest? Because they're the worst and base seats, and it is the most unseemly corner in all the chamber. I see. But I commit everything to your guiding direction, Father. No prayer seems sweet, no time convenient. 
no orders straight unless I have first agreed them with you in my twice-weekly confession. That also is very good, Margaret. One's own spirit is a bad adviser, a poor guide to lead one through hostile, parched lands and dangerous paths of the interior life. Do you think I should not kneel in my accustomed place, Father? No. It is a good, small mortification to choose the worst for oneself. But it might also be good to vary it, if only to avoid routine. I remember that, Father. My most delight is to kneel anywhere where I might continually behold the Blessed Sacrament. Very good, Margaret. An aftermath? I try not to begin anything in the house without first offering it up to him, desiring that I might do his blessed will thereby, and it be for his glory and honour. But I find it so difficult, Father, in the many diverse affairs of each day, to keep this good intention in every particular action. Rome wasn't built in a day, Margaret. It is only by practising doing good, then by more practice, that virtue is acquired. Our little failures and defeats won't matter so long as we persevere in our interior struggle. Ah, remember what you say, and try not to be so disheartened by my failings. Good. But then I don't get to my evening prayer until four o'clock. Then I pray with my children about me, and I finish the day with prayer and a good examination of conscience. And your spiritual reading? The New Testament, Reims translation, Kempis following of Christ. Again, I owe my ability to read to my time in prison. And I have now learned Our Lady's Matins in Latin. You progress well. You're fasting. The first lump. We fasted four times a week, partly for lack of necessary victual. The same abstinence I try to slack not now that I am delivered from prison. Now as then, I abstain from meat and have but one meal on Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday. On Friday, I use the discipline when permission is given. This week, Margaret, concentrate on keeping the presence of God and meditate on how more loving and generous he is than any human father. Talk to him as a loving daughter talks to her father. Oh, that meditation will bring me great pleasure. And now I must needs be about my household duties. And Margaret, as well as your rye bread, milk and pottage, take some meat Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh. With you, Margaret, it is more necessary to use the bridle than the spur. Very well, Father. But may I carve the better piece for others and please myself with the worst? Yes, but take some meat. And say an Ave Maria before I move my hand to anything upon the table. Yes, say your Ave Marias and your rosaries. And Margaret. Yes, Father. Pray for me. Was it on Father Mushy's advice that you sent your eldest son, Henry, abroad, Margaret? No, that was the other resolution I'd made in prison. Though I did discuss the matter with Father Mush. I remember well the day I broke the news to the boy. We were coming from the mass chamber and we were closing the secret entrance in our part of the house. Anne was also with us. Must be one of the best hiding holes in the country, Mother. It was constructed by a very holy craftsman who so cleverly conceals his secret places that pursuivants have never found them. They'll never find ours, Mother, if they search for years. But we mustn't breathe a word to anyone about our hidey hole. So many lives may depend on it. We won't, Mother. And while we're alone, I have something to say that is for your ears only. You know that at any time... I could be arrested and returned to prison. I fear not for myself, but only for what may happen to my family. I have no fear for me. You are both so young and so sturdy. Though I am just a little frightened. Well, so are we all, Henry, but we mustn't show it. There's a resolution which I made while I was in prison, and it concerns you, Henry. In what way? If I am returned to prison, they could have you taken away. I feel there is only one safe way. What is that? For you to leave the country and go across the sea to Douay. There you can have a virtuous education and find true knowledge that will allow you, after diligent work and study, to withstand any adversity. Then I could become a priest. Only if you had a vocation. But you would be pleased if I became a priest, wouldn't you, Mother? Oh, I think it is the highest of callings. The physician may heal the body, but the priest heals and gives joy to the inner soul. 
But don't become a priest because you think I would like to see you as a priest. Only if you know God wants it so. How will I know that? You will. You will. How did you make up your mind, Mother? I secretly took instruction, and the way seemed clear and well marked. And since then, I have employed myself to know well the ancient faith and become a lively member. <laughs> a lively member you have indeed become, Mother. <laughs> <laughs> Happiness is doing what our Maker wants. Then I too will do my best. Even if it means leaving my home and you, Mother, to go abroad. Good boy. When will it be? It must needs be done in all haste, Henry, without a backward glance even. Without waiting for the morrow. Today? Today. But what about Father? You must go without his blessings or farewell. If he knows nothing until you have departed, he cannot be held responsible. But how will you break the news to him? Oh, leave that to me, Henry. You yourself face a hazardous journey. Your escape abroad will be set in motion at once. You will journey from friend's house to friend's house until you reach the coast where a passage can then be arranged. But always be on your guard. All strangers and travellers are marked men and looked upon with suspicion. And checks are made at every town and city gate. All I ask for is your blessing, Mother. And I know all will go well. May God be with you on this journey. And remain with you both on your journeys through life. Amen. Amen. Having to tell John was one of the most difficult things I had to face. I prayed so hard for the right words. Perhaps my mind was so concerned with that problem that I was careless about letting the school children see the priest's hole. Oh, yes, the school. They hunt schools with almost the same vigour as mass centres. Mm. And yet you managed to start a school in your house. Oh, I had to find tuition for my children and the children round about. It also happened at that time that the schoolmaster, Mr Stapleton, escaped from the castle where he'd lain seven years in prison for his faith. So I gave him refuge, and he taught all my children and others beside. I know that Christ appointed St Peter to be the head of the church, because Christ said to him, Thou art Peter. And the and this, young, is the room that leads to the secret mass chamber in the next house. Do you want to look inside? Yeah, please. Mother. Anne? Oh, I didn't know you were here. Jan is a new boy at the school, and I'm showing him the house. His mother is Dutch, but his father's English. Yes, I know. I hope you're happy here, Jan. Thank you, Mum. But now you must hurry back to your class. I can hear them at work. Can't I show Jan the mass chamber first? No, your class comes first. Very well, Mother. Come on, Jan. Yeah. Four marks by which we may know her. She is one... She is holy. She is Catholic. She is apostolic. It all happened so quickly. Perhaps I should have restricted them to only certain parts of the house. You must not blame yourself for this fateful view of the secret entrance. Oh. As you said, your mind was on another problem at the time. John's return. I was filled with doubt and disquiet. Father Mush was away and I had no one to turn to for guidance. With feminine guile, I made John his favourite pies and wined and dined him like a king before I broke the news. You don't know how much I was looking forward to your pies, Margaret. <laughs> Nobody in the whole North Country can bake pies like you. Is that all you missed me for, with pies? You'll never know how much I did miss you. You're the best wife any man could have. <laughs> More wine? Yes. Fill it up <laughs> and have some yourself. A little... John, mm -hmm. you know I'd like our children brought up in the faith. Margaret, I pay your fines. I arrange for your release from prison on bond. I answer for your recusancy. I never even ask you how much you spend on food and relief for your friends in prison and for the sick and the destitute. I let you have your way. But if here and now in this country we didn't bring up our children as the state requires... We lose everything, and both end up in jail. Yes, uh, for once I agree with what you say. If we tried to bring them up as I wished, we would both end up in jail. At last you see the reasonableness of my arguments. So I decided, even while I was in prison, there was only one thing to do. Eh? Do what? Do as I have done with Henry while you were away. 
What have you done with Henry while I was away? I did it while you were away so that you could not be implicated. What have you done? What have you done, woman? Do not shout at me, John. What have you done? I have sent Henry abroad to Dewey. To Dewey? To that seminary? Yes. When we're ruined, they're bound to discover he's missing. Don't you realise what you've done? How furious the authorities will be. Oh, and me a chamberlain of this city. John. John, I love you and my family with all my heart. I did what I thought was right. When you married me, do you remember your promise? Yes. You vowed to love, cherish and obey me. That I have. And I do love you greatly. I do cherish you. And I obey you in all that is not against my conscience. John, those who decided to yield for a while and bend to the storm... They now seem lost to the faith and their children along with them. Oh, Margaret. Use your eyes. Look around this city where 40 years ago everyone was Catholic and every morning in every church mass began the day where people walked round the streets praying the rosary. Mm. Where are they now? Vanished. I have looked and I'm sorrowed by what I see. But I will not desert and leave the small beleaguered fortress in this land with one less defender. Even some priests that agree with me, if you ask them, they would say, let me die, I'm not worth endangering your life and your families. Don't give me refuge. I have never met one. Oh. But if I did, I would reply, I'm not risking my life for you, Father, but for your priesthood. And so you would endanger us all. Oh. Would you not do better looking after your family at home than your soul in prison? Where does your duty lie? What do your vows mean? Take these things to your prayers, Margaret. John. Lord, Lord, I am assailed with conflicts and doubts. Must I no longer continue having the Mass celebrated here? Did you not ordain that this continuance of your last supper go on to the end of time? Am I neglecting a wife's and a mother's duty by going to prison? Is it mere selfishness? Lord, Lord, give me guidance and light. Here I am, Lord, to do your will. But what is your will? Cheers you, cheers you, cheers you. May your light shine forth. May your mother Mary show me the true way. Sancta Maria, ora pro nobis. Sancta Dea Genitrix, ora pro nobis. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. It was such a relief when Father Mush, my ghostly father, returned. It is for your husband John's own safety not to know these things, unless he himself is resolved to live as a Catholic and face up to the dangers. Mm. And as for doing these things without his consent, I would say this. In doing your necessary duty to God, you are no whit inferior to him. Neither do the cruelties of wicked laws change anything. If it were lawful and a good deed before these statutes to have mass celebrated and to receive his priests, the same is still lawful and well done, yea, and even more meritorious in God's sight than ever it was. So my doubts vanished, and my resolutions were firm and clear. Yet in that same moment of joyous happiness, something told me that soon I might have to prepare my neck for the rope. (sighs) Strange how thoughts run together, Agnes. I just then saw another neck, my stepfather's. Round it he was wearing the chain of office of the Lord Mayor of York. He was going to a banquet, where he was to meet none other than the Lord President of the Council of the North himself, the Earl of Huntingdon. As the new Lord Mayor... May I say how honoured I am to have the Lord President of the North at my celebration inauguration. And it is my pleasure to inform you, Your Grace, 
that we, the corporation, are sending you a ton of Gascony wine as just a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. <laughs> now, let the music commence. There are one or two things I would like to draw to your attention, Lord Mayor, if I can have a few moments of your time. Well, of course you can, Your Grace. Uh, how, uh, how can I be of assistance? I am still concerned about recusancy in this city. Oh, by my actions in the past, I hope I've proved that I do share your concern, Your Grace. You have shown a certain amount of zeal, and I hope the council of this city, under your leadership, will act with even more determination and urgency now. I am informed that some members of the council and their families even do not give that example of coming to church that they ought to. Oh, Your Grace knows all that will change now. I hope so, Lord Mayor. Surely there's no doubt about my loyalty. Of course not. You would not have been elected. My information is that those who are in these matters most peevish are the women of this place. Uh, <laughs> that is indeed so, Your Grace. In one parish alone, I am reliably informed, there are 15 recusant wives of tradesmen, seven of them wives of butchers. Oh, I would think those figures correct. One in particular is constantly mentioned in reports, a butcher's wife. Oh? One, Margaret Clitheroe, your stepdaughter, I believe, Lord Mayor. Yeah. A great thorn in my side, Your Grace. A great thorn in all our sides. She misses no opportunity, my spies tell me, to spread the evil, pernicious doctrine in the street, in the market, in her shop, at banquets even. As a result, she has perverted many from the Queen's religion. Well, Your Grace must also know that it is more than 15 years since she left my household and control. I do, I do. And uh, she has found no favour from me. She's been jailed three times and is now under house arrest. But you did not bring about the arrests. No. Again, I confess I did not. Your late wife, being Margaret Clitheroe's mother, would present difficulties. Even the highest families at court have these troublesome relations. Even I have. Uh, I'm grateful for Your Grace's understanding in this matter. My wife died last year. It'll now be less difficult to take harsher measures. I'm glad to hear of your new resolve, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Are you, Lord Mayor, not the godfather of her eldest son, Henry? That is so. Huh. It is a fact that everyone knows, and I've never failed to publicly confess. How is your godchild? Or should I say, where is your godchild? Well, you do not answer, Lord Mayor. My intelligences tell me the boy has disappeared from the city of York and is now more likely than not overseas. As his godfather, you must have known of his disappearance. The secret could not have been kept long from you. Well, I learned of it only after he had disappeared, Your Grace. But you did not report it. Well, I felt it was then too late. I suppose you were afraid that such information might have prejudiced your chances of becoming Lord Mayor. Oh, I don't know, Your Grace, but, but I assure you that in the future I will prove my unswerving loyalty. Well, let me advise you on how you can convince me of your loyalty. Oh, how, Your Grace? By bringing a little terror and violence into the life of your stepdaughter. <laughs> how commendable it would be if you could get her to conform in your year of office. Well, I will certainly attempt it. Obstinate, though we both know her to be. Oh, she's only a woman, Lord Mayor, a mother of children. With all the powers we have in our hands, how can she withstand us? Quite so. I'll give the matter immediate consideration. Not consideration, Lord Mayor. I want immediate action. Whatever you wish, Your Grace. I would suggest this very Wednesday, the 9th. The 9th, it shall be. Let us first call her husband to account. You and your officers, Lord Mayor, can begin by informing him that he is ordered to appear before the Council of the North early on Wednesday. Yes, Your Grace. Then, while he's being questioned, your sheriffs and their men can do what you have overlooked these years, Lord Mayor. They can raid the house of Margaret Clitheroe and tear it apart if necessary. That will be done. And you know what I want you to find, Lord Mayor? I want you to find the right sort of evidence. Oh, my men will find all the evidence there is. But I want a special kind of evidence. Evidence that will hang her. Evidence that will hang her, my Lord Mayor. So they raided your house, Margaret. Yes. Father Mush was in his chamber in the secret place, so I dispatched one of my servants to warn him, and he escaped by way of my neighbour's house. But I believe they almost caught the schoolmaster, Mr Stapleton. Yes. 
Mr. Stapleton was quietly teaching when a ruffian bearing a sword and buckler on his arm opened the door. Suspecting Mr. Stapleton to be a priest, he shut the door on him and called to his fellows. I've got a priest in here! I've got a priest! Quick! But Mr. Stapleton made a quick exit by the other door and rushed upstairs to the room with the secret entrance to the mass chamber. He's getting away upstairs! After him, man! Oh, after I'm, him! I'm a He's on the door on us! Break it down! It's solid! We need a battering ram! Smash the lock! Use your halberds on it! When they got inside, they found the room empty. Mr. Stapleton had thoughtfully closed the secret entrance behind him, so they thought he had escaped through the attic window. They then began to arrest everyone in the house, starting with me. Sheriff, there's a room full of children downstairs. A whole lot of them. Hey, one boy, a Dutch lad, says he is. He looks frightened out of his wits. Any sign of the man? Nah, he got clean away. Who was he? Mrs. Clitheroe? Who was who? The man who must have jumped out of the window. I did not see any man jump out of any window. Take it away, and his servants. <laughs> I've never found an hiding hole yet. Neither have I. Didn't you just say there was a young forehead lad, frightened out of his wits? I just did. Tell them to bring him up here. Right. Sheriff wants that Dutch lad. Yeah, I saw three good bits. Can I take them, Sheriff? You said we could help ourselves after the raid. Not yet. The raid's not finished. The beds are mine. I don't want anyone else going off with them. Yes, well, all right, the beds are yours. But we've got to find some evidence of mass or priests. Not until we've got the evidence, can you do those beds? Come here, you little rat. I know nothing. Please don't hurt me. Everybody knows something, lad. What's your name? Jan. Oh, Dutch, are you? I am part Dutch, part English. Part Dutch, part English. <laughs> uh, a bit of a mixture, eh? <laughs> Take his clothes <laughs> off. No, <laughs> please, I haven't done anything. Oh, yes, you have. You have been caught in a papist house, lad. And that's enough. You, you bring a whip. A whip! <laughs> hey, where will I find it? You had no difficulty finding three beds, so find a whip. Please, I've done nothing. No, I've done nothing. Only <laughs> enough to get yourself hanged. Hanged? Oh, being Dutch, you don't seem to know the laws of England, lad. I, I, I know nothing. I'm sure you'll find you know quite a lot before we finish with you. Seen anybody hang, boy? No. Hmm. Well, you see, first, you're drawn on a hurdle, head down so that your head sometimes bangs on the road. And then when you get to the gallows, they put the rope round your neck mm. and you mount the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> then he give you speech. <laughs> crowd always likes a speech. <laughs> what will you say, Len, lad? I don't know. <laughs> and at the right moment, the hangman takes you by the shoulder, twists and turns you up. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa needs hanging, drawing and quartering. You cut down while you're still alive. Then you strip naked and cut... From belly to neck. <laughs> then your insides are pulled out before your eyes, and you can feel the executioner groping for your heart to pull that out. <laughs> I don't want to die. Uh, how about this whip? It'll take the skin off him. Fine. Fine. You don't want to die, you say? No, no. Well, that's understandable. I suppose you'd like to escape a whipping, too. Now hold him down. Oh, I tell you, I tell you, I, I, I could show you the priest hiding hole. A priest hole? <laughs> not here, not in this house, lad. Yes, yes there is. Look, look here. Ah. Oh. This, this, this is the priest hole. Well, well, we never have found that by next Easter. You won't hang or whip me. Ah, you're a good lad. I'll not do anything to you now. It'll be a bit of a tight squeeze getting in there, so you lead the way then, eh? Very good. I show you. See anything, Sheriff? Aye. Aye, this is a priest hiding hole, all right. No priest, but... Besides a recent occupation, well, what's that? apple tarts, bread, here. Yeah. What about mass things? Well, where you found now then, lad? Hidden cupboard. And it's full of vestments, books, linen, chalices, plates. Gold and silver too, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and if one item of this goes missing, 
It'll be your neck that's stretched. Now, this isn't spoil. This is the evidence that's going to put an end once and for all to Margaret Clitheroe. It's a pity about that lad, Mrs. Clitheroe. But for him, they'd have had nothing on you. Oh, it's getting dark. Time I lit the lantern. Ah, oh, we'll have to do something about this pail. Jaya! Jaya! What is it? We want to empty a pail. Hey, Tash, you're not still here. I said a few minutes, that was all. You've been here all day. Out with you. And drag that pail out with you at the same time. Oh. And not slop oh, it all over the floor. Margaret, God be with you. I'll try to see you again as soon as I can. Over oh, well, my dead body. Out with you, woman. Pity oh. she has to go. Mrs. Clitheroe. There is a way you can save your life. A pregnant woman cannot be executed in England until after the birth of her child. Mm. Now, some of your friends and kinsfolks are saying you may be with child. You've only to say definitely that you are. The council have already questioned me on this matter, Mrs. Yard. The truth is I cannot tell for certain whether I am or not. I've been deceived before in this, and therefore I cannot give a direct answer. But in your heart, how do you feel? I rather think I am with child than otherwise. And this I told the council. My lord, what brings you at this hour to a judge's chambers? It has come to my ears that you consider the prisoner Margaret Clitheroe is pregnant. That is so, my Lord President, and she may not be executed if she be with child. My good judge, you are too merciful in these cases. If she is not executed, she will undo a great many. If she be with child, I cannot consent that she shall die. And I am telling you that this woman is not to have the benefit of her belly. My Lord President, God forbid that she should die if she be with child. She may have offended, but the child in her womb has not. If she is suffered to live, there will be more of her order without any fear of law. Judgment is passed. Let the law proceed. I cannot give my consent until she is further tried. I am only asking you to stand by your judgment, my learned judge. If it helps you, I will take it upon my conscience that she is not with child. I will by no means consent. Whether you consent or not, my counsel will have its will in this matter. Well, then I refer it to your counsel, my lord. So unto you and them the decision rests. But I still have power to command a stay of execution. And this I do until Friday the 25th of March. Then depart this city with your conscience. She will have a stay of execution until Friday, March the 25th, my learned judge, but not a minute more. She shall die that very day. Margaret Clitheroe. Yes, Master Sheriff. We have come to inform you that your husband has been set at liberty and ordered to depart this city for five days. And what is the reason for this? So he will not be within the city when you are executed. Poor John. We are also come to you this night to inform you what day has been appointed for your death. And what day is that? Friday of this week. And this day is Tuesday, is it not? It is. There is not much time left to me. Sheriff, would it be possible for Mrs. Tesh to come to me now? We will tell her. Thank you, Master Sheriff. I would be most grateful for her company at this time. Agnes, I feel the frailty of mine own flesh which trembleth at this news. Although my spirit greatly rejoices. Therefore I ask again, Agnes, for God's sake, pray for me. I will, Margaret, I will. And I will ask everyone to pray for thank you. Thank you, thank you. Flesh is frail, but I trust in my Lord Jesu that he will give me strength to bear all troubles and torments which shall be laid upon me for his sake. 
I hear my husband has been set at liberty and ordered to depart the city. When he was told of your condemnation, he fared like a man out of his wits and wept so vehemently that blood gushed out of his nose in great quantity. Oh, John. He told the councillors, Take all I have but save her, for she is the best wife in all England and the best Catholic also. Oh, how I love him, oh, John. Will he ever know? What of my daughter, Anne? How does she fare? Anne refused to betray you and is committed to prison where she is being extremely used because she refuses to renounce her faith. But she is constant. She is constant. Have no fear, Margaret. Agnes, only you and God know how I worry about my husband and family. What can I do? There is only one thing you can do now. Cast away all fear and leave their welfare in the hands of God. That I do. I also make a voluntary and ready offering of myself to a cruel death in testimony of my love for God and the truth of my faith. You can do no more on this earth. There is one thing still to be done. And what is that? I wish to make myself a habit of linen, clean white, that will cover my body parts so that I shall not die naked, which causes me most concern. Leave it to me, Margaret. Needles, thread and linen will be yours to protect the dignity of womanhood. Agnes Tesh, you will have to leave now. There is an important visitor to see you, Margaret Clitheroe. I wonder who that can be. I wonder. God be with you, Margaret. And with you, Agnes. It's the Lord Mayor himself. Father. As Lord Mayor of York, on my knees, I beg you to consider your husband and children. I beg you. There is no need to kneel. I wish no one to kneel before me, least of all the Lord Mayor of York. You mock me. Nay, I mock you not. You look neither dignified nor comfortable in such a position. <clears throat> Margaret, great pressures were put upon me to act. This you must believe. I do believe. All I wished was the distinction of beginning my period of office as Lord Mayor by winning back my stepdaughter. I only wish to frighten you into conformity. Is that all? I even arranged the raid, knowing it would be too late to catch anyone at mass. I never thought anyone would give away the priest hole. I was... I was dismayed to see how things developed. Henry May? Dismayed? So was I. No, you made light of things again, Margaret. The council can only see that sentence is carried out, a sentence so barbarous as to stir up public opinion still further against the council. But I don't doubt that... Yet I can get you a pardon. And how would you do that? By saying that you will conform, nothing else. A public denial of my beliefs, nothing less. Acquiescence to the new mood of the country would be a better way of putting it. Then you'd be able to live quietly and, and do what you wish. I'll see to it. And you will see to it that I could go to Mass and receive the sacraments while I live quietly. Oh, Margaret, you know that's impossible. I will not deny my beliefs, God willing. You do treasure your good name. I do. The, the Flemish boy. Oh, what now have they done to him? They've got him to confess that you have sinned with priests. Oh. And that the priests and you would have delicate cheer when you'd set your husband with bread and butter and red herrings. Oh. Give you these forged tales. If the boy said so, I warrant you he will say much more for a pound of figs. Then think of John, your husband. How will he take these accusations? They'll cause him great hurt. They cause me even greater hurt. John will not accuse me that I have offended him at any time. You know the truth as well as anyone. Oh, truth to hell with truth. We have to save face, all of us. We have not to save our faces, but our souls, all of us, Father. I perceive nothing will serve to make you change your mind. Nothing. Well, once again, you show your stupidity. Jailer, let me out. Let me out of this woman's presence. Yes, Lord Mayor. All right. You are a sick and evilly disposed woman. You've brought yourself, your family... And the civil authority is a disrepute.
Mrs. Clitheroe. I was put in this cell to report your doings, but I've reported nothing. Thank you, Mrs. Yard. You're a very good woman, Margaret Clitheroe. Mrs. Yard, I would like you and some Catholics to accompany me and be with me when I die. At the time of my agony, put me in mind of God. Oh, I couldn't be present at so cruel a death, Mrs. Clitheroe. I I just couldn't. But but what I will do is procure some friend to lay on such heavy weight that you're put quickly out of your pain. Oh, no, good Mrs. Yoward, not so. God forbid I should procure any to be guilty of my death and blood. I cannot see you die. I I cannot for all the world, Mrs. Clitheroe. The cell is dry now. We've had no rain these last few days. Yes. Yes, it is. The sheriff will be coming for you at eight of the clock this morning, Mrs. Glitheroe. Eight this morning. God's will be done. Good morning, Master Sheriff. I have come for you, Margaret Clitheroe. Are you ready to die? I am ready. Is there anyone you would like to accompany you? Yes, Agnes Tesh. She's outside and waiting. Agnes Tesh! Yes, Sheriff? You can have a few moments together. Do you realise what day it is, Agnes? March the 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin. Mary, Mother of God. Assist me in my last agony. She will. You've always had such a great devotion to Our Lady. It is remarkable that I'm able to offer up my soul on this particular day, which marks the moment that our Saviour was incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. If they had known, I'm sure they would have changed it. I believe they would. I do believe they would have chosen any but this day. This is the room in which you are to be executed. You may kneel down and pray first, Margaret Clitheroe. Thank you, Sheriff. I will do that. While you're on your knees, you can pray for the Queen. I pray for the Catholic Church, for the Pope's holiness, and for all such as have care of the souls. I pray for all Christian princes in the <laughs> world. Jump without glorious Queen Elizabeth. I pray for Elizabeth, colony. Queen of England. And I humbly beseech God to turn her to the Catholic faith that after this mortal life she may enjoy the joys of heaven unto whose soul I do wish as much joy as unto mine own. Yeah, that's enough. Now, take off your clothes. Let her die in her clothes, Sheriff. What difference does it make? You keep out of this, Agnes Tesh. She must die naked as judgment was given against her. Please let me die in my smock. No, that I will not grant. Sentence is that you die naked. Then permit the women to unclothe me and have the men turn their faces from me. All right. You women, help her take things off. You men, turn your heads away. Go on. Is she ready yet? Yes. What's that thing she has on? It's just a habit of living to cover her secret parts. All the rest of her body is left naked. Surely you don't object to that. Yeah, all right. Lay her down upon the ground. Now, man. Put a sharp stone under her back. That's it, that's it. Now you cover her face with an handkerchief. Right. Now, lay this broad door on her. Don't put the waist on yet. Margaret Clitheroe, you cannot have your hands joined in front of your face. They must be tied to posts. You two, tie your hands to these posts. Look, she now forms the perfect cross with her arms extended. Get on with it. Margaret Clitheroe, before the weights are placed on the door we have rested upon you, I call upon you again to ask the Queen's Majesty's forgiveness. And to pray for her. I have prayed for her. Then you are called on to ask your husband's forgiveness. If ever I have offended him, I do ask his forgiveness from the bottom of my heart. 
All right. Lay the weights on. She was, in dying, one quarter of an hour. Upon her was laid to the quantity of seven or eight hundred weights at the least, which, breaking her ribs, caused them to burst forth of the skin. Her body was secretly buried in a dung heap the same night. Six weeks later it was found so pure and uncorrupted as though the soul had only departed from the body the day before. Margaret Clitheroe was canonized by Pope Paul VI at St. Peter's, Rome, on October the 25th, 1970. In Margaret Clitheroe by William Keenan, Elizabeth Proud played Margaret, John Clitheroe was Steve Hodson, Henry May, Stephen Thorne, the Earl of Huntingdon, Bill Wallace, Thomas Clitheroe, Jack Watson, and the judge, Peter Copley. The sheriff was Geoffrey Matthews, Father Mush, Patrick Malahide, Agnes Tesh, Angela Phillips, Mrs. Yard, Daphne Hurd, the jailer, James Cairncross, and the Earl of Northumberland, Geoffrey Bateman. Henry Clitheroe was Rupert Graves, Anne Clitheroe, Jilly Grattan, Jane, Miranda Forbes, Father Reeks, John Abineri, the woman in the crowd, Joe Anderson, and Jan Petra Lear. The civil banqueting music was provided by the York Waits, and the Diaz Ire was sung by the choir of Clifton Cathedral. Margaret Clitheroe was directed in Bristol by Sean McLaughlin. Presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you The Devil and Miss Jones, starring Frank Morgan, Linda Darnell, and Gordon Oliver. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Brian Ahern. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. An unnamed philosopher once made this simple observation, that when you look through your window, you see the crowds in the street, the world on parade. When you look in your mirror, you see only yourself. Both are made of glass, with this small difference, that one has a coating of silver added. And that difference can apply to human beings. Add enough silver to a man, he often ceases to consider others and sees no one but himself. And that is the premise of our play tonight, which takes place several years before the war. But I can assure you that all further moralizing stops at once. For this is no weighty drama of social significance. It is rather one of the screen's most entertaining comedies. The Devil and Miss Jones, presented through the courtesy of Frank Ross, producer of the Technicolor Spectacle, The Rogue. In The Devil's Corner, with uh, no intended prejudice, we have the irrepressible Frank Morgan, who will soon be seen in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's The Great Morgan. As the angelic member of tonight's cast, we have the altogether lovely Linda Darnell. And as a gentleman who literally raises Hades, we present that up-and-coming screen star, Gordon Oliver. Together they bring you the story of a modern merchant prince who, in the early 1930s, walks in disguise among the common folk with the most uncommon consequences. I spoke earlier of looking out of the window versus looking in the mirror. Once the point of that parallel has been established, let me hasten to add that I have no objection to mirrors and their contribution to humanity. Certainly they have hoped to make women still more beautiful in many ways, and not the least of these is showing them how Lux Toilet Soap can help them have lovelier complexions. And since a lovelier complexion often means romance and happiness, I'd say that consulting a mirror often is no more than good sense. And if you use Lux Toilet Soap, you'll find your mirror is the glass that cheers. 
Well, now on with our play, as the curtain rises on the first act of The Devil and Miss Jones, starring Frank Morgan as J.P. Merrick, Linda Darnell as Mary, and Gordon Oliver as Joe. J.P. Merrick is one of the richest men in the world. Now, this is nice work if you can get it, and J.P. has had it for 50 years. He is the controlling voice of 30 great corporations. His fingers wiggle in a hundred financial pies all over the country. But now, one of those pies is turning slightly moldy. The morning paper carries the screaming headlines, Richest Man in World Hanged in Effigy Outside His Own Store on 38th Street. In Mr. Merrick's living room, his four financial advisors have come to give their advice. They're all great brains, but they are shaking in their boots. As Mr. Merrick enters, the quartet jumps nervously to his feet. Morning, J.P. How are you, J.P.? Morning, J.P. Uh, good good morning, JP. morning. I suppose you gentlemen have seen the newspaper. Uh, yes, we have, J.P. Richest man in the world hanged in effigy outside his own store on 38th Street. Picture on page six. I thought I sold everything below 38th Street years ago. Oh, well, that store's right on 38th Street, J.P., so we kept it. It's the Neely department store. Uh, look at this picture. That dummy doesn't look like me. Maybe it's supposed to be one of you. I, I don't think so, sir. There's... There's a sign on the dummy with your name on it. Where? Here, see? Uh, M-E-R-R. And that's all you can see. Those people there in the way. Yeah. What are those things on my head? Why, I believe they're supposed to be horns, J.P. Horns? And uh, that thing's the tail? What's been done about all this? Well, we had a talk with the manager of the department store. He fired the ringleader and half a dozen employees who participated in it. Is that all? Have you have this picture enlarged and everybody in it fired? An excellent suggestion, J.P. Gentlemen, I pay you a great deal to take care of my interests in privacy. I want privacy. I haven't had my photograph in a newspaper in 25 years. Now, this is temporary, J.P. Our detective will ferret out the whole thing in no time. What detective? We have a man who's an expert. He's just outside, J.P. If you care to speak to him, he'll show you this thing is a simple little disturbance that really has no significance. Yes. The Boston Tea Party was a little disturbance, too. I want to talk to this detective. Good day, gentlemen. Good, no, day, good day, J.P. Good day. George, send that detective in here. This way, please, Mr. Higgins. This is Mr. Higgins, Mr. Merrick. Uh, all right, George. My breakfast. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mr. Uh, sit down. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, sir. What did you say your name was? Uh, Higgins. Uh, Thomas Higgins, sir. Well, what progress have you made, Mr. Higgins? Well, I, I, I've gotten a job in the store, sir. Nobody in the whole store knows I'm a detective, except the personnel head. And he gave me a card. Here it is, sir. Uh, to whom it may concern. Thomas Higgins is employed in a confidential capacity and is accountable only to me. Signed, Arthur W. Davis, personnel head. You see, sir, I'm a salesman in the children's shoe department. Uh. And that's the hotbed. That whole fifth floor. Your breakfast, Mr. Merrick. Uh, will you have the graham crackers individually, or shall I crumple them in the milk, sir? Individual? Yes, sir. No, 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 no. You can crumple them for a change. Yes, mm. sir. Tell me, Higgins, how soon could you find out who these employees are, the troublemakers? Well, not more than uh, two or three weeks, sir. Why not two or three days? Well, I've got to worm my way into their confidence, sir. Uh, become one of them. How do I know what they'll do in the next two or three weeks? I'm not going to hang from every lamppost in the city while you worm your way into their confidence? Is there anybody you suspect? Well, I haven't really started, sir. I, I thought I'd begin the day after tomorrow. What's that? Well, my wife's having a baby in Philadelphia. Oh, that's where I live. I, I thought I'd go home tomorrow. Mr. Higgins, I don't think you ought to be separated from your wife while you're having a baby. I'll, uh, I'll get someone else for this assignment. Well, that's very considerate of Mr. Merrick, but I... It's I nothing at all. I'll just keep this card for the next fellow. Good day. Well, uh, I'm very grateful for your kindness, Mr. Merrick. Yeah, it is I... perfectly all right. You just go back to Poughkeepsie and forget all about it. Poughkeepsie? Oh, yes. Yes, well, good day, sir. Mm. Baby. Mr. Merrick, sir, it's time for your pepsin. Dr. Schindler made it up into chewing gum. He thought you'd like the change. Yeah. <laughs> look at this picture, George. They've even got a tail on me. I'm there on the dummy. And look at the faithful employees who are hanging me. Morons. Sheep. No wonder you can convince them of anything. Oh, I'd like to hear one of those troublemakers talking. I'd show them. I'd tell them. I'd... George, why shouldn't I? Of course. 
I'll get a job in the store. Mr. Merry. Why not? I'd like to see them operate. But think of your stomach, sir. Yes, I'll be one of them. Mix in with them. Let them talk to me. Why, these idiots. I'll play them like a cat in a mouse. Really, Mr. Merry? Uh, George, from now on, my name is Thomas Higgins. <laughs> Good morning, sir, and what can I do for you? Oh, are you, uh, the section manager? I am, sir, section manager of the shoe department, at your service, sir. Well, I'm working here. I'm the new salesman. If there's any... Oh, you are? Yes, I... Well, let's I... see your slip. They gave you a slip, didn't they? Oh, yes, right here. Hmm, so you're Higgins. Ah. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or preferably, yes, Mr. Hooper. Hooper. Higgins, I've already had a report on you. In the intelligence test you took this morning, your rating was 66. That's one point over the lowest passing grade. 66? There must be some mistake. I answered all the questions. You might have answered some of them wrong. That's possible, isn't it? Uh, I said that's possible, isn't it? Yes, it is. Sir. We, we don't make mistakes, Higgins. Neely's is always right. This is the lowest intelligence rating in my department. I hope you have other qualities to compensate for it, for your own sake. Miss Jones? Uh, did you call me, Mr. Hooper? You heard me, didn't you? Well, I, I'm sorry, sir. I was just going to wait on a customer. Never mind. Miss Jones, I'm assigning Higgins to slippers. Show him his duty. Welcome to the shoe department, Mr. Higgins. You come right along with me. Well, thank you. I'll have my eye on you, Higgins. Just remember that. Yeah, you will, eh? Now, this will be your counter, Mr. Higgins. Bedroom, lounging, and house slippers. You know, this is really much the best job. No bending down for try-ons, no running back and forth for different models. I wish I had this counter. You mean he doesn't think I'm good enough to sell shoes, is that it? Oh, no. Now, don't be silly. You, well, you have to be much more clever selling slippers than you do shoes. Don't forget, people can always do without slippers. They have to be convinced. How could he tell I'm not as good a salesman as the next one? Now, don't be so touchy. Look, you can sell shoes when you're really for lunch. And you show him then what a good salesman you are. Now, today, your lunch hour is from 12 to 1. That's in 30 minutes. I'm not going to eat any lunch. You're not? No, I'm going to stay here, selling slippers. I'm going to make a good impression. Why aren't you going to have lunch? Well, I'm not hungry. I never eat lunch anyway. Now, listen, don't try to kid me. There's only one reason why people don't eat, and I'm going to fix that right now. Uh, Here, you take this. What's that? That's 50 cents. Come on. But I don't want your money. Now, look, you take it and no arguments. I'll see you after lunch, Mr. Higgins. Uh, Would you mind attending to business, please? I'm trying to buy some slippers. Listen, who do you think you're talking... Oh, uh... (laughs) Yes, madam. And what can I do for you, madam? Mr. Higgins? It's time for your lunch. I'll take over your counter now. But I'm not hungry, really. Now, why do you argue so much? You go to lunch and hurry up about it. Well, I don't know where to go. I'll I'll just go and sit in the park, I guess. Some people have an awful lot of pride, haven't they? Pride? Well, I... well, never mind. Uh, did you sell anything yet? No. Uh, Here, let's see your book. Oh, one pair of men's house slippers, one ninety-eight. Well, that's fine. Did you have any trouble selling them? Oh, no, no, not at all. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. You see, uh, my feet started to hurt. <laughs> so, uh, I thought I'd, uh, well, I needed a pair anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Higgins, you sold them to yourself. Well, isn't that allowed? Well, of course, but, oh, hey, look out. What's the matter? Don't look up. A shopper's coming. A what? A store shopper. They pretend they're customers, but they're really testing you. Now, be very careful how you act. Oh, uh, may I help you, madam? Uh, That's all right. This gentleman will wait on me. Yes, Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah. What what can I do for you, madam? Uh, Do you sell slippers here? Yes, ma'am, we do. These are slippers. (laughs) That's what we call them, slippers. (laughs) They don't look very good. Oh, but they are. I wear a pair of these myself. Woolly woolies. (laughs) Keep your feet nice and warm. Real sheep wool. Aren't they a little too warm for the summer? Well, we've never had any complaints from the sheep. (laughs) Oh, no. I'll think about it. I hope you didn't mind my inconveniencing you without buying anything. Oh, of course not, madam. Uh I'm only here to serve you. (laughs) We serve everybody and anybody. (laughs) Listen... Are you chewing gum? 
Who, me? No, ma'am. I am a I... sore shopper. Open your mouth. But, madam, I give you my Open word. Open your I... mouth. Very well, madam. Ah. Is he any gum? Huh? Close your mouth. Close your mouth. Yeah. You swallowed it. No, ma'am. I wasn't chewing any. Well, see that you don't in the future. Uh. And don't lean on the counter, either. Yes, ma'am. Oh, nice work, Pop. You didn't do bad at all. Thank you. <clears throat> Say, uh, is swallowing gum, gum bad for your stomach? Five o'clock. Oh, I thought this day would never end. Oh, you mean we can go home now? <laughs> We are as free as the birds until 8.20 a.m. tomorrow. Mm. Employees! Listen, employees, here I am over here. Oh, it's Joe again. Gather around, everybody. All the employees of the Neely store. Oh, Joe, don't, please. Come on, everybody. Why, well, who's that fellow? Oh, it's Joe. He used to work here. Now he gets thrown out of the store every afternoon. Joe, Joe, listen to me. Folks, I have a message for you. They fired some of us for asking for our rights. But we haven't given up. We're still at it. Attaboy, Joe. Well, stop this. Stop this at once. I'll call the detectives. Go on, call the detectives, Mr. Hooper. Who cares? Don't be afraid, employees. Come to our meetings. If enough of us stick together, they won't be able to stop us. Nobody listen to him. Nobody listen to him. No. Detectives, get rid of this man. Get him out of here. I repeat, folks, come to the meeting tonight. We've got to fight together. Wait, listen. Okay, buddy, come on, outside. Let's go, outside. Me. Folks, they're throwing me out again, but they can't stop us. Come to the meeting. Ramble around the neck, Eddie. I got him. Don't be afraid. Oh, right is on shut our up, side. Shut up. They can't Peter. stop us. Go they on, can't. go on, get out Don't of here. Forget. Come, on, come to the meeting. Oh, Joe, why does he always do that? Come now, clear the floor, please. Clear the floor. Is, uh, is that Joe person a good friend of yours, Miss Jones? Joe? Oh, yeah. Joe's the greatest guy in the world. Gentlemen, employees, gather near the loudspeakers, please. Who's that? That's Mr. Allison, the general manager. He talks to us every day over the public address system. Fellow employees, there was a disturbance on the fifth floor a moment ago. Nothing short of trespassing. A criminal offense. There are still some troublemakers employed in this store we have not as yet ferreted out, but we shall. And if employees are found cooperating with these traitors in our one big happy family, I can tell you now, they will not only be discharged, but blackballed from ever working in any department store in this city. Now, may I wish you all a very good evening. Good night, fellow employees. Why, the big st Tell me, Mr. Higgins, are you doing anything tonight? Me? Oh, uh, no, not especially. You come with me. We're going to that meeting. Hey, Mary. Hello, honey. Glad you could make it all right. Oh, Joe, did they do anything to you at the store? Did they hurt you? Nah, I dared them to. Well, I, I was so afraid they'd do something to you. Hey, who's this? Oh, he started in the store this morning. Oh, welcome, brother. Hello. Uh, Mr. Higgins, this is Joe O'Brien. He's the one who hung up the dummy of J.P. Merrick. Oh, he is. <laughs> Made the front page of the Times, that's all. Uh, did you see it? Yes, I saw it. <clears throat> this, uh, this is quite a pleasure, Mr. O'Brien. <clears throat> Likewise. Come on, we're just about to start the meeting. All right, everybody. I see that some of you are here for the first time. You'd probably like to know more about us. We're not professional agitators. I myself started six years ago in the Neely department store as a packing boy. Worked up to assistant section manager. Now, our quarrel is simple. We're given a small raise every year. Thanks. At the end of 10 or 15 years, when our salaries higher than the new employees, we're let out. Now, this is a regular practice of the store, mind you. It's probably good bookkeeping, but I think it's pretty unfair. Yes, no. Oh, uh, Joe, may I interrupt, please? Sure, what's on your mind, Mary? Well, I'd like to show you a practical case of what we're fighting for, if I may. Certainly, Mary. Folks, this is Miss Jones of Children's Shoes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this gentleman sitting right here is Thomas Higgins. I'd like you to meet him. Oh, no, 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 please. Uh, uh, Mr. Higgins, tell me, how old are you? Well, I don't, uh, uh 55. <clears throat> Now, don't be nervous, Tom. It's all right. Ladies and gentlemen, he's 55. Look at him. He's bright, alert. He has all his faculties. Now I'm going to tell you the rest of that picture. He came to work this morning in children's shoes without the few cents in his pocket he needed to buy lunch. Uh, and that isn't all. 
I gave him 50 cents, and you know what he did with it? He kept it because he needed even that 50 cents more than he needed food. Maybe for, for medicine, maybe for a place to sleep tonight. I, I don't know, I didn't ask him. I felt too ashamed for him. 55 years old and, and nothing to eat. But by what kind of fate he got a job today, I'll never know. But what's to become of him when they let him out? And he will be let out. He has been before, haven't you, Tom? Well, you see, I don't... I, there, I, I, of I, course. <laughs> He's given everything he has. And yet, now, gray-haired, friendless, he faces another employer who will use him and then, then throw him aside for a younger man. <laughs> which leaves him insecure and homeless and with no one to turn to except charity in the poorhouse. <laughs> Is that right? Is that fair? I leave it to you, ladies and gentlemen. What are we going to do? I know what we're going to do. We're all going to stand by old Tom Higgins. Hooray for Tom! Hooray! And then they all stood up and cheered for me. What do you think of that, George? Very uh, interesting, Mr. Merrick. Yeah. Now, if you just put your feet in this hot water, sir, I'm sure they'll feel a little better. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, gosh. That's... Yes, those idiots making me one of them. I'll show them who hangs who. I'll hang every troublemaker in the place. Have you got those notes I telephoned to you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Here they are. One, yeah. intelligence tests out. Yeah. Uh, may I ask why, sir? No, you may not. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Two, pay back 50 cents to Miss Jones. Three, do something about section manager. Yeah, and add another one. Store shoppers out. Yes, sir. store shoppers out. Uh, you know, George, I didn't do so well selling things today. Really, sir? Uh, well, it's just a matter of luck, that's all. Oh, yes, sir, yes, yeah, of course. But I'll fix that. What I want you to do is to find a little girl somewhere, bring her to the shoe department tomorrow at exactly 10 after 12. <laughs> Well, well, sit down, sir. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Uh, Mr. Merrick, I don't feel at all comfortable, sir. Sit down, sit down. And what would you like today, sir? Well, I thought, I thought I'd buy some shoes for my little girl. Oh, shoes for the little girl, yes, sir. <laughs> Hello there, little girl. Won't you be seated? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, little girl. <laughs> George, I want you to buy a dozen pair of shoes. A dozen? I think that's too many, sir. They'll get suspicious. You think so? Oh, yes, sir. Well, all right, then. Half a dozen. No less. Yes, sir. Half a dozen. Yeah. And uh, what size does the little girl wear? Well, I... One and uh... a half I wear. One and a half. Well, thank you. I'll be right back. <laughs> One and a half. Da -da 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 -da. Tom? Yes. Tom, Mr. Hooper's watching you. He is, eh? Good. Now, this is your chance, and don't be nervous, Tom. I'm not nervous. Um, well, what size do you want? I'll help you. Uh, One and a half. All right. Let's see. Here you are. Now, don't be nervous, Tom. Is, uh, is this the hardest shoe to sell? What's the hardest shoe to get rid of in the whole stock? The hardest? Yes. Well, we've got some high tops right here that haven't moved for years. Oh, by the way, there's a 25-cent bonus for each pair you sell. Well, fine. Those are the ones I want. How many of these high tops have you got in stock? Mm, let's see, five. No, that's too bad. I can sell six. <laughs> well, I, I, I do wish you'd just try and sell the ordinary shoes, Tom. You're making trouble for yourself. Yeah, don't be silly. Just watch, that's all. Well, good luck, Tom. Yes. <laughs> now, little girl, here we are. Just slip your foot in, please. I don't like that shoe. Oh, come, 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 come now. Put <laughs> your foot in the shoe, Sally. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't like it. Put your foot in. I don't like it. Get away from me, you big dope. <laughs> George, where'd you get this brat? Hey, she, belongs, she belongs to the upstairs maid, sir. If she doesn't stop yelling, there's going to be another upstairs maid. <clears throat> Stop yelling, dear. I won't. I don't like it. I don't care whether you like it. Here, here, now. Let's not argue, little girl. Let go my foot. Let go or I'll kick you. No, no, no. You wouldn't do that. Don't play. Sally, dear, you mustn't kick the gentleman. Get your foot in there. Listen, get it in, do you hear? No, I won't. Did you I hear won't. me? Boom. Now listen, you little... No, 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 I won't. I hate you. 
I hate you! What is all this? Mr. Higgins, you're not shooing a horse, you know. Mr. Hooper, this little brat! What? I mean, this little girl Quiet. here. I'll take care of this. Uh-oh. Now, little lady, just look what I've got for you. A lollipop. Gimme! There you are. Now, sir, do you want these shoes? Uh, yes, I, I'd like half a dozen pairs, please. Fine, fine. Uh, Mr. Higgins, yeah. there's someone at your slipper counter. I'll take care of this customer. But I've got those shoes sold. There's someone at your slipper counter. Go on. Don't you lose confidence in yourself, Tom. Uh, you could have sold them just as well. Mr. Hooper only butted in because he wanted to get the bonus. I don't remember when I've disliked anyone as heartily as I do him. And I've disliked quite a few people in my time to their misfortune. Well, you just forget all about it now. I'm an elephant, Miss Jones, a veritable elephant. I never forget a good deed done me or an ill one. Well, you mustn't say anything to Mr. Hooper about it. He can tie the can to you, you know. What can? Well, uh, tie the can to you. Get you fired. Uh, now, promise me you won't say anything to him. Promise. No, all right. I won't say anything. Tom, do you what? know what would be very clever? What? If you'd go over right now and thank him for helping you out. Thank him? Well, you want to keep this job, don't you? You're in no position to be independent. Now, go on over. Go on. Oh, uh, very well. Be nice now. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Hooper. Yes, uh, Mr. Hooper. Well? I wanted to say about that sale. Oh, yes. <laughs> You've got quite a way with children, Higgins. <laughs> well, I... They I... certainly take to you, like a duck to water. <laughs> yes, well... Hot water. <laughs> well, I probably couldn't have handled it as well as you. As well I, as I... me, you couldn't handle it at all. I made that sale. Oh, I don't know. I have a hunch those shoes are coming back. My sales never come back. Is that so? Mm -hmm. You, uh, you want to bet? Certainly, <laughs> certainly. How much? Oh, uh, well, make it easy on yourself. How much can you afford? Well, I can manage to scrape a little something together. Would $10 be too much? Make it 20 I'll be lucky if I get the 10 I'll say so. And if you want to bet any more, brother, I'll even give you odds. <laughs> Our stars will return in Act Two of The Devil and Miss Jones in just a moment. And now, have you heard what they're saying? My, she's pretty. Skin like a movie star's. Guess she's a Lux girl. Now there's what I mean by a peaches and cream complexion. She must be a Lux girl. Yes, they're Lux girls. These girls who get lots of compliments, who attract admiring eyes. They're the girls with lovely, smooth, soft skin. Clever girls who've taken a tip from nine out of ten famous screen stars. I wouldn't dream of missing my daily active lather facials with Lux toilet soap. They leave my skin feeling wonderfully soft and smooth. If you think your skin could be lovelier, why not try these daily beauty facials screen stars depend on? They're easy, and they're quick. You cover your face with lots of the Lux soap lather. It's so creamy and rich. Then you rinse with warm water, splash on cold, and then you just pat your skin dry with a soft towel. Now, touch your skin. You'll like the way it feels. Regular Lux Toilet Soap facials do make skin lovelier. Recent tests proved that actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with this gentle daily care. The creamy, active lather Lux Toilet Soap has does a thorough job, gives delicate skin the protection it needs. Why not get some of this fine white soap tomorrow? Remember, Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own beauty soap. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of The Devil and Miss Jones, starring Frank Morgan as J.P. Merrick, Linda Darnell as Mary, and Gordon Oliver as Joe. It's almost a week since J.P. Merrick went to work as a shoe salesman in his own store. He's finding out a great many things, principally that selling shoes is hard on the feet. Once again in his living room, he immerses those tired members in a pan of hot water. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, George, my little experiment. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, sir. Uh, I watch the little ants scurrying around, and I know each and every one's going to get his just desserts. Oh, I'm sure they are. That uh, Joe, Mary's fella. Bad, an evil influence on the girl. Kind of Slangali, corrupting her whole viewpoint. I'm going to break that up tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow's yeah. Sunday, sir. Well, that's right. They've invited me to go along on a sort of a picnic or something. Coney Island. A picnic? You, yeah. sir? Coney Island? A yeah, beach picnic. I'm supposed to bring something. I said I'd bring a bottle of wine, but they don't think I will because I haven't the money. <laughs> yeah. Well, get along to the wine cellar, George. Yes, sir. Say, George, what's, uh, what's the best bottle in the whole place? Uh... I'd say the Romani Conti, 1903. Uh, it's good, eh? Oh, rather, sir. There were only 24 bottles in the world originally. Right. You bought 12 and the royal family had the other 12. Well, that's it. You go down and get it. But take the label off the bottle. I don't want them to be suspicious. Label off the bottle, yes, sir. Oh, Tom, you shouldn't have spent your money for wine, really. Oh, well, you only live once. Uh, here you are, Joe. Try that. Okay. Here's looking at you. Skull. <coughs> well, how is it? No, no. Well, you like it, don't you? Well, I'll tell you, Tom, it's not really bad. It's, oh, Tom, uh... did you spend more than 50 cents for this wine? 50 cents? Well, certainly, I... Oh, I... Tom, they saw you coming. Who saw me coming? You mean you don't like this wine? Say, I've got a good mind to return it and make them give you your money back. Yeah, the nerve of some people. Now, wait a minute. You're not giving this wine a fair chance. Here, I got an idea. Pass your cup, Mary. Okay. Here, here. What, what are you doing with that wine? I'm going to mix it with 7-Up. Maybe it'll kill the taste. Oh. Here, Mary, try this. Listen, you, that wine is... That... How is it, Mary? Oh, no. It's awful. I guess you just can't save it, Tom. Oh, it's a shame, really. It's too bad we had to ruin the bottle of 7-Up, too. Uh, well, pour it out, Tom. It might make you sick. Yeah. I am sick. Wine experts. Well, I'm going for a swim. How about it, Tom? No, 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 thanks. Now, don't show off and swim way out, Joe. Nobody will be watching you. <laughs> Just you, honey. <laughs> don't forget to come back. Don't worry. Nothing will happen to him. <laughs> well, he's a pretty good swimmer. He's pretty good at everything. You, uh, you couldn't be prejudiced. Maybe. Isn't it possible you're reading virtues into him that don't exist? Don't you like him? What makes you say that? Well, I was watching you in the bus coming down. I, I thought you were making faces at him. My feet were hurting me. <laughs> but you're not, uh, not really crazy about him, are you? No. Are you? Oh, sure. I think he's marvelous. I don't think you're any judge. Well, who's a better one? Any outsider. Me, for instance. Now, look around. There. There's a couple over there. They think they were made for each other. He's biting her ear. <laughs> now she's biting his ear. <laughs> Very touching. Well, I think so. They've found each other, haven't they? Out of this whole wide world, these two were lucky enough to come together. But don't you think that if she hadn't met him, there wouldn't be someone else biting her ear now? And don't you think he wouldn't be at some other girl's ear? trying well, to? Uh, oh. maybe, but it doesn't prove anything. Look, scientists can write all the books they like about love being a, a trap of nature, but the only ones the scientists are going to convince are other scientists, not women in love. Oh, I don't say Joe's the greatest guy that ever lived, but, but you see, I, I'm not the greatest girl in the world either. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the greatest love affair in the whole world was between a funny-looking guy and a girl who's missing two front teeth. I mean, if they feel it, they feel it. Do you? Oh, well, not in the way you see in the movies or... Hearing those songs, you know, the touch of your hand, you set me on fire. I guess I'm not the combustible type. We get along just average, I guess, but, well, I, I know if I'd never see him again... That... Yes? Well, I, I never even thought of what it would be like not to see him anymore. I guess that's a test of it. Well, if I thought I'd never see him again, I, I don't think I'd care if I lived or died. <laughs> Hey, Mary. Hmm? Want another swim? Mm-mm. Eh, it's getting pretty late. Maybe we better wake Tom up and go home. Oh, let's let him sleep a little longer. He must be awfully tired. Say, have you watched what he's been eating? He acts like a guy that's just discovered his stomach. I didn't think a goat could put that stuff away. <laughs> oh, Joe, I feel sorry for him. 
Do you know he's never been married? So? So it's a shame. Oh, he must be very lonely. You know, if you haven't got someone that really cares for you, you're all alone. You're one person against the world unless you have someone. Then it's only half as hard. At least you're two against the world. So you both starve together instead of starving alone. Oh, now, Joe, don't let yourself get depressed. Oh, it's all over, Mary. We've lost. What do you mean, we've lost? 400 names out of 2,500 employees, and how can you blame them? Blacklists, door detectives. I don't see how we got the 400. Well, maybe if you gave it more time, Joe. Time? We've had a year already. Oh, it's no go, Mary. I know it. Let the poor suckers who are working at least keep their jobs. Well, Joe, if you could only reach all of them. Yeah, if, if, sure. Mary, I want to talk to you. I meant to do it when I brought you home, but I guess now's as good a time as any. I can't get a job in New York, Mary. I... I can't see you anymore for a while. What do you mean? I can't take up your time anymore. Is that what you call our relationship, taking up my time? Well, I haven't... I haven't got the right to take up your time is what I'm trying to tell you. Well, I think you might ask my opinion about that. What are your plans, Joe? What do you want to do? Go out of town? I'll go with you. That's not such a terrible thing to ask. Oh, Mary, you... But I'd love to if you want me. Oh, oh, Joe, I wish you'd marry me just like it is. I'm not afraid. No, women are never afraid. How long do you think you'd be in love with me, living off your salary? Well, that's nothing to be ashamed of if you can't help it. Not to you, but it is to me. I can't be in love under those conditions. And I couldn't go away obligating you to wait for me. Well, that's... That's very considerate of you, at least. Maybe I hope you'll wait for me. You're young and attractive. You've got a whole life ahead of you. Go out and meet people. Have a good time. Who knows? You might get interested in somebody wonderful. Yeah, that's just what someone was telling me recently. That's what nature does, let you get interested in other people. Well, well, then I don't promise to wait for you, if that'll make you happy. But you're nothing but a coward. What? Sure, for all your courage, you can't even face life. You're afraid to get married because you might not be able to get a job. It's not me I'm worrying about. I'm not going to get locked up in a hall bedroom watching you iron my shirts and nobody's going to make me. Oh, nobody's going to make you do anything. Go on, go out of town. Go any place you like. Oh, Mary, now you... Right now you can go on home. Go on, unless you're afraid of the dark. You get off pretty soon now, don't you, Tom? Yeah. Oh, yes, but uh, maybe I'd better see that you get home all right. Oh, don't bother about me. Anyway, that was Joe's job. I, uh, I'm sorry you had a fight. How did you know? Well, I... I wasn't asleep all the time. <clears throat> oh. It's going to turn out all right. I've got a seventh sense. <laughs> you mean a sixth sense? No, I'm very unusual. I've got a sixth and a seventh. <laughs> oh, Tom, you really shouldn't drink. You know, it's not good for you. You can't get drunk on what I drank. Wine and seven up. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tom, you're swell. I like you. You do, eh? Well, that's fine. But I wonder if you'd like the real me. Now, don't tell me you've got hidden depths. Well, a man may not be everything he appears to be on the surface, you know. What do you mean? Uh, nothing. 72nd Street next. 72nd. Well, here's my stop. So long, Tom. So long. Look, now, you be careful going down those steps. I will. See you in the store. Yeah, see you in the store. Getting off, getting off. Step lively, please. Take your time, son. Okay, Tom. Tom, you dropped something. Bye, Mary. Listen, you dropped some papers out of your pocket. They're here on the seat. What? Some papers, cards and things. What? Come on, step lively. I'll keep them for you, Tom. <laughs> keep what? The cards. What? Come on, let's go, let's go! Never mind, see you in the store. Bye. Bye. To whom it may concern, Thomas Higgins is employed in a confident, confidential capacity. Is accountable only to me. Arthur W. Davis, personnel head, Neely's department. Confidential? Confidential capacity? Hello, is this you, Joe? This is Mary. Listen, Joe, I've got to see you. Yes, tonight. Right now, it's very important. Joe, listen, we're in terrible trouble. Just terrible, Joe. In just a moment, Brian Ahern and our stars will return with Act Three of The Devil and Miss Jones. 
And now, it's Mrs. Abbott's kitchen. And here's Mrs. Abbott engaged in a rather messy job. There. I guess there's not a scrap of fat left in that roasting pan. Uh, hand me that tin can, Sue, will you? The one on the back of the stove? Honestly, Jean, do you have to carry saving fats that far? That grease is all burnt and black. Makes no difference. The fat is just as valuable. And now that we have less used fat left over from cooking, I've got to save all the harder. <laughs> you take it seriously, don't you, Jean? I've noticed since I've been visiting you how religiously you scrape every drop into that tin can. Sue, remember that old saying, the little more and how much it is? Well, if all the women would remember that, whenever they throw away a drop of used grease, the government wouldn't be so hard up for fats. Besides, from a selfish point of view, I get two red ration points for every pound I save. What are all these fats used for? Sue, there are literally thousands of uses. And with so much of our supply in the Far East still cut off, we Americans have to help make it up. Look, here's what our used fats help to make. Munitions, tons of them, medicines, all kinds, especially insulin, tannic acid, and the sulfur drugs. You know, they use those to treat shock, burns, and wounds. Then there's synthetic rubber. And Sue, think of all the needs for fats on the home front. Lubricants used in war plants, plastics, paints, textiles, and soap. My goodness, I never realized how important this fat salvage thing really is. Oh, those are just a few uses for our used fats. Now you see why I save every single drop. Remember, for every pound of used fat you turn in, your grocer will give you four cents and two red ration points. More than ever, under the new rationing requirements, you need those extra points. More than ever, your government needs every drop of your used kitchen fats. So, won't you keep on remembering the little more and how much it is? And now, let Brian Ahern returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll bring our stars to the footlights for their curtain calls. And now, here's the third act of The Devil and Miss Jones, starring Frank Morgan as Merrick, alias Tom Higgins, Linda Darnell as Mary, and Gordon Oliver as Joe. Mary has discovered that Thomas Higgins is a spy for the Neely department store. Her argument with Joe is forgotten now, and in her mind is a single thought, to protect her friends. It's late at night when Joe arrives at her apartment. Well, what's it all about? Joe, do you remember that list of names? The 400 employees? Sure. Well, where is it? Have you got it? No, oh, I gave it to Higgins. You gave it? To... Oh, when? Down at the beach. I had it there checking it off. When I went in for a oh. swim, I stuck it under Higgins' towel. Oh, Joe. What's the matter? You can get it from him tomorrow. Tomorrow's too late. Higgins is a spy for the store. Higgins is... You're crazy. I am not. Look at this card. Thomas Higgins is employed in a confidential capacity and is accountable only to me. Arthur W. Davis, personnel head. Let me see that. There's no mistake. And he's got all those names. Where does he live? I'll get that list back tonight. Oh, I don't know. He got off the bus at 72nd Street. Oh, that's no help. Listen. Tomorrow you get him in the stockroom. I'll get that list. Now, how are you going to get in the store? Don't worry how I get in the store. You get him in the stockroom, see, and I'll join you. I'll get that list if I have to hit him over the head. <laughs> Well, well, good morning, Mr. Higgins. Good morning, Mr. Hooper. Ten o'clock. We're a little late this morning, aren't we? Oh, did you come late, too? <laughs> you are a little late this morning? Yes, I am. And why, may I ask? Because I overslept. I was tired. My, that's a novel excuse. Well, it's true. Higgins, I don't like your tone of voice. Hooper, I don't like yours either. Who do you think you're talking to? Just another employee of the store, that's all. And a darn poor one at that. You know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be fired. I'm going to be fired? Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You're going to be fired. How do you like that? Oh, Mr. Hooper. Yes, what is it? Uh, these shoes came back this morning. What shoes? Five pair of high tops. It was your sale, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Give me my ten dollars, Hooper. Take those shoes to the desk. I'll attend to it later. Hey, where's my money? You owe me ten dollars. You get back to your work. Yeah. Crook. Man's a crook. Oh, uh, Mr. Higgins. Yeah. May I see you a minute? Oh, good morning, Mary. Say, what were you yelling at me last night on the bus? Oh, it wasn't very important. Uh, Mr. Higgins, would you be kind enough to assist me in the stock room? Well, certainly. What's, uh, what's this Mr. Higgins business? Uh, right over this way, please. It won't take very long. Well, what, uh, what happens now? Well, uh... Uh, you see all these boxes? There are shoes in them. Yes, I figured that out the first day I got here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, well, there's been a lot of trouble in here lately. There should be a right shoe and a left shoe in each of these boxes, and, well, lately there's been a right shoe with a right shoe, and there ought to be a left shoe with a left shoe. What's that again? 
Um, well, look, you just open every box and see that there's a right shoe and a left shoe in it. Every box? All of them? Yes. Now, uh, you, you better start at the top of the ladder and work down. Uh, what are you going to do? Well, I'll just wait. What for? Well, till you finish. Oh, uh, well, here I go. <clears throat> I'll be down Saturday. <clears throat> Personally, I think this whole thing is a waste of time. Oh, no. I mean, well, well, after all, you can't sell people two left shoes, can you? See, what are you so jumpy about, anyway? Jumpy? Who's jumpy, me? Well, there's only two of us in here. No, there isn't. There's three now. Oh, Joe. Hello, Joe. All right, Higgins. Let's have that list. What list? You know what list. That list of names I wanted. Oh, that list. Come on, hand it over. Do you want to come up here, or do I have to come down there? Now, listen, Higgins. I'm not going to stand for any funny business. Oh, Joe, not so loud. What's the matter with everyone? We know you, Higgins. You're a spy. Now, give me that list. Eddie, you said he grabbed him. Joe, the detective. Come on, you. Okay, Joe, let's go. Take your hands off Get him around the neck, Eddie. I got him. Hold oh, on. Oh, let him alone. Cut it now. Are you going to come peaceful? Yeah. What is all oh, this? Stop come it. on, come on. Stop I got it. him. Listen, get I'm away from this sure ladder. You want to knock me off here? Get away from the ladder. Come on, come on, you. I got Wait a him. minute. The ladder's shaking. If you don't stop this, I'll... I'll, 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 I'll go. Oh, Wait, hey, sock him, Eddie. Sock him, sock him. I got him. Listen, stop. I can't hold on up here. I'm going to slip. Look out. Look out. Oh. oh, he fell down. You knocked him off the ladder. Oh, Tom. Tom, speak to me. Hold Tom. on to this guy, Eddie. I, I got him. All right, now, Pop, come on. Open your eyes. Oh, Tom. Please, please, Tom, dear. Oh. <laughs> what happened? Oh, Tom, Tom, you all right? Sure, he's all right. Just drunk, that's all. He is not drunk. You knocked him off the ladder. Don't be silly. I leave it to you, Eddie. What do you say? Definitely pie eyed. Sure. Everybody knows he's a heavy drinker. Listen, you can't get away with this. You're too. Come on, come on, all of you. Hey, get this guy on his feet. Eddie. Up you go, Pop. Oh. oh. You must feel pretty good, Higgins. Oh. You'll probably get a raise after they fire all these poor people. You, you Benedict Arnold in children's shoes. <laughs> I'll show you who's a Benedict Arnold in children's shoes. You watch. I demand to be taken to the manager. <laughs> Brother, you must be a mind reader, because that's just where you're going. Furthermore, I have not been drinking. And if you weren't such a fool, you could see that for yourself. Just a moment, Higgins. Uh, Who do you think you're talking to? I'm talking to you, Mr. Allison. Fine manager you are. Can't you understand that dealing with people the way you do is the reason for this civil war around here? I've worked with these people. They have rights. Really? Yeah. And what would you suggest? I suggest that you get a different job if you can't get the confidence of your employees, you bumble-witted idiot. Oh, Tom, Tom, this is wonderful what you're doing, and you'll never regret it. Well, Let them fire you. As long as there's a breath in my body, you'll never go hungry. Calling me names isn't a solution. I'd like nothing better than to get the confidence of my employees. But who can I talk to? Who represents enough of these people? Mr. Allison, would you consider 400 enough? Yes, I would. There's our representative, Joe O'Brien. All right. Where are your 400 names, Mr. O'Brien? Yeah, there's the catch. He wants the names. Well, you're not going to get there, you see. My hands are tied. Wait, this, is a, this isn't a trick, is it? Do I look like I'm lying to you? Well, no, you don't. Mary, you can't give him those names. Listen, if there is a right way, Joe, this is it. We're not being fair to him. I mean, if we want him to trust us, we've got to trust him. Well, I'm against it. Well, I'm taking a big chance, too, Joe, if this doesn't work out. Let me try. All right, honey. Go ahead. Tom, have you got that list of names? Yes, I have. Give it to Mr. Allison, please. Very well. Mr. Allison, it's going to be terrible if you fool these two young people. Let me have the list, please. Yeah, here you are. Thank you. Uh, you old fool. How dare you come into my office and talk to me like you did? I can outwit morons like you every day of the week and twice on Sundays, which is why I sit behind the desk while you stand in front of it. What are you going to do? I'm going to fire everybody whose name is on this list. Give me back that paper. Get away. I'll take care of this guy. Grab the list, Mary. Stop it. Stop okay. it, I say. Milligan, oh, Eddie. I, I've got the list, Joe. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Here, Tom, eat this paper. What? Uh, chew it. Eat it. Eat the paper. Listen, I've got a weak stomach. Well, here, then I'll help you. You eat this part and I'll eat the rest. Very well. Uh, let's have my portion. Milligan, Eddie. Oh, Mary, lock the door. Oh, I'm eating a paper. Lock the door. Don't let anybody in. Yeah, well, it's all right, Joe. You can let them up now. <laughs> okay, Mr. Allison. Where's, 
Where's that list of names? I demand that you give them to me, Higgins. Where is it? I need it. What? I need it. Very well, Higgins. You're fired. Get out. I'll get out when I finish eating this paper, not before. Go. What are you going to do about it? You tell me the name of everybody on that list or I'll fire the entire fifth floor as a starter. What? Why, that's oh, not no. fair. Many people on the fifth floor had nothing to do with this. You can't do that. Every name or out, they all go. Every one of them. Miss Colt. Yes, Mr. Make Allen? out discharge slips for everybody on the fifth floor. Yes, sir. Bring them to me and I'll sign them. Yes, sir. Well, now what do you think? That, Mr. Allison, was the lowest trick I ever heard of. Oh, Tom, Tom, don't argue with him. Joe, hand me that microphone, the one for the public address system. Get away from there. Give it to me, Tom. I'll speak to the fifth floor. I'll speak to the whole Neely department store. Hello, everybody, listen. Give me that microphone. Sit down, you. Listen, everybody. No, stop it. Shut up. Come to the loudspeaker. Let go of me. Let go. You sit there and keep your mouth closed. Tell them, Mary. Tell them. Listen, employees. Come out to Brian's Park. Don't be afraid. Come out now. We've got a lick. Come out to Brian's Park. Stop what you're doing. No, no, don't listen to us. Shut up. Go on, Mary. Leave what you're doing. Everybody together. Out to Brian's Park. And don't be afraid. If we all walk out of West, we've got a lick. That's right. Everybody out to Brian's Park. Hooray! And, and listen, everybody. Picket the home of J.P. Merrick. That's right. Picket. No, no. Wait a minute. Mr. Merrick, sir? Yes, George. The gentlemen are here, sir. Well, my brilliant advisors. As usual, their advice is a little late. Look at that crowd outside the house, George. You know what they're doing? I believe they're picketing you, sir. Yes. I never thought it would end this way. I don't think you've seen the worst, sir. Mm. They've got the dummy with them. You mean with the horns? And the tail, sir. Yeah, well, send in the brain trust, George. Yes, sir. And then go outside in that crowd and ask for a young fellow by the name of Joe O'Brien and a girl named Mary Jones. Bring him back here with you. In here, sir? In here, George. Very good, sir. Uh, will you come in, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening, J.P. Evening, J.P. How are you, J.P.? Bad business, J.P. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. I see you got safely through the picket line. Oh, don't let this business excite you. No, 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 certainly not. This is only temporary. We'll have it under control. And we're going to call the police at once. Oh, no, you're not. Nobody's going to call anybody. I've sent for the ring leaders. They'll be here any minute. You're, you're going to meet them? Certainly. J.P., this is the wrong method. If you do this, you'll be acting against our advice. I know. That's why I'm doing it. <clears throat> Mr. O'Brien and Miss Jones. Oh, come in, Joe. Come in, Mary. Hey, what is this? What are you doing here? Tom, we've been waiting for you outside. How did you arrange it? Well, it wasn't very difficult. Sit down, Mary. I, uh, I want you to meet the gentlemen who are the real managers of the store. We've, uh, we've been having a little talk. Hi. Uh, uh, listen, that, that butler said Mr. Merrick wanted us. Yes, Mary. Well, everything in its turn. Yeah. Shall we begin? Uh, that's right. Let's begin. Suits me. We're ready. Above all things, let's remain calm. You know, Mr. O'Brien, you're not in a very good bargaining position. Maybe not, but the store's closed. Well, we're going to open it. Here, now, to stop that. We're going to remain calm. Yes, that's right. Let's not raise our voices. Mr. O'Brien, what is your main issue? Well, it's not really much of a beef. Just a couple of people like Allison. If they were moved out, I think everybody would be a lot better off. I suppose you would be a much better manager. I think so, yes. Good. Perhaps the gentleman will let you try. What's that? That's the first point you gentlemen will have to give in on. This is fantastic. Sit down. I protest against this ridiculous... Sit down! Mr. O'Brien, there are going to be a few changes made in the store. I'm sure that everything will be to your satisfaction and to the satisfaction of all faithful employees. I'm not going into details, but these gentlemen are really very agreeable when you know how to handle them. Why, well, Tom, I can't believe it. You mean everything's settled? Everything, my dear. Oh, Tom. Tom, you're marvelous. Here, let me kiss you. Uh, oh, madam, have you gone mad? Let him alone. Listen, you. If she wants to kiss Higgins, what business is that of yours? Yes, what business is it of yours? I'll call the police. Yeah. Wait, now listen. Oh, come in the other room, sir. Yeah. You let Higgins alone. Come along, Mr. Mary. Listen. Come on, Higgins. Let, let go, right Mr. Yeah, Mary. Listen to me. Let me alone. This way, Higgins. Come, Mr. Mary. Stop pulling. Wait a minute, Joe. Stop, stop. For heaven's sake, Waldron, let me go. Come on, Higgins. Are you all right, Mr. Higgins? What, what, what are you all talking about? Who's Merrick? Uh, Is everybody crazy around here? Well, evidently you are, madam, if you don't know J.P. Merrick. What? Uh, Mary, listen, it's all very simple. Oh, you, you, Tom, you're really... J I can explain just how it happened. You see... J.P. Merrick? 
Jake? Well, I... Oh. Catch her! Get some water. Call a doctor. Joe! Joe, listen to me. You understand, don't you? It's very simple. You see, Joe, I... Uh, we don't... Uh, Joe! Get some more water. Quick! Mary, do you feel better now? Oh, I, I guess so. I'm still a little shaky. Where's Joe? Well, he went outside to speak to the crowd. Oh, is, is everything still all right? You hear that? That ought to prove it to you. Oh, oh Mr. Merrick. It's, it's... <laughs> Tom to my old friend. Okay, Tom. Come on. They want you outside. They're yelling for you. Yelling for who? Well, uh, I told them Tom Higgins settled the whole thing. I thought it was better that way. They're going to pray down to Bryant Park, and they want you at the head. Yes, but I... I come I, on, come oh, on. Oh, go with them, please, Tom. Well, very well. Let's uh, go. This way, Tom. Yeah. Fellow employees, here he is, our own Tom Higgins. Well, thank you, thank you. Mr. Higgins. Yeah. Mr. Higgins, we're going to let you carry it in the parade. Carry what? Bring it over here, Eddie. What is it? What do I have to carry? Here you are, Mr. Higgins. It's the dummy of J.P. Merrick, and it's all yours. Well, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, couldn't we just remove the tail? For well, this entertaining hour, I'm sure we all join in awarding orchids to our three stars, Frank Morgan, Linda Darnell, and Gordon Oliver. Thank you, Brian. Well, Frank, as J.P. Merrick, I'm glad you finally gave those two delightful employees a break. Well, Brian, I have great sympathy for salespeople. You see, I started out on life's path, bartering bristled blessings for the banishment of women's burdens. Doing what? Selling brushes. <laughs> door to door. Frank, you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, how did you do? Do? I'll have you know, young man, I got two orders from the first house I cased. I mean, I called on. <laughs> <laughs> you said two orders from one house, Frank? Yes. One to get out and the other to stay out. <laughs> <laughs> no, is that right? <laughs> oh, Frank, did you have that mustache when you were selling brushes, huh? Mustache? I was a walking billboard for the product. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Frank, did you have any special way of breaking down a housewife's sales resistance? Yes, of course. My technique was the Morgan method. I approached the subject with a full awareness of the psychological subtleties of female nature and applied the metaphysical corrective. Just what does that mean? I wedged my foot in the door. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I've suddenly realized what the perfect career for you is. <laughs> Selling snake oil at the county fair. <laughs> I can see you now. Yeah, you should have seen me then. <laughs> I mean, in the honorable pursuit of salesmanship, I drank a lot of... I mean, I sold a lot of excellent <laughs> snake oil. <laughs> I'll have you know I made enough money at it finally to buy my own snake. You know, Linda's been something of a salesman for the state of Texas. Yeah, she was the official greeter for her hometown of Dallas during the Pan American Exposition. That's right, Brian. That was just before I came to Hollywood. Yes, well, with those looks, Linda hardly needs to use the Morgan method. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> She's a wonderful ad for her home state with that lovely Texas coloring. Well, if you mean the complexion, Brian, it's half Texas and half Lux toilet soap. I swear by both of them. You better watch out. You'll start a rush for Texas. <laughs> or a rush to the stores for Lux toilet soap. But as a matter of fact, it's because Lux has so many friends that we can raise this curtain every Monday night. And next Monday night, we're going to reward our listeners with another entertaining treat. A brand new mystery thriller from Republic Studios. Grisley's Millions, starring Pat O'Brien, Lynn Barry, and Elizabeth Risden. Here's your chance to help solve one of the screen's most baffling murders and to expose yourself to plenty of excitement and suspense, too. Well, Brian, that sounds like a fascinating evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night and many thanks. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Pat O'Brien, Lynn Barry, and Elizabeth Risden in Grizzly's Millions. For their cooperation in tonight's presentation, we wish to thank RKO Studios, producers of Murder, My Sweet. Frank Morgan appeared through the courtesy of Maxwell House Coffee. Linda Darnell will soon appear in the 20th Century Fox 30th Anniversary production, Hangover Square. Gordon Oliver can currently be seen in the David O. Selznick production, Since You Went Away. Heard in tonight's play were Arthur Q. Bryan, Griff Barnett, Ferdinand Mounier, Howard McNear, 
Verna Felton, Ed Emerson, Eddie Marr, Boyd Davis, Norman Field, Charles Seal, Dora Singleton, Norma Nilsson, and Lois Corbett. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our Lux Radio Theater production of The Devil and Miss Jones has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the beauty care that nine out of ten Hollywood stars use to help keep their complexions beautifully clear and smooth and as flawless as every woman wants her skin to be. Be part of the coast-to-coast audience that gathers each week to enjoy this hour of dramatic entertainment with the finest artists of Broadway and Hollywood. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Grizzly's Millions with Pat O'Brien, Lynn Barry, and Elizabeth Risden. Now let's see. Suspect, suspectant, suspend. Ah, here we are. Suspense. The condition of mental uncertainty, usually accompanied by apprehension or anxiety. Fear of something which is about to occur as... Do not keep me any longer in... Suspense. For our story of suspense tonight, we invite you to enjoy... The Devil in the Summer House... By John Dixon Carr. Somewhere along the Hudson, perhaps not far from Terrytown, there is a modest house in its own grounds. Behind it, in a spacious garden, stands a summer house of evil memory. More than 25 years ago, a man shot himself, or at least died, in that summer house. They found Major Kenyon with a scorched bullet hole in his head and the weapon beside him. But we are in the present now. The latticed summer house has grown heavy with vines. And only the other evening, two men came into that garden at twilight over the shaggy grass as a storm was brewing along the Hudson. Two men, the lawyer from New York. Who's there? And Captain Burke of the Homicide easy, Squad. Easy, my friend, easy. I was just going to ask you the same thing. My name is Parker. I'm an attorney. You're not Captain Burke. Yeah, right? the very same and no other. I thought I recognized you, Mr. Parker. Must be something important to bring you so far from New York at this time of night. I was in Tarrytown anyway. I thought there'd be a housekeeper here. But I don't see any light. You've got business here? Yes, in a way. Have you? I don't know. I'll tell you better after you tell me what brought you to a place that no one has lived in for ten years. Tell me, Captain. Did you ever get an anonymous letter from a dead man? Did you? No, I can't say I did. The letter's anonymous. How do you know the man's dead? Because they're all dead. Every last one of them. Dead and under the ground where they can't be hurt any longer. Look. There's the summer house where Jerry Kenyon used to work. There are the windows of the library and the dining room. Looking for it. Confound this lightning. Makes the windows blaze, don't it? Jerry Kenyon hadn't a care in the world. Yet he shot himself. I'll show you the letter. Now, look, Mr. Parker, I couldn't read anything in this light. But if we can get inside the house Certainly we can get into the house. I was the family attorney. I've got the keys. Why should a dead person send me a letter? Well, 
lights working, eh? But you got a flashlight, I see. Came here prepared for anything, eh? This is the library. There were always candles on the mantel. Uh, yes, there they are. Have you a match, Captain? Oh, yes, I'll light them. Uh, that's better. Same old heavy furniture. Same old thick carpet, same old globe map. Now, uh, Mr. Parker, this letter that you were talking about. Yeah. Read it. Hey, wait a minute. This thing is dated November 2nd, 1918. That's right, and be careful of that paper. You see how old it is? But it was mailed yesterday. From where? I don't remember. I didn't keep the envelope. Read it. Dear Joe. In case you didn't know it, I am Joe. Dear Joe, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died... But we know how he died. It was suicide. Are you sure it was? Whoever wrote this letter doesn't seem to think so. If you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. Press hard at the back of the drawer. Yours very truly. That's not signed. That's right. Now, are you sure you don't know who wrote that letter? This is the first time I've been back in this room, Captain. It was almost a home to me once. There's the chair where Isabel sat on the afternoon it happened. Isabel was Jerry Kenyon's wife, beautiful woman. There's the door that the maid let me in by that afternoon. You know, Captain, it seems to me they're all here tonight. Who? Oh. We stand beneath the sounding rafter, and the walls around us are bare as they echo our peals of laughter. It seems that the dead are there. Yet we stand to our glasses steady. You know it? I was in my school, reader. How does the rest of it go? Yet we stand to our glasses steady. And drink to our comrades' eyes. Here's a glass to the dead already. Hurrah for the next that dies. Excuse me, Captain. I don't know what's come over me talking that way. I was very fond of these people. Are you going to look in the desk drawer? This is a lot of nonsense. Then why are you here, Mr. Parker? Jerry Kenyon was always a happy man. At least that's what I always thought. Big, boisterous fellow. Yeah. He had a good position with Vitatone. You know, the phonograph company. Yeah, sure I know. But he'd just been made a major in the army. 1917. There was a war on then, too, if you remember. I remember. To make the world safe for democracy. Old days. Old heartaches. Old memories. I remember that blazing hot day in August when all the windows were up. I remember this room and Isabel, that was Jerry's wife, sitting in that chair, knitting. I remember... Yes, Kitty. What is it? There's a man to see you, Miss Kenyon. He says his name's Parker. Yes, I'm expecting him. Show him in, please. All right, ma'am. So I take your knitting in your knitting bag? Why should you take my knitting? I don't know, Miss Kenyon. I just wondered. You can come in now. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hello, Isabel. You sent for me? Joe, I must apologize for Kitty. Servants are getting to be a problem nowadays. She looks pretty enough to get along. Oh, Kitty's got large ideas. She wants to go on the stage, if you please, and do imitations, like Miss Draper. She only knew how hard it was acting all your life. Isabel, you've been crying. I have not. At least... Is that why you sent for me? I've missed you. You haven't been here in over a week, Joe. I had an idea Jerry was getting a little tired of having me around this house. Oh, no, Joe. Why, Jerry... Yes, what about Jerry? I wish I knew, Joe. That's why I wanted you here. Where is he, by the way? I want to say goodbye to him before he leaves. 
He's probably out in the summer house where he works with all those papers. He's got a lot of work to catch up with. He's going overseas tomorrow. Yes, I know. He's out there. He's been out there all day. His last day here. and I've been alone. That sounded like a shot. <laughs> yes, it was a shot, Joe. The house dear. doesn't seem to worry you. <laughs> it's only Paul. Jerry's brother, Paul. Oh, thought you'd gotten him off your hands for good. Jerry asked him out. He got here two nights ago. That doesn't make it any easier for you, does it? No, I don't mind. Jerry's fixed him up with a pistol range in the cellar. Paul's a terribly bad shot. Not like the rest of us. You don't seem to like it, Joe. Uh, shall I have Kitty go down and tell him No, 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 it's terrible. As long as he keeps away. Poor Joe. But, uh, about Jerry, who is it this time? Joe, Jerry's been home five days on leave from camp. Well, uh, never mind what camp. But he spent four evenings of those five with... With that Fisk woman. Diane Fisk? The redhead with all the money? Oh, she got money? Well... She must have some attraction, then. Please understand me, Joe. It's not that I'm jealous any longer. It's just that... No, no, that of course not. Jerry goes his way, and I go mine. I may not be without admirers myself, if it comes to that. You've no idea how true that is, Isabel. No, uh, I was thinking about Jerry... He may not always be lucky. He may meet some girl who's not as broad-minded as I am. And then when he gives her the go-by... <laughs> Paul must be getting really furious down in that cell. He's not hitting anything. He must be using a lot of ammunition. Now, your trouble, Joe, is that you're too much of a gentleman. And if you really want to see Jerry, uh, there he is now. Where? Uh, just standing in the door of the summer house. Uh, look out the window. And finally, bright out there. Doesn't he look noble in his new uniform? Sam Brown belt and revolver and everything. Well, look how he turns around and waves his cap at us. Like a real soldier. Real soldiers don't exactly wave their caps, do they? He does. Uh, Jerry! Jerry! Hello there! Jerry, Joe Parker's here. Who? Joe Parker. He wants to see you. into the summer house again. Not a care in the world, Harry. Now, listen, Isabel, you've got to slow down. You'll be crying again in a minute. Come on over here and sit down. Uh, light hurts my eyes, that's all. Well, then we'll just pull these blinds. We'll still be able to see it. There, how's that? It's better, thanks. Now, can Jim. I get you anything? Oh, no, you heard the great white chief's orders. I'm to get you something. Uh, what do you have, your highball? Don't bother with that. Oh, it's no bother. Everything's out in the dining room here. The ice man didn't deliver today of all days, so I'm afraid I can't give you any ice. I uh, read in the paper yesterday that we're likely to have automatic ice boxes any day now. Uh, you know, uh, things that freeze ice by electricity or something. Uh, do you believe that, Joe? I doubt it. Listen, Isabel. Uh, here you are. It's not cold at all. It's the best I could do. Thanks, Emma. What I wanted to say was, couldn't you get that brother of yours to give up practicing now? Hasn't he done his good deed for the day? <laughs> Yes, maybe he has. Uh, I'll ring for Kitty. You don't have to call me, Miss Canyon. I'm here. Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? It's only to tell you there's another visitor. This time it's a woman. Lady Kitty. Call her a lady, please. Well, maybe. She says her name's Diane Fisk. Diane Fisk? That's Jerry. Uh, Kitty, tell the lady I'm not in. Lady. <laughs> She's a fine lady. I don't want to intrude, my dear. I don't want to intrude. <clears throat> Anyway, it's too late, Miss Kenyon. She's coming down the hall now. My dear Mrs. Kenyon. <laughs> How do you do, Diane? This is a friend of ours, Miss Fisk, uh, Mr. Parker. How do you do? Now, I don't want to intrude, really. I don't. I wouldn't have intruded for worlds, especially on a day like this. Isn't it awful? But your husband simply insisted, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, he simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't. Uh, do you know what he's brought from his office as a surprise? No. A phonograph recording machine. He's going to let us use it. So that we can all hear ourselves talk twice. How nice. <laughs> Kevin's name, can't somebody stop that firing? Don't fly off the handle. Take it easy now. Uh, Kitty. Yes, ma'am. Would you please go down the cellar and tell Mr. Kenyon's brother he's driving us all crazy. Tell him to stop. Yes, ma'am. My, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, I do hope I haven't offended you in any way. I, 
I know I'm a silly little chatterbox. They say people who have red hair often are. <laughs> of course, at your age, you, you must find the heat very dry. Uh, don't you think we'd all better sit down? I I was very much interested in what Miss Fisk said about our phonograph recording machine. Mrs. Kenyon was just talking about a machine to make ice. <laughs> yes, yes. Isn't science wonderful? But I do think it was me to Major Kenyon to invite me out here and then go and fall asleep in the summer house. Did you say fall asleep? Yes, of course. How did you know? Well, I came up the back way and I saw him in the summer house with his head forward on the table. Taking a nice little snooze. That's very queer. Of course, you couldn't see much except in the bright light of the door, but I think I saw him there. I didn't disturb him, naturally. But I think I'd better disturb him. Oh, now, please don't trouble on my account. The fact is, my dear, I don't altogether trust myself in this room. A woman of my age has to conserve his strength, you know. So if you'll just excuse me... I'm... Well, of course, if you... Oh, dear, I just can't think what I'm always saying because I, I have the best intentions in the world, Mr. Barker. But... Parker. Uh... Oh, yes, Parker, but I do somehow manage to offend people being so dependent and everything. <laughs> Except the men, of course. I couldn't offend you, Mr. Barker, a Parker. <laughs> now, could I? <laughs> Madam, I'm not sure. Well, of course, the person I really came to see was Paul, Mr. Kenyon's brother. He's a little young, of course, but he's joining up next month, and I think we should all do our bit, don't you? <laughs> he has such a pleasant personality. I think he likes me. Why, if he walked in at that door this minute... Now, how am I ever going to get any place? Someone's always interrupting my revolver practice just when I'm getting to the point where I... Oh. Why, Paul... Good Lord, are you here again? You're a very untidy object, Paul. Well, that's pretty untidy in the cellar. And dirty. I've got cockroaches on me, so keep away. Did you have a good day shooting? Swell. One of the best. Hit the target? On the only shot that mattered, I hit the target dead center. That sounded like Isabel. I think it was Isabel. Why have you got those blinds down? Get them up. What is it? What's wrong with you? What are you looking at through that window? Twenty-five years ago, Captain Burke, we found Jerry Kenyon lying across the table in the summer house. He'd shot himself through the head with his own revolver in the holster. It was lying on the floor beside him. Shut up, sir, Burke. I see. When Isabel found him, he'd been dead about half an hour. The doctors proved that, did they? Yes, that shot had been fired against his head. The front of his uniform cap was powder-burned where the bullet entered. There's no doubt about that. None at all. We never noticed the real shot because... Because that young lad was shooting off guns like a maniac in the cellar. Precisely. Now they're all dead. By accident, illness, they're all gone. Isabel Kenyon died less than a year afterwards. I think she died just because she was so fond of Jerry. I suppose you've guessed my little secret. Oh, I think I can sort of read between the lines. You were in love with Isabel Kenyon, weren't you? Yes. Well, these things happen. I never let her see it, you understand? Women know, pretty generally. So? They're gone. The youngest of them. And I'm left alone... With old tunes, old ghosts, wondering why the fellow ever killed himself. Why? Why? And this morning, out of a clear sky, I get a letter saying, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. But I tell you, we know how he died. Well, aren't you going to do it? Naturally. I've got a key somewhere here that fits the drawer. Now, listen, Mr. Parker. In my father's country, in Ireland, they got a saying that when a man's going to commit suicide... I thought of doing that too once. Then the devil comes in and takes him by the hand and talks to him. They say you can see the devil as plain as I see you just before you pull the trigger. The devil must have been in the summer house that afternoon then. Oh, no, he wasn't. 
What do you mean? Major Kenyon didn't kill himself. He was murdered. My dear Captain Burke, the police covered all that at the time. Everybody had an alibi. They did, did they? Well, think of what I've told you. Isabel and I were together all the time. Paul, her brother, was shooting off guns in the cellar. Yeah. Diane Fisk. Yeah, what about her? Her chauffeur who drove her there swore he saw her walk straight up to the place. She passed the summer house but didn't stop there. Well, that checks. Even Kitty the maid could prove she'd never stirred out of the house until just a minute or so before Isabel went herself. Oh, and why did the maid have to leave the house at all? She was taking Jerry the black coffee he drank every afternoon. He'd already been dead half an hour then. And that, my dear Captain, disposes of everybody. Well, now listen, Mr. Parker. You're a good guy, and I'm not going to hold out on you any longer. You see, I say Major Kenyon was murdered because I know he was murdered. By an outsider? By one of the people in the house. That's impossible. Is it? Well, why don't you open that desk drawer and see? What time is it? Uh, it's a quarter to eight. Quarter to eight? And I haven't got much time. For what? Holy St. Patrick, will you open that drawer? If it's waited 25 years, my friend, it can wait a minute more. I've got the key somewhere in this bunch of keys. Everything the same. Paul never altered what he inherited. Same old desk, same old phonograph. Same old... I think this is the key. Yeah. It opens... There's nothing here except one or two old newspapers. Everything very dirty. The letter says to press hard at the back. Now, have you tried that? It doesn't seem to. Yes, my George, it does work. Well? There seems to be a movable back on a hinge. Well, what's inside? Uh, uh some sort of flat brown paper parcel sealed with wax. And about as dirty as it can get. Open it, man. Open it. I'm going to. It's a phonograph, I thought. There's a plain white label. Something on it written in pencil. I don't see too well nowadays without my glasses. Uh, here, give it to me. I'll read it to Just you. Go on. A record of how I killed Jerry Kenyon. Say, don't you get it, Mr. Parker? This is the real goods. The murderer's going to tell us his own story 25 years later. Be careful. Whatever you do, don't drop it. You seem to be interested enough now. I don't say I'm not interested. I say I can't believe it. You know, when you were talking about the dead coming back and that kind of thing, you sure started giving me goose pimples. But that's just what it is, a dead person. Now, there's the phonograph. Put that record on. Let's hear what the ghost says. Any of them could have made the record, of course. The apparatus was all here. Don't just stand there by the phonograph. Won't it work? Yes, it works. Is it wound up? Yes, it's wound up. Here goes. Now, look, Mr. Parker. Whose voice do you think it's going to be? I don't know. Now, I want to warn you. The voice you're going to hear from there... Please, be quiet. Listen. I've started it up. Well? Speak up. Who killed Jerry Kenyon? I killed him, Joe, dear. Isabel. I'm sorry about it, Joe. But I had to have you for an alibi. And you were so terribly easy to fool. It's only a phonograph record, man. Don't look at it as if it was alive. You said you and I were always together, Joe. But that wasn't quite true. I left you to go into the dining room and mix a highball, remember? Yes. And I was carrying my big knitting bag. Remember that, too? And there was something else in it besides knitting. I'm an awfully good revolver shot, Joe. I told you we were all good except Paul. And the back windows of the dining room faced the same way as the back windows of the library. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Jerry very much. was in the summer house. I made a sign to him from the window, and he came to the door there. In bright sunlight, fifty feet away. Sure, again, Isabel. Sure Joe. Again. Don't you know what August heat is in a wooden summer house? Didn't you, didn't anybody see that no man would be wearing a cap inside on a day like that? Jerry had taken his cap off before he went into the summer house. We saw him do it. 
He was bareheaded when he came to the door. So I lifted the revolver and shot him through the head. Then I dropped the gun back in my knitting bag and went back into the library with your drink. Isabel, don't talk back to the thing, man. You'll drive me screwy. There was in my knitting bag, too. I had to use it. It was a duplicate of Jerry's army camp with a powder-burned hole already fired through it in the place I wanted. Very clever of you, Isabel. So I've been the goat for 25 years. I waited for some time and then slipped out to find the body. I fitted the new cap over Jerry's head in place where it ought to go. I put the old cap in my knitting bag. I took his revolver out of the holster and kept it. The gun that I used, I dropped on the floor beside him. So I proved it was suicide. You see? You proved it to me. Joe. Joe, listen, I, I'm very sick. They tell me I'm going to die. You are dead. Joe, I'm afraid. I'm going out in the dark, and I I don't know what's there. Don't go away, Isabel. Come Joe. Out. Just for a minute. Okay, I've had just about enough of this. Joe, I want you to tell everybody about it. I want you to tell them how a poor, crazy woman couldn't stand that man any longer, and how... There. It's cut off, and it's going to stay cut off. Thank you. I've heard about enough, too. But you can't arrest her now, my friend. You can't arrest her now. After hearing that, I'm not going to arrest anybody. Tell me, Captain. Did you know what was on the record? No. That's why I had to hear it. I knew about it, but I wasn't sure what it had to say. But so help me, I never guessed how hard it would hit you. Man, don't you get it even yet? Yes, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. You don't see anything. That was how the fake suicide was managed, yes. That's just how it was all done, bar one or two little things. Only... Only what? Only it wasn't Isabel Kenyon who committed the murder. Did I hear you correctly? You did? This is another one of your little jokes, I imagine. Can't you let me alone? Have you some kind of personal spite against me? What did I ever do? You're going to hear the real truth now if I have to hold you down in that chair. I know Mrs. Kenyon didn't kill her husband because I've just come from talking to the real murderer up the river. But they're all dead. Oh, no, they're not. And I haven't got much time either. That clock's just going to strike eight. What's the time got to do with it? Good deal, if you'll follow me. Mrs. Kenyon died less than a year after her husband, didn't she? Yes. But it wasn't Mrs. Kenyon's voice you just heard in that record. What? I'm telling you. The real murderer hated her. Hated her like poison and wanted her blame for the crime. When Mrs. Kenyon died, the real murderer wrote a letter. Well? But she never mailed that letter. She made a lying record of Isabel Kenyon's voice as evidence. Now you figure it out for yourself. Who was pretty enough to take Major Kenyon's eye and strike back like fury when she got thrown over? Who wanted to go on the stage and do impersonations? Kitty, the maid. Ah, you're talking sense. She shot Jerry from the dining room window. When she couldn't borrow Mrs. Kenyon's knitting bag, she went out to the summer house with a gun and the fake cap wrapped a napkin on a coffee tray. She did go out, I remember. Actually, she got there before Mrs. Kenyon did. But the summer house was dark inside and Mrs. Kenyon never noticed her. The next day, Kitty wrote that letter, but she couldn't bring herself to send it. So she kept that letter till the day before yesterday. Then one of the boys at Sing Sing... Wait a minute. ...thinking he was doing her a kind action, put a stamp on it and mailed it. Did you say Sing Sing? Yes. They're electrocuting her tonight for the murder of an Italian down at Collier's Hook. I found out about the record, all right. But the one thing I wasn't sure of was that, that she had done the job alone. Now, frankly, the way you acted, I thought that you might have been in on it, too. Well, that's why I had to hear it through. And it was anything but a joke. And now, here it goes to blazes forever. Eight o'clock. Now, she's dead. So ends The Devil in the Summer House. 
tonight's story of... Suspense. The part of Mr. Parker was played by Martin Gable. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. A story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime. The hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in suspense. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. At 9.30... From San Francisco, station KPO presents Tonight at 9.30, the fourth in a new series of programs designed to bring into the spotlight the best in San Francisco radio talent, music, comedy, drama, a different show each Saturday presented from San Francisco on Tonight at 9.30. Tonight at 9.30, we present an original radio drama, a story of suspense and fear, of crime and remorse, titled, The Devil is a Woman, written and directed by KPO producer George Snell. Our drama features in the stellar roles two of San Francisco's outstanding radio personalities, KPO announcer John Grover and the versatile young actress Yvonne Patey, heard on many local programs. Later, we shall talk to them about their work. But now, the light's dim. The curtain rises, and the spotlight's on. The devil is a woman. I am William Burden. I've discovered that solitude is conducive to philosophy. Too bad some people have to go to prison to find solitude and philosophy. Like me. Yes, in prison a man has time to think. Plenty of time. And I've thought a good deal. What about? Oh, I've come to the conclusion that woman... Woman is the devil. But as I see it, what I have done is a long chain of inevitable deeds. One leading to another. It keeps going over in my mind, even now, when it's all over. It keeps turning in my head like wheels. I suppose I'm weak. How could I have done it? Sometimes I still can't believe that I really killed a man. Yes, it all began as twilight entered the bookshop. My shop, with its dusty books and its quiet. The bookshop of William Burden. Is anyone here who can wait on me? Uh, Good evening. Oh, I was afraid nobody was in. I'm looking for something to read. Well, uh, what do you have in mind? Oh, I don't know. Anything, a novel, something not too heavy. Uh, You want a book from the lending library? Oh, yes, I don't want to buy a book. That's just the trouble. People never want to buy a book. Uh, Just step over this way, please. Oh, here's one I've heard about. I'll take that. All right, if you'll just give me your name and address for my records. Yes, it's uh, Irene Delamore, 36 Riverdale Apartments. All right, Miss Delamore, thank you, and come again. Come again? Yes, she returned many times. And as time went on, I took to noticing her, the quick, intelligent way she responded to any suggestion about books, her interest in many subjects. And, of course, her great physical charm. I'd been trying to study. I planned to write a book. But it became impossible. I thought of her. It was wrong, but I thought of her. 
Then one day she called me on the telephone. Hello, Will? Yes. Uh, who is this? Irene. Oh. I'm so sorry to trouble you. I, uh, I haven't been feeling well. Oh, I'm sorry. I have two or three books that are terribly overdue, and I hate to keep them. Well, that's all right. You don't have to worry about a little thing like that. I know, but I... Well, it's against my principles. Would it be uh, too much to ask? Uh, could you drop over for them? Why... After all, it would be nice to see you. Well, all right. Yes, I'll come. So you did come. Yeah. Come and sit down. I'd like to talk to you. You're not in a hurry. No. Sit down. Well, here we are together. Yeah. Well, for a man who reads and writes, you don't say much. Yes, no, yes. <laughs> well, I'll admit I'm not exactly scintillating. You have beautiful hands. No, they serve their purpose. They're so well cared for. You, you don't use them much. What do you do? Pass the time as painlessly as possible. Why? Do I look like a woman with a past? Frankly, yes. You're certainly not usual. What do you mean by that? Well, for one thing, you come straight to the point. I'm clairvoyant, too. I see you're a man who wants, oh, maybe the moon. I don't know about that. Yes, you do. I can read you so easily. I wish I could say the same about you. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you do? What is there to tell? I live here. I'm single, though I have been married. Well, what else do you want to know? Oh, uh, just a minute. I better answer it. Hello? No, not at all. Oh, just sitting here reading. Yes, I was. Well, you needn't... Well, what about you? You hadn't better. I don't know what you're talking about. No, really, that isn't so. What about you? All right, I don't care what you think. Well, uh, who was that? Oh, nobody. It, uh, it was nothing at all. What am I thinking of? I haven't offered you a drink. Well, it's been very pleasant here with you, but I I'd better be going. Uh, have you the books? Oh, yes, the uh, books. See, where did I put them? I'll get them for you, but uh, why leave so soon? It's early. You'll make me think you didn't like it here. Not at all. On the contrary, I... Well, well, isn't this cozy? Pete! Who's your boyfriend? You... What kind of a game is this? Let go of my arm. Who do you think you are? You know. And if you don't, I'm going to teach you fast. <laughs> why, you... You... Keep your hands off her. So I gotta keep my hands off her, huh? The little man tells me I gotta. That's a laugh. I'd advise you to leave her alone. He advised me to leave her alone. Who is this fellow, Irene? Ask her, little man. Now I'm gonna take you apart. What? Oh. Uh. Oh. You've killed him. Huh? You killed him. Well, what happened? You killed him. You smashed his head with the ash stand. What? Why did you do it? Well, he attacked me. Uh, who is he? My husband. You did it. You did it on purpose. Don't be a fool. He, he was trying to kill me. Oh, we got to get him to a doctor. No. Well, why not? He may not be dead. You don't know who he is, who I am, or anything. Why did you do it? Yeah. He's dead. No heartbeat. You and I are in serious trouble. We got to think fast. Well, why did I... Come here tonight? Yes, why? I believe you invited me. And you wouldn't want anybody to know you were here, would you? No, I wouldn't. Now tell me about him. Who is he? I... I hated him. Oh, it's so awful. Stop it. Now control yourself. This is no time for hysterics. You've got to tell me about him now. I swore to get even. We couldn't get along. He began seeing other women. I thought I could make him suffer the way he made me. But who is he? Don't you know? What a dope you are. Pete Snarr, the well-known gunman. Snarr? Sure. And I'm his wife. Now do you get it? Now why don't you call the cops? No. Can't do that. We've got to get rid of him. What time is it? We've got to get him out of here. You're up to your neck in this too, remember? It means prison for both of us. Manslaughter. What are you going to do? I'm going to get him out of here. I'm going to get rid of him now. 
His car's probably outside. He usually drives alone. We'll put him in it, and I'll drive somewhere and leave him. Hurry now. Take him away. What if somebody comes? Why, is somebody coming? No, but you can't tell. Hurry. I'll be seen. I can't go lugging a body around. It's only ten o'clock. How will I get him downstairs? I don't know. Three flights. I'll be sure to run into someone. Why didn't I think of that? I can't think straight. Who's that? We know you're in there. Open up. Sure. Don't make a sound. Irene, what are you doing in there? Yeah, what are you doing? Well, no, I guess you didn't know. We saw that, didn't we? Well, Irene, open up now. We know you're there. Ah, right, come on. She ain't there. Might as well go. Yeah, I'm going to just find out. Quick, turn out the lights. Who was that? I don't know. I can't imagine. Some party hound. Oh, what's this? Look at the rug. <gasps> blood. You'll have to scrub it. You'll have to clean this whole place. Pick up every piece of hair, even. You got any gloves? I gotta have gloves. No, I don't know. Get him out of here. I'm waiting. Wait till it gets late. Late. I smashed Snar with the ash stand. I can't understand how I did it. He was choking me. But I couldn't be involved in this in any way. What had become of my life? I summoned strength from a reserve I didn't know I had. Snar had driven up in his car. About one o'clock, Irene and I carried the body down. I put it in the back of his car and instructed Irene to keep away from me. Under no circumstances was she to get in touch with me. I drove away with the body. I was with Irene. Had she loved her husband, that hideous thing, black... Oh, I couldn't trust her, could I? I was in her hands. But she was at my mercy, too. An accomplice. I could deny that I'd done it. As I drove, I felt easier. I would outwit them. I'd cover my tracks. I'd overlook nothing. The most dangerous part was behind me. For a few blocks, I drove straight along deserted streets, reveling in the thought that I was safely out of the apartment. A red stoplight loomed ahead. I jammed on the brakes. Uh, it seemed forever until the light turned green. But at last it did. I let the clutch out... The motor died. Oh, what if I couldn't start it? What if it wouldn't start? I tried the starter again. Nothing happened. I broke into a cold sweat. I tromped on the starter. And then I saw strolling toward me, swinging his club, a policeman. Well, what's the trouble, buddy? Can't get her started? Uh, no. Well, probably flooded your carburetor. Well, you might as well get out. And roll her over the curb and let her sit till she drains. I, yeah, probably start now. I'll try it. No, no, she's flooded. You can't sit here in the street, cramp your wheels, we'll push her over the curb. Well, I, I can't get out. Uh, huh? I... I can't do any heavy pushing. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Well, I can probably give you a show. It was a big car. There, she's coming. Boy, she's heavy enough. You'd think the back seat was full. (laughs) Ain't got something hidden in there, have you? Uh, quite cold tonight, isn't it? Cold? I think this is one of the hottest nights I've ever seen for this time of year. Say, that's a swell job, this boat. These big cars really roll, don't they? Don't see many models like this one. Only two or three in town. I think I'll try again. You got a green light, buddy. Watch it now. I was trembling so I could hardly hold the wheel. Where should I go? I remembered Pinewood Road up in the hills. Swung the car into Hillcrest Boulevard and began to climb. 
As I looked down into the canyon, my scalp crawled. One swerve, and I could imagine how the car would catapult end over end, mangling its quick and its dead in a heap at the bottom. Ah, but what if it rolled? Rolled without me. That was it. I slowed down, looking for a likely place. Soon in the path of the headlights, an observation point loomed, a place where sightseers stopped to look down the valley. Drove the car to the edge of that precipice and got out. I know what I'll do. I'll get it done. Then I won't be afraid anymore. Got no time to lose. What's that? Oh, thought it was a car coming. Gotta hurry. I'll look and see if the car will hit anything as it goes down. No. No, there's nothing but a shed or two. Now. Now the body. Oh, it's getting stiff. I'll put my hand under the arms like this and <laughs> pry the body out. Oh, the feet are tangled. Oh, <laughs> this thing's horrible. Horrible and unwieldy. <laughs> manage it. Can I do it? Can't let me help think. Here, I'll shove. Shove it in the front seat like this, under the wheel. The arms, they won't go in. Get in there. <laughs> oh. Get in. Get in there. There. That's it. In now. Now take the brake off. There it goes. There. It's moving. It's going. It's got a shove. There. There it goes. In the days that followed, I was haunted by what I had done. What had I done? I killed a man. Had I left a clue? Had Irene kept faith with me? I lived through every moment of that horrible evening a thousand times. Feverishly, I read the newspapers. They reported that a car had been found smashed up in the canyon. The driver had been killed in the accident. I breathed with relief. But only momentarily. Fear came back. What about Irene? I never wanted to see her again. I hoped she'd disappear forever. Then, then I remembered the library card. I'd destroy it. Where was it? I searched frantically. I'd lost it. I must have dropped it in her apartment. I turned the shop upside down. The card was not to be found. It was... Oh, I can't remember. Two days, I think, after the thing happened that she appeared in the shop. Well, you don't seem very glad to see me. What are you doing here? Don't talk so loud. Didn't I tell you not to come? I must say you're not very polite. Right. Come in. Come in here. It, it's just as well you... You came after all. I, I must have dropped a card with your name on it at your place. Did you find it? Do you mind if I smoke? Have a cigarette? Did you find the card? Take it easy. Guess who came to see me last night? Ah, oh, this is no time for guessing games. All right. With Sonny Prandle. But you wouldn't know him. Go on. I don't like snoopers, do you? What do you mean? Oh, people who go poking their noses into other people's business. Irene, for heaven's sake, take this seriously. Talk straight. I can do that, too. Only you may not like it. I don't like any of this. I didn't ask for any of it. All right, big boy. Sonny Prandle broke in on me and found your precious card. That's not all. He found a pencil with WB on it. Only I don't suppose it was yours. Who? Who is Prandle? A guy you wouldn't appreciate. One of Pete Snar's pals. Did you give him the things? Give him? Huh, sure, he coaxed me out of them. Oh, you've got to get them back. Does he know anything? No, not yet. I've got to have them, Irene. Well, I thought you ought to know. Forewarned is forearmed, they say. So long, big boy. After she left, I was terrified. What had caused this change in her? I locked up the shop and walked. I walked miles. Should I pack and leave town? I was tempted to do that. But wouldn't it be better to confess and take my punishment? Time off for good behavior. There might be a few years left in which 
I could have peace of mind again. When the evening edition was on the street, I, I rushed to buy a copy. There it was. Police believe canyon accident may be murder. My eyes burned through the paper. Body and car identified as Pete Snar. Notorious underworld character. Police grilling suspects, including a woman known to be associated with Snar. Goes by the name of Irene Smith or Delamore. I had to get away. I walked in a daze through crowded streets back to the shop. Should I run? Should I? I couldn't tell. I couldn't think. Yet I had to appear natural to anyone who might be watching me. And perhaps, perhaps Irene would be stronger than I had thought. She would realize it was her neck as well as mine. I might win through yet. First, I had to find out what happened to Irene. I went to the phone and dialed her number. I waited. Then the operator said the phone had been disconnected. <laughs> Strange thought crossed my mind. Prison might be good for me. I was cold, clammy with exhaustion. I was so tired when I returned to the shop I could hardly stand. I hardly knew what I was doing. My safe was a small one. Stood behind the counter. I'd take the bond and the cash, get away. Trembling fingers, I bent over and twirled the dial on the safe and drew the door open. I was reaching for the money box when a voice said, All right, Mr. Burden, stand up. My name is Vincent. Do you know this woman? Irene. Oh, Will. Hmm. Looks like you know each other, all right. This name is taking a murder rap. There seems to have been some connection between you two. No, I tell you there isn't. You promised if I confessed you'd make it easier for me. Well, I'm a man of my word. Then why do you want to bring me here for? Just want to clear up a little matter. I'm curious about that library card and the pencil. Uh, a pencil? Yes, with the initials WB on it. But our friend Miss Delamore here can't explain how she got the pencil or the card, which I think came from your files. I'm all confused. It doesn't mean anything, though. This woman has confessed to the murder. Irene, you you didn't do it. What's that? Irene, I, I won't let you do this. I'll tell you. Yes, I'll tell you. I murdered Pete Snar. Phew. Well, he said it. You see, Cowper, I told you he was the kind of screwball who wouldn't let a woman down. You're as hard-boiled as they come, sister. All right, let's go, Burton. You have an appointment with the law. And that's the story, or almost all of the story. Later on, when I could think straight again, I found out what had happened. Vincent said, Burton, it's always been my principle to go the shortest way to my objective. After we traced Miss Delamore and subjected her to grilling, she agreed to turn state's evidence. Yes, she pinned the murder on you. But it occurred to me we could save ourselves a great deal of trouble if we could get a confession from you. By having Irene pretend she'd committed the murder and taking advantage of your strong moral sense, we went the shortest way to our objective. She, Irene, hadn't taken the guilt on herself? She was lying all the time? <laughs> yes. But it was only a matter of time until we'd have had sufficient evidence to arrest you. We'd had our eyes on you ever since the pencil and card turned up in her apartment. There were probably fingerprints on the car. And through Irene, we had a source of information by which we could check every detail. But it's all much simpler if we have a confession. Yes. There's just one question I want to ask. Mm -hmm. What makes you think I have a strong moral sense? <laughs> Well, sir, I'll tell you. Because Irene was technically as guilty as you are. But you wouldn't let a woman take the rap. A 
And now the lights are on again, and we have just a few moments in which to talk with our stars this evening, Yvonne Patey and John Grover. How do you like playing such roles as the one you took tonight, Yvonne? Very much, Hal. The more dramatic, the better. <laughs> well, I imagine many of our listeners will be surprised to know that you play a very different role every afternoon on KPO. You mean Barbara Tate? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I hope those who tune me in at 4.30 Monday through Fridays will think of me as Barbara Tate rather than of Irene. Well, I'm sure they'll get a truer picture of you that way, Yvonne. And now, John Grover, uh, how did you like your part as William Burden, the conscience-stricken bookseller? Well, I felt sorry for the man, Hal, but it was a nice, fat part. You're right there. And for the record, we want to tell everybody that you do the smooth announcing job on the Standard Hour, the Standard School, and, uh, let's see, aren't you the one with the peculiar family, Uncle Bagsaddle, Wilberforce, Hysteria, and all the rest? Sure am, Hal. You've been uh, <laughs> listening to Barbara Tate, too, I ah, see. well, who doesn't? Well, John, you and Yvonne have really proved your versatility again tonight at 9.30. And thanks for a fine performance. Tonight at 9.30 has featured an original radio drama, The Devil is a Woman, written and produced by George Snell, with Yvonne Patey and John Grover in the starring roles. Included in tonight's cast were Lou Tobin, Dick Ellers, and Bert Horton. Next Saturday night, we will present a special dramatic program celebrating the 99th anniversary of the birth of Thomas A. Edison. A feature will be a demonstration of Edison's earliest phonograph record. Be sure to listen. Friends, the war years have taught us that human life is expendable with tragic ease. With the return of peace, we are apt to think that no longer will life be wasted so cheaply. Yet the fact is, more lives are lost through accidents on our streets and our highways than are or have been lost in war. A little care a little forethought can reduce this appalling toll of life. When you drive your car, drive carefully. Observe traffic regulations. Make sure that the safety factors of your car have been checked. Then, drive safely. We can defeat the specter that haunts our highways if we will join with determination in an all-out effort to drive safely. Tonight at 9.30, a weekly Saturday night feature on KPO came to you from the NBC studios in San Francisco. Al Wolf speaking. <laughs> this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Just step a little closer, if you will, my friend. You might be the start of a mighty insurgent front. You mean me? You and none other. 
slumming tonight, friend? Oh, I just happen to like carnival. The gentleman says he likes carnival. Eh? And now let us all step up a little closer here while we talk about the greatest attraction on the mighty Midway. A test of strength, courage, and endurance attracting attention all over the civilized world and further. Texas. <laughs> It's a joke, friend. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Indeed. Well, I am talking about that little lady inside the tent here that all your friends have told you positively not to miss. The courageous girl who lies buried alive 20 feet below the surface of the earth. Are you going in, friend, or am I wasting my time? I'm still on the fence. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Huh? Well, you have heard her name, you have read about her in the papers, and now you are going to see... Mona, the buried alive girl who has lain in her grave on these premises for 222 hours, 36 minutes, and 21 seconds. And is now attempting to break the world record of 244 hours. Ooh, how strenuous. Inside the tent, you will see her, talk to her, ask her any questions that happen to be on your mind. Tell me more. My friend, I don't request that you buy a ticket for this great attraction. I just ask that you put this question to yourself. Yes? Would I have the courage... To change places with Mona, the buried alive girl? No. I thank you for your kind attention, and the box office is now open. Oh. Uh, one, please. One, he says. Oh, the... hmm. Some days it don't pay to get buried alive. Hey, uh, Sandy entrance is right in front of you. My change? You cho- oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the change. That's right. It's a <laughs> mere oversight, sir, I assure you. <laughs> hey, you are right straight ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. To communicate with Mona, talk down too. Well, all right, I talk. Mona. Frankie, you gotta get me out of here. I'm going crazy down here. I'm scared. Mona, this is. I've been thinking, Frankie. I've been thinking all day what Angie said just before she. I don't want to end up like Angie, Frank. I don't. And I will if you don't get me out of here. I know I will. I don't want to die, Frankie. Get me up. Mona, this isn't Frankie. This is Simon Templer. Can I help you? Oh, you're not. You're not Frankie? No, but I'll help you if you'll tell me what you're afraid of. Mona? I am in very good health and am enjoying no physical discomfort whatsoever. I am looking forward eagerly toward breaking the world's record for being buried alive. 244 hours. Pictures of me are available at the box office at nominal cost. Mona, what are you afraid of? I am in very good health and am enjoying no physical discomfort whatsoever. I am looking forward eagerly to... I know, I know, I heard. Hi. What are you doing here? Who are you? I'm Simon Templer, a customer. Who are you? Customer? Oh, I, excuse me. I, I thought... Uh, excuse me. Oh, say, aren't you the strong man? I saw your act a few minutes ago. Segundo, huh? That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, pretty good. Uh, Tell me, Segundo, what about Mona? Who was Angie? Angie? Excuse me, I gotta go. Excuse hey, me. hey, wait a minute. Excuse me. I think you got two for the price of one, eh, friend? Mona and the strong man Segundo. I caught his act before. Quite a large hunk of muscle. I wouldn't like him to step down on my foot. Yeah, the guy is built like a Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> Only trouble is uh, his motor don't run so good. Oh, a few <laughs> chips light in the head. Huh? A whole stack. <laughs> well, did you enjoy your chat with Mona? Tell me... Who was Angie? Angie, oh, yeah, that Angie, that's a real sweetheart. That was Mona's sister. Angie used to do the buried alive act before she died. Oh, a real down. Was it an accident? Accident? No, no, it was a weak heart. That Angie, oh, she was all heart. Oh, we miss her. How'd you know about her? Tell me about Mona. Why? I might like to help her, that's all. Hey, look, my friend, nobody in this county needs no help from you. We take care of each other. We always have and we always will. Nobody on the outside cares nothing about us, and we don't care nothing about them. Now, beat it. Who's the owner of this carnival? B. St. Clair, and a trail is right down the midway, and she'll tell you the same thing I did. I'm hard to discourage. Friend, there's nobody here needs no help. Friend, you forget that I've heard your jokes. See you later. Uh, 
Miss St. Clair? Right. Who are you? I'm a customer of your carnival. Well, come in, customer. Sit down. Oh. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to ask a few questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> Where's your question license? My name is Simon Templer, also known as the Saint. The? I'll form my own opinion. <laughs> what do you want to know? I'm interested in Angie. Oh, Angie? Mm-hmm. They never come any better. Every hundred years or so, you meet somebody nice in this lousetrap circuit. And Angie was one of them. Now she's gone and the crumbs remain. Anything peculiar about the way she died? Sudden, that's all. Heart. Why? And her sister Mona took her place. Yep. Mona's a good kid, but a kid. Any chance of her being brought up from the living grave soon? Why? I got the impression she didn't like it down there. Well, you did. You know something? I don't like running this flea circus of a carnival either. Some mornings I don't even like living. But I don't come running to you about it, Mr. Templer. You won't bring her up then, huh? No. I got nothing to say about it anyway. It's up to her husband, Frankie Fowler. You catch his act? Frankie, the tattooed boy? I'm afraid I'm not an art lover. <laughs> well, he's no Mona Lisa, Jack. Any more questions? Would I get any more answers? No. But when a woman says no, that's not always what she means. Jack, that's an entirely different type of question. Hello. Anybody here? Yeah? Frankie, I'd uh, like to talk to you. Who are you? My name is Simon Templer, Frankie. What do you want? Well, I've always been interested in tattoos. I, I think they're fascinating. Oh? Mm, almost as fascinating as the people who do them. Oh, a fan. Come in, come in. Thank you, thank you. You know, the, uh, the Connie's closed for the night, but I'm always glad to oblige a customer. Well, I'm not exactly a customer. I'm a friend of Mona's. Mona's got no friend, Simon Templer. Well, let's say a speaking acquaintance. Did you know Angie, Frankie? Know her? Angie was my wife. Wonderful girl. Almost killed me when she passed away. Omaha. She's buried there? I couldn't leave her behind. Not with strangers. Call me sentimental if you want to, but that's the way I felt. You see that urn over there on the table? Now Angie's with me always. I, uh, I see. They say us carny people got no heart. Hey, you like to see some real artistic work in tattoo, Mr. Temple? Oh, maybe some other time, Frank. Look at that. Look at that. Here. Monitor in a Merrimack. Civil War. Authentic, 100%. Mm. Eh, they don't do work like that anymore. Frankie, I, uh... Everything I got on me is art. Art! I seen a guy the other day ask him what he had on. He said, surrealism. Surrealism. I told him right out. I said, the guy that tattooed that on you ain't American. That's what I told him, and I'll stand by it. <laughs> surrealism. Frankie, I've been talking to Mona. What about? She's buried too far under the earth, Frankie. She wants to come up. Well, she does, does she? She say anything else, did she? I just got the impression she was frightened down there. Well, thing. let her be. Let her stay there. She's getting just like Angie. Oh? Angie was frightened? Well, no, no, that's not what I meant. Angie, Angie was the greatest. It's just that they're sisters, see? What's this to you? Nothing, except I think it might be better if you brought Mona up. Oh, you do. You do. Segundo! Uh, Frankie. Come in here. Now you see what happens to guys who get nosy. Afraid to do your own strong arm work, eh, Frankie? Why, you... Here I am. <laughs> Look, Segundo, this guy came in here saying bad things about Angie. About Angie? Yeah. You shouldn't have said that, mister. Not about Angie. I don't like nobody to say bad things about Angie. I'm trying to help her, Segundo. And Mona. Don't listen to him, Segundo. Get him. I don't trust... Strange. Hit him again, Segundo. Throw him out. Yeah. You shouldn't have said bad things about... Hey. Hey. Hey, wake up, mister. Wake up. You hurt? Uh, hey, carnival's closed for the night, friend. Uh, Why don't you go home and sleep? Oh, wait till I find my head. What happened? Well, 
Uh, let's say too much cotton candy and circus peanuts, huh? Drink help you out? Ooh, immeasurably. Lead the way. <laughs> yeah. Don't mind drinking with a dwarf, do you? Uh-huh. Why should I? Well, some people do. <laughs> oh, mm, my name's Carlos. Oh, hello. Uh, I'm Simon Temper. Yeah. Oh, right in here. Oh. My home. Uh, one of the wagons. Oh, don't, don't bump your head. Oh, I'll watch it. <laughs> here. Pour this down. Oh, thank you, my friend. Why, oh, I needed that. <laughs> uh, have to go, or can you stay and talk a while? Oh, I'd like to stay if I may, Carlos. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I very seldom get the chance to talk, Mr. Templer. Why is that? Yeah, and a dwarf's rather lonely occupation. Not freak enough to make much money in the carnival, and too much of a freak to be accepted out of it. Oh, I... <laughs> Sorry to... Burden you with my troubles. Everyone's troubles are everyone else's, Carla. Well, thank you. <laughs> Want to tell me about yours? Well, I had a, a call for help tonight from 20 feet under the ground. And I, I just don't know what to do about it. Mona? Yeah. She said she was afraid she would end up like Angie. She wanted to come up. Did you uh, tell anyone else about this? Not directly, No. Frankie refused to let her come up. I have another drink. Oh. Yeah. Mona never talked like this before. She was never scared, not like Angie. Mona's got guts. It worries me. Go here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, what about the man who was married to both of them? Huh? Frankie. Simon, if you were born a freak like I was, you had no choice and you can be philosophical. But if you make yourself a freak like Frankie did, you gotta hate yourself and everybody else as long as you live. And yet two women married. Don't him. rub it in. I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have jumped you. I'm not always as philosophical as I try to be. I can't help thinking of Mona, buried alive, afraid. Afraid of what? And she mentioned that Angie said something to her just before she died. What? She didn't say. Tell me, uh, how far are we from where Mona is? Just across the midway. You want to go over there? I'd feel better. And so would I. Let's go. Hmm. What about B. St. Clair, Carlos? Uh, can you figure her out? Well, not quite, because I don't think B. can figure herself out. She hasn't had much fun either. I hope she gets some. Uh, this is Mona's tent, isn't it? Anybody around? Mm, mm, not a soul. Let's go in. <whistles> Mona! Mona! Oh, she must be asleep. Well, let me try. Mona! Can you hear me? Mona! She's not asleep. There's something wrong. Mona! Mona, it's Carlos! Mona! What was it she said? She might wind up like Angie. Mona! Carlos, go get every man you can and every shovel and then get a doctor and an ambulance. Yeah. They want you to break the record. Well, maybe she will. Maybe she will, like Angie. That's it. Keep going. Oh, stop. Get out of the way. Okay, okay. Oh. Are they almost down to her, B? Well, I think so. It's only about eight feet. We advertised 20, but eight is enough. What do you think happened, Carlos? I don't know. What happened to Angie? A heart attack, you know that. Do I? She's just fainted, maybe. Maybe this is all about nothing. I doubt it, Frankie. And so do you. What do you have to come nosing in for, Templar? B and I don't need you. We can get along. B and the... you? All of us, that's what I mean. You mean you'd rather have left her down there? I'm not taking this from you. I... Frankie! Oh, come on. Come on, you guys. Grab it. Grab it. Come on. Come on. Uh, 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 there, there. Now, give me a hand with the lid. You better come over here, doctor. Right, Mr. Templer. Yeah. There. What is it, Doc? Is she... Is she... 
Well, she's still breathing, but that's about all. Any symptoms? If I had to make a guess, symptoms of poisoning. Get her over to the ambulance. Hurry, come on. Mr. Templer. Mr. Templer, I'm sorry I didn't get her up sooner. I should have made it plainer, but I didn't know who to trust. Do you now? Just who not to trust. And who's that? Everyone. How is she this morning, Doctor? Oh, she's a sick girl, but she'll live. We got her in time. Oh, I'm glad. What caused it? Poison of some kind, definitely. I'm waiting for a lab report. Uh, may I see her? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Templer. She's rational now. Kept asking Angie to forgive her before... Forgive her for what? Well, she didn't say. They usually don't. Don't stay too long. Oh, all right, Doctor. Good morning, Mona. Who are you? Simon Templer, I spoke to you down the tube yesterday. You thought at first I was Frankie. I don't remember. Don't you? You said you were afraid you might end up like Angie. She said something to you before she died, Mona. What was it? I don't remember. She didn't say anything. You uh, know what happened to you last night, Mona? No. There was poison in your food that was lowered through the tube. Got any idea who did it? Poison? I don't believe it. Well... Police will find out. I don't want the police. I I did it. I I took it myself. What kind? I I don't remember, but I took it. Why did you want Angie to forgive you, Mona? Who told you that? I mean, you're making that up. I'm trying to help you, Mona. I don't need help. I want Frankie. I want him back. I I want him back. All right, all right. I'll find him for you. Come in. How are you, B? How's Mona, Simon? Better, Carlos. I was at the hospital all day. Had to wait for the lab reports on the poison. Who did it? Oh, it could have been put there by anyone. To the police now? Not yet. Mona claims she took it herself. She's obviously protecting someone or is afraid of someone. But who? B, you don't have to answer unless you want to. What, Simon? Has there been anything between you and Frankie? Well, everybody gets lonely. <laughs> Are you still lonely? Jack, I got no ambition to travel around the country in an urn. Does that answer it? That's good enough. If I can wind this thing up tonight, will the two of you help me? You especially, Carlos. Anything I can, Simon. All right. You're not closing the carnival down tonight, B. We'll stay open if you say so. Well, it might make it easier. Carlos, you go to Frankie's trailer while he's doing his show and take the urn. Would you mind doing that? I'll do it. Good. Put it in a safe place, doesn't matter where, and come back to the trailer. All three of us will wait for Frankie to come back after his show. What happens then? I don't know for sure, but I have a theory. I hope it's right. It's a question. What happens if it's not right? B, that's an entirely different type of question. Simon, why do we have to wait in the dark for Frankie? It's creepy in here. He might not come in if he saw the lights, Bee. Do you mind, Carlos? Not a bit. The dark is a friend of mine. Oh, I'm getting chumpy. You can leave if you want to. I might be able to handle what I have to do alone. Oh, I'll stick. But give me a chance to gripe, will you? <laughs> How about you, Carlos? Oh, I'm enjoying it, Mr. Templer. Gives me a chance to feel important. I don't get many chances like that. Gee, Frankie's late. He should have been here by now. Well, maybe business was good tonight. Well, he usually is. Oh? Say, B, I uh, don't want to be personal, but running a carnival, is it uh, lucrative? Jack, I don't want to brag, but I am loaded. Oh, how nice for you. Why, last year alone, I... Someone come. <laughs> Good evening, Frankie. Templar. What is this, B? I couldn't keep away, Frankie, but I brought my chaperone. Well, get him out of here. Some chaperones. A saint and a dwarf. I didn't choose to be a freak, Frankie. That's the difference. What's going on? Look around, Frankie. Anything missing? What do you mean? The urn. Where is it? What'd you do with it? We took it. You took it? Segundo, come in here. I don't think you'll need Segundo this time. No? Sit down, Frankie. (laughs) If you don't like that seat, I can get you a hotter one. You think you know something? I'm nosy, Frankie. Very nosy, as you pointed out. 
What is it, Frankie? This guy Temple again, Segundo. He's been saying bad things and doing bad things. He took Angie's arm. Easy, Segundo. You'll want to hear this, too. Hear what? Don't wait, Segundo. He's just stalling. Go get him. You took the arm. Segundo, sit down. No. Segundo, wait in here. Wait in here. Okay, Carlos, I trust you. Good. It's about Angie, Segundo. This morning and last night, Mona was calling out for Angie to forgive her. For what? Because she'd been going around with you, Frankie, while you were married to her older sister. I loved Angie. And how long after she died did you marry Mona? Six weeks. I couldn't help it if the kid was crazy about me. But you couldn't help it when you killed Angie with poison. Who says I did? Where's the evidence? You thought there wasn't any. It was almost a smart job, Frankie, but you couldn't pull anything all the way smart. It was only half smart, and that can be fatal. If you think I'm going to stand here and listen to this You'll stuff... You'll stand and you'll listen. Murderers hardly ever change tactics, Frankie. The poison showed up in Mona's stomach. We couldn't prove that on you, but there are certain poisons that can be traced even after cremation. The kind you used is one. Now, do you begin to get the point? It's not true. You can't trace it, can you, Carlos? Yes, you can. I should have remembered. I should have had that urn analyzed long ago. Now, wait a minute. You're guessing at this. Are we? Where's the urn? You're guessing at a motive. I didn't kill Angie. Then why would I want to kill Mona? Bigger stakes. You were after B. She was uh, loaded. It's all a lie. I, I, I mean, B and I... Segundo, stay away from me. Put that gun away, Frankie. No. I'll use it if you don't stay back, Segundo. Frankie... You killed Angie. I tell you, nobody killed her. She, she had a weak heart. That was it, a weak heart. Segundo, listen to me. You killed Angie, Franco. Stay back. Stay back. He's going to shoot, Segundo. She, she never done no harm. She, she was so... Stay so... back, I'm warning you. She loved you and you gave her poison. Don't come no closer, I mean it. Stay back. She laughed sometime, and she did like a little girl. Keep away from me, you big creep. Why, well, you couldn't let her live. You crazy creep, why don't you drop? You ain't human. Keep your hands off of me. Come on, let go of him. Let go of him. Let go. It's me. Carlos, let him go. Let him go. Sure, Carlos, sure. are you hurt? <sighs> Bad? No. No. Oh, I think one was a clean miss. The other two got him in the shoulder. He'll live. Here, let me help you up, Segundo. Come on now. Sit down, sit down. B, get a doctor. All right, all right, Father. Quite a man, this Segundo. Not so strong upstairs, but in the heart, plenty. Yeah, he almost killed Frankie. I'm almost sorry he didn't. Frankie doesn't deserve to live. Someone else will decide that, Carlos. What Segundo did... I wish I could have done it, Saint. In my hands. I wish I could have done it. Carlos. I never told anybody, Saint. I never told her. She never guessed. But I loved Angie, too. Heaven help me. I loved her, too. Sir, if you will, my friend. You mean me? I mean you. Uh, hey, do you care to see the fat lady, friend? Wait, 9,324 uh, ounces. <laughs> well, that's better. <laughs> How are you, Mr. Templer? <laughs> I'm fine. Tell me, uh, how's Mona? Oh, she's all right. It's a funny thing, Mr. Templer. I, I think Angie must have told her when she was dying that she suspected Frankie. But Mona could never bring herself to believe it. She still can't. But I guess she will. See, uh, going in to see the fat lady, Mr. Templer? You talked me right into it. Here's a five. Thank you, and the interest is straight ahead, friend. Uh, my change? <laughs> yeah, change. <laughs> Here's your five back. For Simon Templer, everything is always on the house. On the house? Yeah. Well, thanks. Say, you'd make a wonderful bartender. Oh, now, Mr. Templer, that wouldn't be refined. Oh, well, just a lovely dream, a wild, lovely dream. You 
have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, your life is your own. It's yours to guard when danger is near. And danger is never absent from the highways of America, where some 30,000 persons are killed every year. Only you can take the responsibility for averting the most tragic of all traffic accidents, the accident that happens to you. You can take that responsibility by recognizing the dangers of the road and by obeying the laws that have been made to protect your life. In almost every single motor accident reported by the National Safety Council, there was at least one violation of traffic regulations. The most common violation was speed. Speed too great for safety. Speed to save a few seconds. Speed that spelled out death and tragedy on the road. And, as always, the National Safety Council warns about driving after drinking. It's not an empty warning because fully one quarter of all fatal accidents involve drivers or pedestrians who have been drinking. This is a fact. So when you drive, remember that an accident can happen to you. Learn and obey the traffic laws and don't take the little chances that so frequently result in a smash-up. The care you take may save a life and that life may be your own. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This adventure of the saint was written by Dick Powell. In our cast, you heard Mary Shipp as Mona and Sheldon Leonard as the Barker. Bob Jellison was Carlos, Ed Max Segundo. Henny Bacchus played B, Harry Bartell was Frankie, Harry Brown was the Doctor. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production of His Kind of Woman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today, Theater Guild on the Air presents the dramatic story, Come Back, Little Sheba, starring Gary Cooper and Shirley Booth. Sunday also means another 90 wonderful minutes with the big show. And among this Sunday's stars are Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, and many, many more. And, of course, Tallulah will be the MC. And for a sparkling article about the glamorous Tallulah, see the latest issue of Look Magazine, now on sale. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Everlasting Man by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 7 The War of the Gods and Demons the materialist theory of history, that all politics and ethics are the expression of economics, is a very simple fallacy indeed. It consists simply of confusing the necessary conditions of life with the normal preoccupations of life that are quite a different thing. It is like saying that because a man can only walk about on two legs, therefore he never walks about except to buy shoes and stockings. Man cannot live without the two props of food and drink, which support him like two legs. But to suggest that they have been the motives of all his movements in history is like saying that the goal of all his military marches or religious pilgrimages must have been the golden leg of Miss Kilmanseg or the ideal and perfect leg of Sir Willoughby Pattern. But it is such movements that make up the story of mankind, and without them there would practically be no story at all. Cows may be purely economic, in the sense that we cannot see that they do much beyond grazing and seeking better grazing grounds, and that is why a history of cows in twelve volumes would not be very lively reading. Sheep and goats may be pure economists, in their external action at least, 
but that is why the sheep has hardly been a hero of epic wars and empires thought worthy of detailed narration and even the more active quadruped has not inspired a book for boys called golden deeds of gallant goats or any similar title but so far from the movements that make up the story of man being economic we may say that the story only begins where the motive of the cows and sheep leaves off it will be hard to maintain that the crusaders went from their homes into an howling wilderness because cows go from a wilderness to a more comfortable grazing grounds it will be hard to maintain that the Arctic explorers went north with the same material motive that made the swallows go south. And if you leave things like all religious wars and all the merely adventurous explorations out of the human story, it will not only cease to be human at all, but cease to be a story at all. The outline of history is made of these decisive curves and angles determined by the will of man. Economic history would not even be history. But there is a deeper fallacy besides this obvious fact, that men need not live for food merely because they cannot live without food. The truth is that the thing most present to the mind of man is not the economic machinery necessary to his existence, but rather that existence itself. The world which he sees when he wakes every morning, and the nature of his general position in it. There is something that is nearer to him than livelihood, and that is life. For once that he remembers exactly what pr work produces his wages, and exactly what wages produce his meals, he reflects ten times that it is a fine day, or it is a queer world and wonders whether life is worth living, or wonders whether marriage is a failure, or is pleased and puzzled with his own children, or remembers his own youth, or in any such fashion vaguely reviews the mysterious lot of man. This is true of the majority even of the wage-slaves of our morbid modern industrialism, which by its hideousness and inhumanity has really forced the economic issue to the front. It is immeasurably more true of the multitude of peasants or hunters or fishers who make up the real mass of mankind. Even those dry pedants who think that ethics depend on economics must admit that economics depend on existence. And any number of normal doubts and daydreams are about existence not about how we can live, but about why we do. And the proof of it is simple, as simple as suicide. Turn the universe upside down in the mind, and you turn all the political economists upside down with it. Suppose that a man wishes to die, and the professor of political economy becomes rather a bore with all his elaborate explanations of how he is to live and all the departures and decisions that make our human past into a story have this character of diverting the direct course of pure economics. As the economist may be excused from calculating the future salary of a suicide, so he may be excused from providing an old-age pension for a martyr. As he need not provide for the future of a martyr, so he need not provide for the family of a monk. His plan is modified in lesser and varying degrees by a man being a soldier and dying for his own country, by a man being a peasant and specially loving his own land, by a man being more or less affected by any religion that forbids or allows him to do this or that. But all these come back not to an economic calculation about livelihood, but to an elemental outlook upon life. They all come back to what a man fundamentally feels when he looks forth from those strange windows which we call the eyes, upon that strange vision that we call the world. 
no wise man will wish to bring more long words into the world. But it may be allowable to say that we need a new thing, which may be called psychological history. I mean, the consideration of what things meant in the mind of a man, especially an ordinary man, as distinct from what is defined or deduced merely from official forms or political pronouncements. I have already touched on it in such a case as the totem, or indeed any other popular myth. It is not enough to be told that a tomcat was called a totem, especially when it was not called a totem. We want to know what it felt like. Was it like Whittington's cat or a witch's cat? Was its real name Postel or Puss in Boots? That is the sort of thing we need touching the nature of political and social relations. We want to know the real sentiment that was the social bond of many common men, as sane and as selfish as we are. What did soldiers feel when they saw splendid in the sky that strange totem that we call the Golden Eagle of the Legions? What did vassals feel about those other totems, the lions or the leopards upon the shield of their lord? So long as we neglect this subjective side of history, which may more simply be called the inside of history, there will always be a certain limitation on that science which can be better transcended by art. So long as the historian cannot do that, fiction will be truer than fact. There will be more reality in a novel, yes, even in a historical novel, in nothing is this new history needed so much as in the psychology of war. Our history is stiff with official documents, public or private, which tell us nothing of the thing itself. At the worst we only have the official posters, which could not have been spontaneous precisely because they were official. At the best we have only the secret diplomacy which could not have been popular precisely because it was secret. Upon one or other of these is based the historical judgment about the real reasons that sustained the struggle. Governments fight for colonies or commercial rights. Governments fight about harbors or high tariffs. Governments fight for a gold mine or a pearl fishery. It seems sufficient to answer that governments do not fight at all. Why do the fighters fight? What is the psychology that sustains the terrible and wonderful thing called a war? Nobody who knows anything of soldiers believes the silly notion of the dons that millions of men can be ruled by force. If they were all to slack, it would be impossible to punish all the slackers and the least little touch of slacking would lose a whole campaign in half a day. What did men really feel about the policy? If it be said that they accepted the policy from the politician, what did they feel about the politician? If the vassals warred blindly for their prince, what did those blind men see in their prince? There is something we all know which can only be rendered in an appropriate language as rail politic. As a matter of fact, it is an almost insanely unreal politic. It is always stubbornly and stupidly repeating that men fight for material ends, without reflecting for a moment that the material ends are hardly ever material to the men who fight. In any case, no man will die for practical politics, just as no man will die for pay. Nero could not hire a hundred Christians to be eaten by lions at a shilling an hour, for men will not be martyred for money. But the vision called up by real politic or uh, realistic polit politics is beyond example, crazy and incredible. Does anybody in the world believe that a soldier says, My leg is nearly dropping off, but I shall go on till it drops, for after all, 
I shall enjoy all the advantages of my government obtaining a warm water port in the Gulf of Finland. Can anybody suppose that a clerk turned conscript says, Hmm, if I am gassed, I shall probably die in torments, but it is a comfort to reflect that should I ever decide to become a pearl diver in the South Seas, that career is now open to me and my countrymen. Materialist history is the most madly incredible of all histories, or even of all romances. Whatever starts wars, the thing that sustains wars is something in the soul. That is something akin to religion. It is what men feel about life and about death. A man near to death is dealing directly with an absolute. It is nonsense to say that he is concerned only with relative and remote complications that death in any case will end. If he is sustained by certain loyalties, they must be loyalties as simple as death. They are generally two ideas, which are only two sides of one idea. The first is the love of something said to be threatened, if it be only vaguely known as home. The second is dislike and defiance of some strange thing that threatens it. The first is far more philosophical than it sounds, though we need not discuss it here. A man does not want his national home destroyed or even changed, because he cannot even remember all the good things that go with it, just as he does not want his house burnt down, because he can hardly count all the things he would miss. Therefore he fights, for what sounds like a hazy abstraction, but is really a house. But the negative side of it is quite as noble as well as quite as strong. Men fight hardest when they feel that the foe is at once an old enemy and an eternal stranger, that his atmosphere is alien and antagonistic, as the French feel about the Prussian or the Eastern Christians about the Turk. If we say it is a difference of religion, people will drift into dreary bickerings about sects and dogmas. We will pity them and say it is a difference about death and daylight. A difference that does really come like a dark shadow between our eyes and the day. Men can think of this difference even at the point of death, for it is a difference about the meaning of life. Men are moved in these things by something far higher and holier than policy, by hatred. When men hung on in the darkest days of the great war, suffering even in, either in their bodies or in their souls for those they loved, they were long past caring about details of diplomatic objects as motives for their refusal to surrender. Of myself and those I knew best, I can answer for the vision that made surrender impossible. It was the vision of the German Emperor's face as he rode into Paris. This is not the sentiment which some of my idealistic friends describe as love. I am quite content to call it hatred, the hatred of hell and all its works, and to agree that as they do not believe in hell, they need not believe in hatred. But in the face of this prevalent prejudice, this long introduction has been unfortunately necessary to ensure an understanding of what is meant by a religious war. There is a religious war when two worlds meet, that is, when two visions of the world meet, or, in more modern language, when two moral atmospheres meet. What is the one man's breath is the other man's poison, and it is vain of to talk of giving a pestilence a place in the sun. And this is what we must understand, even at the expense of digression, if we would see what really happened in the Mediterranean, when right athwart the rising of the Republic on the Tiber, a thing overtopping and disdaining it, dark with all the riddles of Asia, and trailing all the tribes and dependencies of imperialism, 
came Carthage, riding on the sea. The ancient religion of Italy was on the whole that mixture which we have considered under the head of mythology, save that where the Greeks had a natural turn for the mythology, the Latins seem to have had a real turn for religion. Both multiplied gods, yet they sometimes seem to have multiplied them for almost the opposite reasons. It would seem sometimes as if the Greek polytheism branched and blossomed upwards like the boughs of a tree, while the Italian polytheism ramified downward like the roots. Perhaps it would be truer to say that the former branches lifted themselves lightly, bearing flowers, while the latter hung down, being heavy with fruit. I mean that the Latins seemed to multiply gods to bring them nearer to men, while the Greek gods rose and radiated outward into the morning sky. What strikes us in the Italian cults is their local and especially their domestic character. We gain the impression of divinities swarming about the house like flies, of deities clustering and clinging like bats about the pillars or building like birds under the eaves. We have a vision of a god of roofs and a god of gateposts, of a god of doors and even of a god of drains. It has been suggested that all mythology was a sort of fairy tale, but this was a particular sort of fairy tale which may truly be called a fireside tale or a nursery tale, because it was a tale of the interior of the home, like those which make chairs and tables talk like elves. The old household gods of the Italian peasants seem to have been great clumsy wooden images, more featureless than the figurehead which Quilp battered with the poker. This religion of the home was very homely. Of course, there were other less human elements in the tangle of Italian mythology. There were Greek deities superimposed on the Roman. There were here and there uglier things underneath experiments in the cruel kind of paganism, like the Arician rite of the priest slaying the slayer. But these things were always potential in paganism. They are certainly not the peculiar character of Latin paganism. The peculiarity of that may be roughly covered by saying that if mythology personified the forces of nature, this mythology personified nature as transformed by the forces of man. It was the god of the corn, and not of the grass, of the cattle, and not the wild things of the forest. In short, the cult was literally a culture, as when we speak of it as agriculture. With this there was a paradox, which is still for many the puzzle or riddle of the Latins. With religion running through every domestic detail like a climbing plant, there went what seems to many the very opposite spirit, the spirit of revolt. Imperialists and reactionaries often involve Rome as the very model of order and obedience. But Rome was the very reverse. The real history of ancient Rome is much more like the history of modern Paris. It might be called in modern language a city built out of barricades. It is said that the gate of Janus was never closed because there was an eternal war without. It is almost as true that there was an eternal revolution within. From the first plebeian riots to the last servile wars, the state that imposed peace on the world was never really at peace. The rulers were themselves rebels. There is a real relation between this religion in private and this revolution in private life, in public life. Stories, none the less heroic for being hackneyed, remind us that the Republic was founded on a tyrannicide that avenged an insult to a wife, that the tribunes of the people were re-established after another 
which avenged an insult to a daughter. The truth is that only men to whom the family is sacred will ever have a standard or a status by which to criticize the state. They alone can appeal to something more holy than the gods of the city, the gods of the hearth. That is why men are mystified in seeing that the same nations that are thought rigid in domesticity are also thought restless in politics. For instance, the Irish and the French. It is worth while to dwell on this domestic point, because it is an exact example of what is meant here by the inside of history, like the inside of houses. Merely political histories of Rome may be right enough in saying that this or that was a cynical or cruel act of the Roman politicians. But the spirit that lifted Rome from beneath was the spirit of all the Romans, and it is not a cant to call it the ideal of Cincinnatus, passing from the Senate to the plough. Men of that sort had strengthened their village on every side, had extended its victories already over Italians and even over Greeks, when they found themselves confronted with a war that changed the world. I have called it here the War of the Gods and the Demons. There was established on the opposite coast of the Inland Sea a city that bore the name of the New Town. It was already much older more powerful and more prosperous than the Italian town, but there still remained about it an atmosphere that made the name not inappropriate. It had been called new because it was a colony like New York or New Zealand. It was an outpost or settlement of the energy and expansion of the great commercial cities of Tyre and Sidon. There was a note of the new countries and colonies about it, a confident and commercial outlook. It was fond of saying things that rang with a certain metallic assurance, as that nobody could wash his hands in the sea without the leave of the new town. For it depended almost entirely on the greatness of its ships, as did the two great ports and markets from which its people came. It brought from Tyre and Sidon a prodigious talent for trade, and a considerable experience of travel. It brought other things as well. In a previous chapter I have hinted at something of the psychology that lies behind a certain kind of religion. There was a tendency in those hungry for practical results, apart from poetical results, to call upon spirits of terror and compulsion, to move Acheron in despair of bending the gods. There is always a sort of dim idea that these darker powers will really do things, with no nonsense about it. In the interior psychology of the Punic peoples, this strange sort of pessimistic practicality had grown to great proportions. In the new town, which the Romans called Carthage, as in the parent cities of Phoenicia, the god who got things done bore the name of Moloch, who was perhaps identical with the other deity whom we know as Baal, the Lord. The Romans did not at first quite know what to call him or what to make of him. They had to go back to the grossest myth of Greek or Roman origins and compare him to Saturn devouring his children. But the worshippers of Moloch were not gross or primitive. They were members of a mature and polished civilization, abounding in refinements and luxuries. They were probably far more civilized than the Romans. And Moloch was not a myth, or at any rate his meal was not a myth. These highly civilized people really met together to invoke the blessing of heaven on their empire by throwing hundreds of their infants into a large furnace. We can only realize the combination by imagining a number of Manchester merchants with chim chimney-pot hats and mutton-chop whiskers 
going to church every Sunday at eleven o'clock to see a baby roasted alive. The first stages of the political or commercial quarrel can be followed in far too much detail, precisely because it is merely political or commercial. The Punic Wars looked at one time as if they would never end, and it is not easy to say when they ever began. The Greeks and Sicilians had already been fighting vaguely on the European side against the African city. Carthage had defeated Greece and conquered Sic Sicily. Carthage had also planted herself firmly in Spain, and between Spain and Sicily the Latin city was contained and would have been crushed, if the Romans had been the sort to be easily crushed. Yet the interest of the story really consists in the fact that Rome was crushed. If there had not been certain moral elements as well as the material elements, the story would have ended where Carthage certainly thought it had ended. It is common enough to blame Rome for not making peace. But it was a true popular instinct that there could be no peace with that sort of people. It is common enough to blame the Roman for his delenda est Carthago. Carthage must be destroyed. It is commoner to forget that to all appearances Rome itself was destroyed. The sacred savor that hung round Rome forever, it is too often forgotten, clung to her partly because she has ridden, had risen suddenly from the dead. Carthage was an aristocracy, as are most of such mercantile states. The pressure of the rich on the poor was impersonal as well as irresistible, for such aristocracies never permit personal government, which is perhaps why this one was jealous of personal talent. But genius can turn up anywhere, even in a governing class. As if to make the world's supreme test as terrible as possible, it was ordained that one of those great houses of Carthage should produce a man who came out of those gilded palaces with all the energy and originality of Napoleon coming from nowhere. At the worst crisis of the war, Rome learned that Italy itself, by a military miracle, was invaded from the north. Hannibal, the grace of Baal, as his name ran in his own tongue, had dragged a ponderous chain of armaments over the starry solitudes of the Alps, and pointed southward to the city which he had been pledged by all his dreadful gods to destroy. Hannibal marched down the road to Rome, and the Romans who rushed to war with him felt as if they were fighting with a magician. Two great armies sank to right and left of him into the swamps of the Trebia, more and more were sucked into the horrible whirlpool of Cannae. More and more went forth only to fall into ruin at his touch. The supreme sign of all disasters, which is treason, turned tribe after tribe against the fallen cause of Rome. And still the unconquerable enemy rolled nearer and nearer to the city, and following their great leader, the swelling cosmopolitan army of Carthage passed like a pageant of the whole world, the elephants shaking the earth like marching mountains, and the gigantic Gauls with their barbaric panoply, and the dark Spaniards girt in gold, and the brown Numidians on their unbridled desert horses wheeling and darting like hawks, and whole mobs of deserters and mercenaries and miscellaneous peoples and the grace of Baal went before them. The Roman augurs and scribes, who said in that hour that it brought forth unearthly prodigies, that a child was born with the head of an elephant, or that stars fell down like hailstones, had a far more philosophical grasp of what had really happened than the modern historian, who can see nothing in it but a success of strategy concluding a rivalry in commerce. Something far different was felt at the time and on the spot, 
as it is always felt by those who experience a foreign atmosphere entering their own, like a fog or a foul savor. It was no mere military defeat. It was certainly no mere mercantile rivalry that filled the Roman imagination with such hideous omens of nature itself becoming unnatural. It was Moloch upon the mountain of the Latins, looking with his appalling face upon the plain. It was Baal, who trampled the vineyards with his feet of stone. It was the voice of Tanit the Invisible, behind her trailing veils, whispering of the love that is more horrible than hate. The burning of the Italian cornfields, the ruin of the Italian vines, were something more than actual. They were allegorical. They were the destruction of domestic and fruitful things, the withering of what was human before the inhumanity that is far beyond the human thing called cruelty. The household gods bowed low in darkness under their lowly roofs, and above them went the demons upon a wind from beyond all walls, blowing the trumpet of the Tramontane. The door of the Alps was broken down, and in no vulgar but a very solemn sense it was hell let loose. The war of the gods and demons seemed already to have ended, and the gods were dead. The eagles were lost, the legions were broken, and in Rome nothing remained but honor and the cold courage of despair. In the whole world, one thing still threatened Carthage, and that was Carthage. There still remained the inner working of an element strong in all successful commercial states, and the presence of a spirit that we know. There was still the solid sense and shrewdness of the men who manage big enterprises. There was still the advice of the best financial experts. There was still business government. There was still the broad and sane outlook of practical men of affairs. And in these things could the Romans hope. As the war trailed on to what seemed its tragic end, there grew gradually a faint and strange possibility that even now they might not hope in vain. The plain businessmen of Carthage, thinking as such men do in terms of living and dying races, saw clearly that Rome was not only dying but dead. The war was over. It was obviously hopeless for the Italian city to resist any longer, and inconceivable that anybody should resist when it was hopeless. Under these circumstances, another set of broad, sound business principles remained to be considered. Wars were waged with money, and consequently cost money. Perhaps they felt in their hearts, as do so many of their kind, that after all war must be a little wicked, because it costs money. The time had now come for peace and still more for economy. The messages sent by Hannibal from time to time asking for reinforcements were a ridiculous anachronism. There were much more important things to attend to now. It might be true that some consul or other had made a last dash to the Metaurus, had killed Hannibal's brother and flung his head with a Latin fury into Hannibal's camp and mad actions of that sort showed how utterly hopeless Latins felt about their cause. But even excitable Latins could not be so mad as to cling to a lost cause forever. So argued the best financial experts, and tossed aside more and more letters full of rather queer alarmist reports. So argued and acted the great Carthaginian empire that meaningless prejudice, the curse of commercial states, that stupidity is in some way practical, and that genius is in some way futile, led them to starve and abandon that great artist in the school of arms whom the gods had given them in vain. 
Why do men entertain this queer idea that what is sordid must always overthrow what is magnanimous? That there is some dim connection between brains and brutality, or that it does not matter if a man is dull as long as he is also mean? Why do they vaguely think of all chivalry as sentiment, and all sentiment as weakness? They do it because they are, like all men, primarily inspired by religion. For them, as for all men, the first fact is their notion of the nature of things, their idea about what world they are living in. And it is their faith that the only ultimate thing is fear, and therefore that the very heart of the world is evil. They believe that death is stronger than life, and therefore dead things must be stronger than living things, whether those dead things are gold and iron and machinery, or rocks and rivers and forces of nature. It may sound fanciful to say that men we meet at tea-tables or talk to at garden-parties are secretly worshippers of Baal and Moloch. But this sort of commercial mind has its own cosmic vision, and it is the vision of Carthage. It has in it the brutal blunder that was the ruin of Carthage. The Punic power fell because there is in this materialism a mad indifference to real thought. By disbelieving in the soul, it comes to disbelieving in the mind. Being too practical to be moral, it denies what every practical soldier calls the morale of an army. It fancies that money will fight when men will no longer fight. So it was with the Punic merchant princes. Their religion was a religion of despair, even when their practical fortunes were hopeful. How could they understand that the Romans could hope even when their fortunes were hopeless? Their religion was a religion of force and fear. How could they understand that men can still despise fear even when they submit to force? Their philosophy of the world had weariness in its very heart. Above all, they were weary of warfare. How should they understand those who still wage war even when they are weary of it? In a word, how should they understand the mind of man who had so long bowed down before mindless things, money and brute force, and gods who had the hearts of beasts? They awoke suddenly to the news that the embers they had disdained too much even to tread out were again breaking everywhere into flames, that Hasdrubal was defeated, that Hannibal was outnumbered, that Scipio had carried the very the war into Spain, that he had carried it into Africa. Before the very gates of the Golden City, Hannibal fought his last fight for it, and lost and Carthage fell as nothing has fallen since Satan. The name of the new city remains only as a name. There is no stone of it left upon the sand. Another war was indeed waged before the final destruction, but the destruction was final. Only men digging in its deep foundation centuries after, found a heap of hundreds of little skeletons, the holy relics of that religion. For Carthage fell because she was faithful to her own philosophy, and had fallen, followed out to its logical conclusion her own vision of the universe. Moloch had eaten his children. The gods had risen again, and the demons had been defeated after all. But they had been defeated by the defeated, and almost defeated by the dead. Nobody understands the romance of Rome, and why she rose afterwards to a representative leadership that seemed almost fated and fundamentally natural. 
who does not keep in mind the agony of horror and humiliation through which she had continued to testify to the sanity that is the soul of Europe. She came to stand alone in the midst of an empire, because she had once stood alone in the midst of a ruin and a waste. After that, all men knew in their hearts that she had been representative of mankind, even when she was rejected of men. And there fell on her the shadow from a shining and yet unvisible light. And there fell on her the shadow from a shining and as yet invisible light and the burden of things to be. It is not for us to guess in what manner or moment the mercy of God might in any case have rescued the world, but it is certain that the struggle which had established Christendom would have been very different if there had been an empire of Carthage instead of an empire of Rome. We have to thank the patience of the Punic Wars if, in after ages, divine things descended at least upon human things and not inhuman. Europe evolved into its own vices and its own impotence as will be suggested upon another page. But the worst into which it evolved was not like what it had escaped. Can any man in his senses compare the great wooden doll which whom the children expected to eat a little bit of the dinner with the great idol who would have been expected to eat the children? That is the measure of how far the world went astray compared with how far it might have gone astray. If the Romans were ruthless, it was in a true sense to an enemy, and certainly not merely a rival. They remembered not trade routes and regulations, but the faces of sneering men, and hated the hateful soul of Carthage. And we owe them something, if we never needed to cut down the groves of Venus exactly as men cut down the groves of bow. We owe it partly to their harshness that our thoughts of our human past are not wholly harsh. If the passage from heathenry to Christianity was a bridge as well as a breach, we owe it to those who kept that heathenry human. If after all these ages we are in some sense at peace with paganism, and can think more kindly of our fathers. It is well to remember the things that were, and the things that might have been. For this reason alone we can take lightly the load of antiquity, and need not shudder at a nymph on a fountain, or a cupid on a valentine. Laughter and sadness link us with things long past, and remembered without dishonor. And we can see, not altogether without tenderness, the twilight sinking around the Sabine farm, and hear the household gods rejoice when Catullus comes home to Sirmio. Deleta, est Carthago. End of chapter 7 of Book 1The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. To the world of enchantment, spells, bewitchery. These are all words from our childhood. 
pleasant memories of nursery stories before bedtime. The dark side of magic we knew nothing of. And when we grew old enough to learn, dismissed as ignorance and superstition. But once again in our times, incantation, exorcism, and the haunting belief in demonic possession are alive and abroad. They are what this strange tale is about. I tell you, Doctor, it's the God's honest truth. They brought the young man in on the rolling stretcher to the emergency room, and he had this big sort of dent in his head. Oh, he didn't look like he was breathing at all. There was me, with me bucket and me pail, trying to clean up. Just me and the young man on the stretcher, and the old wine old repeater we call P.J., they brought in earlier, snarling and dribbling. And that's when it happened. Came right out of old P.J.'s mouth, and across the room, and right up the young man's nose, like that. With a burny, cindery smell, like the old scissor grinder stone wheel used to make. Oh, a great black cloud with red eyes in the middle and a long forked tail. Oh, I'd take an oath of it on me mother's grave. It was the devil himself. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Possessed by the Devil, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Donald Buca. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. If you take a look at the new 1975 cars, it doesn't take long to notice the European influence is strong. And to be sure, there are some new American cars that rival the Europeans, one being Buick's new Skylark SR. But don't consider a Skylark SR because of its touring car interior or its rather rakish profile. Consider it because it's a Buick, possessing many of Buick's nicer innovations, like the new Buick V6, a peppery little engine that spits out a plentiful amount of talk while sipping a surprisingly small amount of gasoline. And if you wish, Skylark SR can abound with creature comforts seldom found on cars this size, with available items like Cruise Master Speed Control, AM FM Stereo. But you've heard enough. Now you need to see and drive a Skylark SR. And try to remember, it's not a European touring car. It's a Buick. Buick, dedicated to the free spirit in just about everyone. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. Oh, dear. All of this furniture is so beautiful. Look at this beautiful leather chair and this gorgeous oak table. And the prices are so low, I don't know which one to buy first. I'll help you, madam. But who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. Listen carefully. New federal regulations require that furniture be properly labeled, describing what it's made of, plastic, wood, veneer, and so forth. Be sure to read the labels on the furniture. They'll help you. Oh, I see. Why, look, the label on this marble table says made of marble dust. No wonder it's cheaper. Oh, thank you for telling me. Think nothing of it, little lady. Just passing along another consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. From the beginnings of history, it is there in some form. Possession. The incubus who ravishes maidens while asleep. The succubus who tempts man into seduction in his dreams. The dibuk, that lost soul who dies before his time and is compelled to wander in space till he can steal a body to live out his allotted years. Fact? Superstition? Hallucination? Here is such a modern legend. You be the judge. Okay, Doctor, an IV setup for old Wally Wino here. Glucose. We'll start it right away. Yes, Dr. Daniels. Oh, he don't look like he's long for this world. Huh. 
He hasn't got a cell. He hasn't drowned in alcohol. His liver is like a washboard. But I'm not sure I concur with your diagnosis, Mrs. Gideon. Still, I don't know this time. Oh, another emergency. And this is supposed to be the quiet hour. Do you want me to get out for a while, Doctor? I, I, I'm near finished. No, no, go ahead with your cleaning. Uh, just don't get run over by the stretcher. Uh, uh, put him over here, boys. Now, what have you brought me this time? Oh, you poor old souse. Dead to the world's the word for you, all right. Oh, you've got me sympathy. With my arthritis, many's the time I've been tempted to have a go at the hard stuff myself. Oh, but thanks to sweet Mary, she's held me back. A little sacramental wine to ease me bones keeps me going. I had a few tonight, I can tell you. Oh, but there's always them breath sweeteners to take it away. I hope. Well, how's your patient, Mrs. Gideon? Oh, doctor, I hope he's not a Catholic. The father might never make it in time. How's yours? Oh, mine's out of my league. What I need is a brain surgeon. Huh. Speak of the devil. Considine just walked past the door. Uh, Dr. Considine? Uh, Dr. Considine, sir, I've got an emergency here. Mother of heaven. And me here alone with two near corpses. <laughs> oh, I didn't see it. I couldn't have. Oh, but I did. I seen it. Oh, the good saints preserve me. Hey, hey, hey there, Mother. Well, where am I? Oh, I... In, in the Mercy Hospital. Oh, oh you shouldn't be getting up. Oh, ma'am. You're sure a different kind of nurse. Oh, I'm... <laughs> I'm no nurse. I'm the cleaning woman. Oh. And you hadn't oughtn't to be sitting up? Not with that clout on the head someone's after giving you. Hmm? What clout on the head? Why, that great big dent as big as a soap plate they brought you in with. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you, I'm late for the operating room already. Dr. Considine, he has a depressed skull fracture. I don't even know if he's still alive. Yeah. Good Lord, what are you doing on your feet? Dr. Considine, will you help me getting back on the... Street? Hey, hey, hold up. Wait a minute. Look, there's nothing wrong with me. Mister, an ambulance just brought you in here with a skull fracture. You were out cold in deep shock. But there's nothing wrong. There's nothing the matter with my head. Look. Holy mother. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, uh, Mike. Uh, Michael Damon. Oh, well, I'm uh, Dr. Considine, Chief of Neurological Surgery here at the hospital. Would you mind uh, sitting down on this chair for a second and letting me check you out? <laughs> sure, Doc. Look, I've got to admit, I don't remember how I got here to the hospital, so maybe you ought to have a look at me. Uh, Mrs. Gideon, what's the matter with you? You look like you just saw a ghost. It wasn't no ghost, sir. Dr. Daniels, get over here. Uh, yes, sir. Would you mind casting your eagle eye over the back of this young man's head and show me one scintilla of evidence of skull fracture or concussion? Doctor, all I know is Jake Bronstein brought him in on the wagon and he had a decompressed area you could have laid your hand in. That's right, sir. I saw it myself. Someone here has been drinking. Daniels, look. If this is your idea of a joke, I... Uh, but... but uh... No, never mind. We'll, uh, we'll discuss this later. Mr. Damon? Yes, Doctor? For your own protection as well as the hospital's, may I suggest that we take some x-rays of your head? Oh, nurse. Yes? You can let Dr. Daniels take over on the IV with the old man. And wheel Mr. Damon straight to x-ray. I want a full set of head plates. Yes, Doctor. Now, Mr. Damon, there are... There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Dad? Mike? Are you all right, son? Oh, I feel fine, Dad, except for a headache. Oh, uh, Dr. Considine, this is my father, Reverend Damon. Oh, uh, how do you do? A nurse, can we get going? Yes, uh, Dad, what happened? Uh, how did I get here? Well, perhaps you can explain, Reverend, as we walk along. I want to get to X-ray. Well, I wish someone could explain to me what happened. I can, sir. Uh, let me check the IV on old PJ. I... Wait a minute. What is it, Doctor? PJ here. He's bought it this time. Oh, oh, oh this is not my night. We might have pulled him through. Oh, there's going to be the devil to pay around here. Oh, you can say that again. It's the God's truth, Dr. Considine. Came right out of the old man's mouth... And across the room and up the young man's nose like that. 
with a burning, cindery smell like the old scissor grinder's wheel used to make. A great black cloud with red eyes in the middle and a long forked tail. Oh, I take an off on me mother's grave towards the devil himself. Yeah, yes, yes, Mrs. Gideon, I think you uh, can leave the medical discussion to us and I'm sure you have important work waiting. Oh, bless us, I, I left me pale and mop there. I hope nobody's been after stealing that mop. It had a brand new head on it. Well, at least I know now where the smell of alcohol came from. I can't blame you for that, Daniels. Sure. But I just can't accept it. In an emergency room, you concentrate on a seemingly healthy patient while you lose a really sick old man. P.J. was a repeater, Doc. He's long overdue for uremic poisoning or cardiac arrest. But this young guy, Damon... Well, 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 well. Complete your sentence. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking. That magnificent body, physically way above par, and the injury I thought I saw, well, would have left him a vegetable for the rest of a long life if we'd pulled him through. What injury? That depressed fracture. Most of the brain should have been injured beyond repair. You say what you thought you saw. Apparently you didn't see anything. You heard Mrs. Gideon back me up, Doctor. Come in. Oh, it's the wet plates, Doctor, from X-ray. Uh, light up the viewing fields, Daniels, and let's have a good look. <laughs> yeah, satisfied? Well, sir... Oh, somebody gave him a knock on the head, all right. There's some exterior evidence of that, but of any fracture? None I can see. Well, you're the doctor of record. Shall we send him home? I see no reason not to. Okay. Now I better get up to OR. Coming! Coming! Trudy! Well, don't look so disappointed, Rod. Come, come in. Come in. <laughs> Say, sweetheart, what are you doing here at this hour? Oh, I couldn't sleep after your call, so I drove over. Is Mike back from the hospital? No, I thought the bell was Dad and Mike. They're on the way home right now. How come you didn't go to the hospital? Well, we've been trying to get in touch with Anton Azarak. Oh? So Dad thought one of us should be here in case he called back. Oh. I mean, to find out what happened. Yeah. All right, Jan, uh, cool it. Oh, what a name for a cat. Why, I see nothing wrong with it. I think a martyr belongs in a minister's family. Oh, is that my fate as your wife to be? Of course not. <laughs> We just called her that because Mike and she never seem to get along. Oh, it's hard to figure about the cat. Mike is such a kind, gentle sort of a giant. I, I thought all animals loved him. Well, it depends what the word includes. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, there's a car now. The return of the prodigal son. Now maybe we'll find out just what happened last night. <laughs> And that's honestly all I can tell any of you. You were making a fresh fire in the fireplace at half past five in the morning and straightened up too fast and knocked yourself cold on the underside of the mantelpiece? Well, what other explanation is there, Rod? Well, it is solid oak. And that big, round, ornamental sphere is a menace. <laughs> I've regretted it every time I've bumped my own head on it. Yeah, but, Dad, you never hit your head hard enough to knock yourself cold. Mike... Why were you making a fire at that time in the morning? Well, I wasn't actually making one. I was replacing one. Uh, Professor Azarek was, was with me last night, coaching me for an exam I have coming up. And, uh, well, he got cold. Oh, come on. It wasn't cold enough for a fire last night. Well, maybe when you went to bed. But we were up all night. And the professor's a pretty old man. What were you doing up at that hour in the morning, Dad? Well, I really don't know. Something woke me and I... Are you all right, Reverend Jays? Oh, excuse me, Trudy, dear. Yes, uh, yes, I'm fine. I'm just recalling that moment this morning. How vivid it was. I was startled out of the depths of my sleep to wide awakeness. I had a vision of Mike surrounded by flames. It was so real, I even said a little prayer. Then I hopped out of bed... Went to the window. It wasn't very dark anymore. And looking across, I could see that all the studio lights were on and the front door open. And I 
Thought I'd better go and have a look. And when you got there, you found Mike on the floor unconscious? Yes. Lying on his face, white as a sheet, and deathly cold. Oh. Yeah, but what made you call the hospital? It's not like you to panic. Well, I realized that, but, but the back of his head looked as though he'd been felled by some superhuman male fist. It, it was all bent, bent inward. I thought the hospital said Mike was all right. Oh, I am, Trudy. A clean bill of health. Nothing to worry about. Uh, my fault. It must have been an illusion, of course. Well, I think if the Inquisition is over, I'm going to make up on some sleep. Hmm? Oh, the damn cat! I'd forgotten about her. Will you keep her in there away from me? What's the matter with her? It's been a very strange night and morning... And I have a hauntingly uneasy feeling. You mean about Mike? About Mike. I hope the hospital was right to give him a clean bill of health. He doesn't seem himself at all. Not at all. Hello. Hello. Azarek? Michael. What the hell happened last night? Okay, okay. Not on the phone. I'm going to rest now. But you be sure to be here tonight. So far in our modern legend, we have caught up with superstition, witches, magic, both black and white, enchantment, spells, abracadabra. Well, there are two more acts to come. I'll be back very shortly with Act Two. St. Louis. Who will cope with tomorrow for a brighter new day? There's one hope for tomorrow, the children of today. Information, write Save the Children, Box 120, Grand Central Station, New York. A young man rushed to the hospital with a depressed fracture of the skull, which should have mangled his brain. A chronic drunken repeater back in emergency on the edge of fatal acute alcoholism. And an aging cleaning woman who thought she saw a malign spirit pass from the drunk to the young man. Now, apparently in full health, we'll be able to appraise just how healthy the young man who made his remarkable recovery is. You're right there. Professor Azarick, please come in. And... Must you be so formal? After last night and today, I'm taking no chances. Maybe with your superior intelligence, you have no worries about our abortive attempt at Satanism. But I have. 
Look, I was the victim, and since a crack on the head denied me any knowledge of what happened, I'm only hoping you can give me the straight goods. Uh, the straight goods. A peculiarly inept term for what we are engaged in, my brother in Satan. God damn it, it's not a deal in semantics, Anton. Now, what happened after I summoned up the fiend? I mean, how did you escape, and how could I have been harmed? As long as I was safe in the magic triangle within the circle. I warned you to keep your feet still. If you touch any part of the circle itself or the triangle within it, you are at the mercy of all the devils in hell. And if I'd known what I was getting into when I picked your philosophy course, I'd have quit. You made the mistake of not realizing how vulnerable your soul was as the son of a minister. All right, all right. I'm not crying over what happened. I just want to know what it was. Now, where was I? By the fireplace, lying prostrate. The way you fell after he hit you. Who hit me? The devil you summoned. But where did he appear? Outside the circle here. The inner or the outer? Beyond the outer, of course. There was water scattered between the circles. And the wolf's bane scattered through it. And within the circle, you had the brazier burning. Everything as you ordered it and arranged it. Yes, but... But what went wrong? Your ego. My ego? What does that mean? You lost your head. Or at least almost did. This was a simple experiment by someone who seemed a true psychic to raise a minor antichrist. The motive was strong enough to create belief. Or at least the hope of belief. You wanted a familiar to procure your brother's woman for you. Beshal, you were to call forth. Why did you call on Ashtaroth, a giantess beyond your control? I... I don't know. But do I have to explain? No, no. Ever since you became my disciple... You told me that you have lusted after the woman your brother brought home as his bride. The only thing I've never been able to take from Rod whenever I wanted him. When you finished the incantation and summoned Ashtaroth, I thought the house would come down about our ears. The earth rocked like the San Francisco quake. And suddenly she stood without the circle, a huge figure in chain mail and medieval armor. Meddler and slave, she said. How dare you summon me for your petty desires? Learn this lesson once, if not for all. Turn your face from me in shame. And as you turned, she reached out with her mailed glove and struck you on the top and back of your head. You dropped like a stone. Across the magic circles? They weren't designed for major devils. You swore no presence could cross them. Nothing but her arm and her fist. But it's five feet from that outer circle to the center of the triangle where I was standing. I told you the circle was for lesser demons. What happened after she struck me? The spirit disappeared. The room was clogged with smoke. I opened the door to let it out and came back to you. You had fallen almost into the fireplace. I pulled the rug back, arranged the furniture as best I could, and fled. I thought you were dead. Oh, <laughs> I'm alive. Yes, yes, but it's not possible. When I left you just before sunrise, you were dead. What witchcraft can do, it can undo. Whoever and whatever I am, I'm alive. Make no mistake about that. Goodbye, Anton. I don't need you anymore. Oh, hi, Trudy. I thought you'd gone with Rod and Dad. Oh, hello, Mike. I thought you were over in the studio. <laughs> we ran out of beer. Ah, you're out of luck. <laughs> Rod's bringing some home. Well, I found something more refreshing. What? You. <laughs> oh, if you'd waited just a little longer, you'd have found me anyway. 
I was going to wander over to the studio and visit you. Oh, so that's why you stayed home. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. Someone had to wash the dishes. <laughs> as long as I'm house guest, I thought I ought to do something for my keep. Well, you're staying here tonight? One whole week. Mom went up with Pops to his 35th class reunion. And they figured that with one full-fledged minister and a recent hospital dropout... I was suitably chaperoned. <laughs> Safe as a church, huh? <laughs> uh, Rod and Dad say uh, when they'd be back? Uh, not till pretty late, I guess. Mm. Pretty rough section of town. That's why Rod insisted on going along. Mm. What's the occasion? That's one of your father's oldest parishioners. I guess the old lady is dying. She asked for the minister. Well, her loss, my gain. What? Oh, nothing. It's just a stupid joke. Uh, you said you wanted to see the studio? Oh, yes. Would you mind? Mind? Uh, look, I I'm out of beer, but uh, I've got some champagne that's begging to be what it is. Oh, what is it? A split. Just right for sharing. Shall we go? <laughs> Well, won't you walk into my parlor, said Beelzebub to the flies. <laughs> oh, no, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> that is the advantage of a classical education. Uh -huh. Beelzebub, god of the Philistine city of Ekron. You know, he was known as the lord of the flies. Why? Well, now, there you've got me. Uh-oh, he, he sounds horrid. <laughs> well, he wasn't very popular with Christians. In fact, they called him the Prince of Devils. Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it gives me the creeps. <laughs> Here's something to chase your creeps away. Oh, I, I don't want that, Mike. It goes right to my head. Oh, just a sip. Hmm? A good luck toast to sister and brother-in-law Hood. Our getting to know you party. Well, far be it from me to be a party pooper. Uh... There's nothing more cozy and reassuring than a room full of books. What's this section here? Oh, that? That's the main reason I needed Dad's particular library since my exam was in metaphysics. The black arts, the world of witches, essentials of demonology, the satanic mass. Oh, it's a strange collection for a minister. Well, it's always good to know your enemy. You know, Dad's quite an authority on the devil and his work. And you? Are you thinking of becoming a minister, Mike? <laughs> minister? Me? <laughs> no, 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 no. Perish the thought. No, nope, my philosophy is too easy for that. I long ago decided that if you can't fight him, join him. I mean, can't you see how evil I am? Attempting you with spiritous beverages, coaxing you here to my lair, and now having anesthetized my prey, making ready... To spring. I don't think you're being very funny, Mike. Oh, is this where you hit your head? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, so they say. No, I wasn't being altogether funny. What do you mean? Truly, have you any idea how jealous I am of my older brother? Of Rod? Why? A month ago, or whenever it was, they turned up with you. My first thought was... Why couldn't I find something like that? Oh, that's very flattering, Mike. But you're a little young for the big step. Not so young as you think. Perhaps. I don't care what you and Rod have been to each other. It was me you wanted. Still want. Only you're afraid of breaking your word. This is a joke. It's no joke. Mike, let's... Go of me. You wanted me from the moment you laid eyes on me, just as I have you. Oh, you've been reading too many naughty books. Don't laugh. There's nothing funny about this. No, not really. Offensive. You're afraid of me. Don't be silly. Afraid of yourself. Now that really is the last Test it, draw. Test it. Fasten your mouth to mine. Wind yourself about me. Try forbidden love, and it will never let you go. No, Mike, let me go. You're, you're hurting me. <laughs> oh, that's Rod home with your father. If you will let me go, I'll scream. What are you going to tell them? Nothing. Nothing. I wouldn't want them to know what a pig you are. I think that blow on the head must have done more damage than you think. Mike, you better see a psychiatrist. Oh, hi, Rod. Dad. Uh, well, we didn't expect you. Esther, my Lucifer, I'll have you yet. 
cowering at my feet like a slave. To use you once and destroy you. As I shall use your surrogate tonight. Whoever she may be. Oh, dear, oh, dear. How best you. What, Reverend Damon? Just something that happened to a girl on the other side of town. Let me see. Rachel. Oh, awful. Well, now you got me going. <laughs> uh, you too, Jean. Well, since you can't read, I'll read it to you. The body of Elizabeth Migler, 21, was discovered in Marsden Park today by a passerby. Although it was later determined the girl had been raped, the strange features of the case are that she was not robbed, and as though by some ferocious animal tooth marks showed that her throat had been literally ripped to pieces. Good Lord. Where, where is Marsden Park? Uh, clear over the other side of town. When did it happen? Uh, night before last. Morning, all. I hope breakfast is all ready. I'm famished. What's wrong with that cat? Oh, it's beginning to bug me. A lot of things are beginning to bug me. What did you say, honey? Uh, nothing, Rod. I, I, I don't think I'll have any breakfast this morning. I, I don't feel like eating. No, Rod, please, don't come with me. I'd rather be alone. Lovers quarrel? Look, will you just take out, brother mine? It's none of your business. For Trudy's sake, for everyone's sake, would that it were. But, unfortunately, we know better. Or do we? The crime happened miles away. And the devil that may possess Mike is there only on the evidence of a tipsy charwoman. Who summons the devil, never calls for him in vain, and once met, few are lucky to get rid of him again. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Give your hand to a friend Give your heart to your love But give your cold <laughs> To contract The sooner the better The common cold is a rotten thing You miss so much Sneezing, drips, and congestion can drag you down Then, ask yourself the contact question Six or three or one You'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact for up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms. That's daytime, then nighttime relief. Both the others have things for aches and fever, and the liquid, something for coughs. Not found in contact 600 tiny time pills. Here's your cold to contact. Six or three or one. Take contact. Only as directed. help make the sun start shining again through the United Nations Children's Fund. This is Bill Anderson, asking you to be generous when the neighborhood youngsters come to your door to trick-or-treat for UNICEF this Halloween. Please drop a few coins in their little orange boxes and help UNICEF bring better food, medical care, and education to millions of needy children. In the kitchen of the Damon house, Rod glares angrily at his brother, who shrugs it off and goes to the refrigerator for orange juice. A troubled Reverend Damon eyes both his sons as he closes and folds the tabloid in his hands as if it were just as unclean as it is. Rod, unchallenged by Mike, breaks the silence first. 
I better go on upstairs and check on Trudy. Well, she said she wanted to be alone. Look, will you stay out of this? Well, I'm not even in it. Uh, just an objective comment. So keep it to yourself. Now, come on, Rod. I didn't mean to butt in. Catch me up. What's all the hostility about? No hostility. Just a reaction to a peculiarly unpleasant crime. I think I'll go up and apologize to Trudy for spoiling everyone's breakfast. That's a good idea, Dad. If I can leave you two alone. Well, I have no quarrel with anyone. Now, forget it, Dad. I just got upset over Trudy. I I shouldn't have jumped on Mike. Well, then, let me see if I can make our future in-law a little happier in our house. What happened, Rod? Oh, it all started over this tabloid story about some poor kid who got raped and mangled on Mars and Park. Oh? Here, read all about it. <whistles> kind of gruesome, all right. But there's one of these every day. Yeah, but not in such gory detail. It really got to Trudy. You know, I've never seen her upset like that. I mean, so, so subjectively involved. Oh? What do you suppose triggered that? Oh, I don't know. I just sure wish I did. Or maybe it's better to let sleeping dogs lie. Who is it? Your future father-in-law. May I come in for a minute? Just a sec. The door's locked. Uh, come on in, Reverend Damon. Feeling any better? Oh... Not really. Oh, I should be ashamed of myself reading that yellow sheet. I, I like to think it helps keep my sense of balance, but uh, maybe I'm just a seeker of vicarious excitement. Like that rather complete collection on Satanism and the occult that you have in your studio? Ah, you noticed that, did you? Night before last. When I was over there with Mike while you and Rod had gone to see your old parishioner who was dying. Did she... As a matter of fact, no. She made a remarkable recovery. Oh, really? Well, you look so sort of worried when you came home. I, I thought she... I was worried about you, Trudy. And Mike. Why? You, because I knew you were upset about something. Well, you can't be a minister for over 40 years without learning to read something about people. And Mike? Mike is an enigma to me since I brought him back from the hospital. A rather terrifying thought to realize I've lost contact with my own son. I'd like to ask your help, Trudy, and I'll lay it right on the line. Why were you at the studio with him? And what happened there? You, you won't tell Rod? Not if you don't want me to. And what I'd like more than anything is to tell someone, most of all you, for Mike's sake. Because I think he needs help. And you're the only one who could bring it to him. Or make him go find it. Well, Reverend Damon, this is a pleasure. I'm on my way to a class. Can we talk as we cross campus? Yes, just, uh, what is the name of your course that Mike is taking? Philosophy. Uh, perhaps more specifically, metaphysics. Rather freewheeling. I mean, it's, it's advanced and we spend more time on the perimeters than we do on the core subjects. Hmm. Just what were you and Mike up to that long night before his injury? I was coaching him for an examination. An examination in what? On what subject? By the class I teach, general philosophy. And you left before Michael was hurt? Oh, good Lord, yes. Would I have left the boy if he were injured? Would you have fled the scene unless you were up to something dark and vile enough to stain your reputation? I am sorry your boy was hurt. I had no part in it. I resent your holier-than-thou accusations. If you'll excuse me, I have a class waiting for me. And now for the rug. There. Does it? 
Oh, my dear Lord. Just what I was afraid of. What are you afraid of, Dad? You, Mike. That you turned away from God to seek the devil. Why, Mike? Why? Who knows? Now, what shall I tell you, hmm? That life's a drag, it has no purpose, no goals, no triumphs that aren't tarnished. That there's no good in man. Nothing but pettiness and meanness and me first and the devil take the hindmost. That's not what I brought you up to believe. No one blames you, Dad. That Trudy was the last straw. That Rod could find the woman he wanted and she could turn out to be the one that I need. So I chose his worship. And here we built my altar. Don't desecrate that name. The altar belongs to God. This altar belongs to Satan. See the circle traced in vermilion paint? Exactly nine feet wide, an eight-foot charcoal one within. Light the votive candles, burn the incense, let the mass begin. Mike, what are you doing? I won't tolerate this the sacrilege. You can no more move than the woman I desire can resist my power. I am the way. I am the darkness. I am the truth. Lord of the universe whom the winds fear. I am he whose mouth ever flameth. You Answer me, the I invoke, the bornless one that did create the darkness and the light. Thee I command to serve me and send me the woman I desire. Truly, don't come in here. But the rain. What's going on here? Rod, it's your brother. He's gone mad. Spawn of the outer world. Stay back. Stay back. I will smite thee dead where thou standest. Leave or leave except the woman who is mine. Dad, what's going on? Look out. He's going for Trudy. Now, look, thank you. Dad, he hasn't died. Would you murder your own brother? Okay, that's enough yeah. pulling around. Ah! Don't you know I could always take you? Oh, Rod, I hope you haven't hurt him too much. Oh, don't worry, baby. He always had a glass jaw. He had something... More perishable than that. Call the hospital. And better tell them to bring a straitjacket. The top of the night to you, Mrs. Gideon. And what's that wee bottle in the paper bag? A little poteen? Nothing of a sort, Dr. Smart Attic. <laughs> That's a noggin of holy water blessed by me on Monsignor, which I carry with me when I come near this place ever since three days ago. What happened to old P.J.? Did anyone ever turn up to claim him? No. Oh, by the way, while we're on the gossip column, uh, guess who's back in the hospital? Oh, not the other one. Mm Mm-hmm, the same. Lying in the emergency room under a deep sedation in a straitjacket. Oh, what did they bring him back here for? That's what Dr. Considine and his father, the Reverend Damon, are discussing now in the prep room. Well, if you're going to swap out the emergency, you'd better get at it fast. Well, I'll tell you something, Doctor. Hmm? If I'm to be there and alone with that devil, you'll never see emergency this clean again. For I imagine the Monsignor's holy water to me pale right now, just in case. Of course, we'll run every neurological test in the book on him under the circumstances, Reverend Avon. I'm not sure it will do any good. I'm afraid the trouble is psychiatric. Well, it has to be one or the other unless we're to accept Mrs. Gideon's diagnosis of possession. Mrs. Gideon? Oh, I remember now. She was one of the people, like the intern, who remembered that they thought they saw a considerable skull compression. Which never existed, believe me. Just a, an illusion like Mrs. Gideon's. What was Mrs. Gideon's illusion? Well, I'm afraid she'd uh, had a drink or two and she had some wild story about a black devil streaming out of an old dipsomaniac who was also in the emergency room and and being sucked up through your son's nostrils. Uh, (laughs) I'm really even embarrassed to mention such nonsense. Come in. Excuse me, Dr. Considine, but the patient is coming too. 
Mr. Damon? Yes, sir. He's still in the straitjacket. I, uh... I think, Reverend, if you don't mind until we see what state he's in... I don't mind. You might as well both know that the police are by now well aware that my... my son was responsible for the violent death of a young woman the night before last while under the possession of whatever devils or devil owns him. Shall we go? By Nurgle and Thomas and Belfagor, no one can him reel. I am Belair, Lord of the Flies, and your bonds cannot hold me! Good Lord, he's out of the straitjacket. I'll get help. What's going on here, Mrs. Gooding? Oh, the Lord preserve us. It's the devil incarnate. Oh, stay away from him, Doctor. He'll burn you to a crisp with his fiery breath. All of you, stay away from him. Leave him to me. Michael, my son. Call me not by that filthy angel's name. Stay away, old man. For I carry death in my hand as a sword. Michael! I warned you. Oh, you administer man of the cloth. Get back. Get back! What happened? Oh, sure it was the Monsignor's holy water. Just as strong as life. Michael, no. All right, boys. Get All right, in. Daniels, you're too late. What? Excuse me, Reverend. Let me see. Daniels, come here. Hey, yes, sir. Was that the depression you were talking about when this man was first brought in? Yes, sir. That's what I thought I saw. Well, at least it's what we all see now. But how? I haven't any answers. I only know... <laughs> I'm sorry, Reverend Damon, but your son is... is dead. He hasn't been my son since his first visit here. The mercy of God is that whatever possessed him died with him. Thanks to this lady here. Oh, if I hadn't had the holy water, I... Oh, the Lord does move in mysterious ways. Don't he, Reverend Sir? <laughs> In mysterious ways and kind ones. What a field day the Reverend Damon's tabloids might have had if Michael had ever come to trial for the death of that poor innocent girl. Innocent. Perhaps that's the theme of this dark history. If Michael had been less innocent and had had the guts to be less self-interested and bored... How different his world might have been. But that's the answer, isn't it? We all make our own world. We can't rely on anyone else to make it for us. I'll be back shortly. Here's a medical puzzle. A person has a deadly disease, yet leads a normal life. How is it possible? The answer is chemotherapy. Through this treatment, thousands of cancer victims regain active, productive lives despite their cancer. Many of these people can continue in their jobs for years, while the anti-cancer drugs, which we call chemotherapy, control their disease. But many types of cancer remain difficult to control. Through research, the Chemotherapy Foundation is stimulating the development of new drugs. More types of cancers will someday be controlled. The question is not if... But when? You can help by contributing to the Chemotherapy, that's Chemo, C-H-E-M-O, Therapy Foundation, Box 8, New York, New York, 128. That's the Chemotherapy Foundation, Box 8, New York, New York, 128. This is a public service message from the Chemotherapy Foundation. I suppose I should resist the impulse, but I have to admit I can't. It's one of the rewards for being host, particularly with guests who can't answer back, at least directly. So just for once, a homily. Reach out and find life. 
take it and make the most of it. For if nothing else, our story proves to the hilt the oldest of adages. If you don't, the devil finds work for idle hands to do. Our cast included Donald Buca, Joan Shea, Ian Martin, Guy Sorrell, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. No trouble, though. He went numb pretty fast. I thought he would. He wanted me to give you a message, but then he couldn't remember what it was. Oh, uh, and he thinks you're some kind of a warden, poor man. You know, Mr. Z, I didn't much like it inside that room. You knew you were coming out. Who ever dreamed up the black room anyway? I've no idea. Somebody must have. There's always been a black room, far as I know. Hell of a place. Yes. How long will he last, do you think? Matter of days. Weeks, possibly. Then what? He'll go mad. Or die. Wonder what he's doing now. Oh, counting by twos, then by threes, then by fours. Anything to keep from thinking. That's what they all do. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Got an old corpse kicking around you want identified? Know of any good murders you want solved? We've got just the girl for you. Her name is Candy Matson. Mighty cute, too. She fills out a size 12 suit to just the right proportions. Soft blonde hair, two sparkling blue eyes, and all in all, she looks as though she might have stepped right off a of Varga calendar. And what's more, she's a private eye. You scoff? You ridicule? I'll let you see for yourselves. Listen, she's talking on the phone right now. Hello, Candy Matson. Hello, Miss Matson. I'm afraid you don't know me. That makes it even. You don't know me. Let's go from there. I've read about you in the papers, Miss Matson. You handle confidential cases. That's right. However, there's a little matter of a fee involved. Yes, yes, I know. I can pay. That's item number one. Now to item number two. What's the confidential case? I can't possibly tell you on the phone, Miss Matson. I said it was confidential. Mm, okay. Where do you want to talk? I am the proprietor of a restaurant, the Charlemagne in North Beach. Oh, yeah. I ate there once. Oh, that's nice. No, it wasn't. I didn't like the food. Oh. However, I'll overlook it. Do you want to talk in about an hour? That will be fine, Miss Matson. Good. And your name would be... Martinello. Carlo Martinello. Okay, Mr. Martinello. And uh, have some ink in your pen. It costs money just to talk. <laughs> I probably sounded rough and commercial, but you have to be in this racket. Most people look on a private eye as a musician. They invite you to a party and expect you to bring your harp for free. But uh uh-uh. I learned the hard way a long time ago. So now they pay in advance and take their chances later. That's the way it was with this Martinello. I was at home in my penthouse on Telegraphy a lot on the porch taking a sun bath. 
and the phone rings, and it's this Carlo character. That part was all right, because I can always use new customers. But what made me mad was the fact that I had to stop listening to the 49ers belt the bejabers out of the Cleveland Browns at Keysar Stadium. But I followed through and uncovered a couple of very done-in bodies along the way. Do you like the grotesque in your whodunit? Then follow me and we'll tiptoe lightly through the tibbets, the ponds, and the baccalonies. Because part of the story unfolds at the opera house. Reluctantly, I dressed into something Charlemagne-ish, turned off the 49ers Cleveland game, and went down to talk to Martinello. His place was typical, located on Powell Street, a garish neon sign, and as you walked in, the air place was air conditioned by eau de garlic. Yes, miss. You wish a table? I wish a table, yes. With the right party, I'm looking for the owner. I am the owner. I am Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson. Walk this way, please. If I could walk that way, I'd revive vaudeville. Pardon? Uh, where is your office? Right over here. Allow me. After you, signorina. Thank you, senor. Here, sit down, please. Thanks. Now, Martinello, what's on your mind? Always, all my life, I have run a very nice, respectable place. Mm-hmm. Until this morning. What's with this morning? I go down to the basement. My icebox is down there. That is where I keep all my meat. So, you wanted some ground round? Oh, no, no. I... Perhaps I'd better show you. Please, you will come with me. <laughs> Martinello led the way out of his office and down a flight of stairs. A cold blast hit my face. A musty aroma smothered my nostrils, and if I had had a phobia about darkness, I'd have ducked out then. But I followed the guy, and we ended up in front of a refrigerator about the size of an inquisition chamber. He opened the door, and it was the usual restaurant icebox, choice legs of lamb hanging from hooks, potential fillets, and thick New York cuts. The box was cold, and I started to shiver. Not from the refrigeration, though, because over in the corner was a man. He looked like something out of a long-lost Arctic expedition. He had a long, flowing mustache, every bristle of which was coated with ice. He was quite frozen and quite dead. I slammed the door shut and reeled out. The sight had staggered my thought processes. Martinello reached over by a salami slicing table and turned on a Mazda. A weak affair that cast dim shadows about the damp basement. Is that your little surprise? Yes, Mr. Matson. That is what I was greeted with this morning. Have you notified the police? Oh, no, no, no. Why not? As I told you, I have run a very respectable place. And, too, that is why I am hiring you. You can get in trouble, you know. Yes, yes, that is why you must help me. Please, please, Miss Matson, say you will help me. I will pay you anything you say. I stick my neck out in the strangest places. Now it's a refrigerator. Okay, Martinello, $2,000. What? Make up your mind. Either I freeze your assets or the police find your frozen friend. Yes. All right. Come. I give you the money now. Now we're getting somewhere. What about him? Oh, he'll keep. He's on ice. Well, this was one for the books. Refrigeration the ugly way. I had to ask a few questions if I was to get anywhere. Such as like, do you know the guy? No. Had you ever seen him before? No. Who was the last one to close the icebox last night? I was. Does it lock from the inside? Unfortunately, yes. I was getting places like Wiley was with Hauser. It was inevitable. I had to take my courage in my hand and go down and look at that thing again. There it was, a male Mona Lisa etched in ice. This time I looked closer, I had to. And as I did, I realized I wasn't going to get any identification because this guy was a study in crimson. Underneath all that coating of ice, he was dressed in a devil's costume. I slammed the door once again and went upstairs. There I gave Martinello strict orders not to do a thing. Usually in cases like this, you have to wait for a break. They come along like a forcing hand in poker. So I went home to do some thinking. As I arrived, there was an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Hello, Dove. I'd almost given up. 
Rembrandt, how did you get in? Your door was open, dear. I took the liberty of coming in. Oh, sure, that's okay. How are things, Candy? All right, I guess. I'm kind of bush, though. I feel about as devaluated as a British pound. You look wonderful, doll. What's wrong? I've got a deal, but I don't know where to start. Anything I can help you with? No, thanks, Rembrandt. If I told you about it, you wouldn't believe it. I've never doubted you in the past, dear. I know. Well, I was just called in by a minestrone merchant in North Beach. The guy is stuck with a corpse. That's about par for the course. The deceased had been sealed in the icebox overnight. I've never seen one like that before. That's the way it is, dear. Many are called, but few are frozen. Oh, get out of here. But, Dove, I just got here. I know, but I've got to change and get down to see Mallard. I'll wait for you, Candy. I haven't seen the gumshoe since before me vacation. All right. I'll be with you in a few moments. I did a fast change, and Rembrandt and I climbed into my car, and we dropped off Telegraph Hill on Don Kearney Street. The Hall of Justice, where Mallard hangs his star, is only a few blocks away, so we made it in about five minutes. Inspector Ray Mallard, homicide, San Francisco police. A lovable, shaggy dog type of character. Very keen with the crime, but dumb with the dame. Me, for instance. If I want him to say yes, he says no, and vice versa. Well, my ever-loving candy. What's new in the private eye business? Very little. How's the legitimate fat foot racket? Oh, we're holding our arches up. Well, and Rembrandt, I haven't seen you since Pup was a Hector. Please, Inspector, you're metting your mixer paws. Who writes this dialogue? I'm pretty weak, I know. What's on your mind, Candy? A character named Carlo Martinello. Have you got anything on him? <laughs> What's so funny, Mallory? <laughs> nothing, except I eat lunch there about every day of the week. Well, answer my question. Well, there's nothing on Martinello. Arrested a couple of times during Prohibition. He was dabbling in grappa a lot under the table. Have you got a case against the guy, Detective Matson? Oh, cut it out. No, seriously. Why do you want to check on the guy, Candy? No reason. Just thought I'd ask. Uh-huh. Well, Martinello's okay. Just trying to make a living. Only thing I don't like, he loves to sing to his customers. <laughs> That'd be enough to bankrupt him right there. Anything else I can do? No, that takes care of everything. I tell you what, I'm through in about an hour. I'll take you up to Martinello's for dinner. You can see for yourself. No, 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 that, that, that's all right. Okay, Candy. Give. Why, Mallard, dear, what on earth do you mean? You know something about something. I want in. Mallard, and, and I want you to believe this. I mean it sincerely. If I knew something, you'd be the last to know about it. He's got something there. Come now, believe us a while. I hate to do things like that to Mallard. He's been of great help to me in the past. More than once, he's saved my life. But on a deal like this, you have to play it close. After all, a girl has to make a living. For the first time in a long time, I was completely baffled as to where to start. Something had to be done about that cadaver in the icebox, but what? While I was beetling my eyebrows, Rembrandt invited me up to his place for tea. He lives on California Street, just down away from old St. Mary's, and only a bail bond broker's reach from the Hall of Justice. So I accepted. You do forgive the looks of the place, Candy, dear. I had a meeting my philatelist group last night. Philatelists? The stamp collectors, dear. Oh, I know what they are, but I didn't think they could make such a mess. You don't know philatelists. <laughs> Sit down, though. Make yourself comfortable. I shan't be a moment. That's all right. And Candy, dear, why the wrinkles? I've got cause for wrinkles. This chap in the icebox, Rembrandt. There's something I didn't tell you. He was dressed in a devil's costume. There, there, dear. Your tea will ready in just a minute. You'll feel better. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. What are you going to do, Candy? I don't know. I can't leave him in that refrigerator forever. Well, get him out, dear. I hate to think of a corpse catching pneumonia. Oh, excuse me, Candy. Help yourself to the tea. Mm -hmm. How do you do? Rembrandt Watson Enterprises. <laughs> Quiet, darling. Who? Oh, hello, Templeton. How are all your steamships? Oh, that's good. What? Could I use do what? To the opera? Of course I could. Righto, I'll pick them up at your office. Thank you, Templeton. Goodbye. Candy, dear, do you like the opera? I can take it or leave it. Why? It suddenly develops that I have two tickets tomorrow night for Tales of Hoffman. Oh, Rembrandt, I don't think I come, can Come, come, Candy. It'll do you good. You've been working too hard. You need a little relaxation. Tales of Hoffman, hmm? Okay. Who's the pal who gave them to you? An old friend of mine, Templeton Woodruff. 
He runs a steamship to Java and other places Ezio Pinza sings about. I finished the tea and left. Right then, the only opera I could think of was the one going on in an icebox at Martinello's. I've always tried to play straight with Ray Mallard, so I decided to tell Martinello my plan. Miss Mudson, I don't think it's such a good idea Good evening, to... Carlo. I want to talk to you. That's what I mean. There's a gentleman here who... Oh, you've got a gentleman. That's fine. Three more and you've got a crowd. What I want to talk to you about is you this. You don't understand. The gentleman I'm talking about is from the police. The police? Yeah. Hello, Candy. Mallard. How about some scallopini? Well, up jumped the... Hello, Mallard, dear. I had an idea you'd like dinner here tonight. Uh, do you know my boy, Carlo? Yes, yes, we've met. How do you do? How do you do? The signorina wish something to eat? No. No, thanks. I want to talk to you, though, Mallard. Sure. Come on into my booth. We'll share some salami. No, no, thanks. I want to see you downstairs. I don't think the food's as good down there. I agree, but it isn't the food. I'm talking about murder. Once again, I headed down into the catacombs of the Charlemagne. This time, the act was a double. Mallard was right behind me. Then I looked around. We were a trio. Martinello was right behind Mallard. This is it. This is what? This is an icebox. Inside, you'll find a body dressed in a devil's costume. Okay, Carlo, let's humor the lady. Open the thing, will you? I... Yes. I'll open it. Lovely view of the beef. It's gone. The body's gone. Okay, Martinello, start talking and make some sense while you're doing it. Please, Miss Matson. I don't know anything. I haven't been down here all day. Get rid of those arched eyebrows, Martinello. You know something. What is it? Wait a minute, Candy. I'll do the questioning. In the first place, Carlo, was there or was there not a body in here? I... Well... Sure there was. He can't deny it. Here's a check for $2,000 signed by Martinello himself. Well, Carlo? Yes. There was a body, all right. Who was it? A friend of yours? No, Inspector. I never saw him before. Why did you call Miss Matson? Why didn't you come to see me about it? Well, you know, Inspector, the police... Uh, just because you were once arrested for bootlegging, Carlo, is no reason to be afraid of the police. Uh, well, I'll put a couple of my men on the job and see what we can turn up. What? Is that all you're going to do, Mallard? No. Right now, I'm going back upstairs and have some of Carlo's scallopini. Mallard, are you out of your head? Look, Candy, in order to have a murder case, you've got to have a body. Obviously, we're fresh out. And until your pal with the devil's costume turns up, I intend to live my typical everyday life. Don't forget the mushrooms, Carlo. There are times when I get so mad at Mallard, I want to scream. I didn't, though. I only scrammed. I hung on to the 2,000, however. I felt I deserved it just for getting my curiosity aroused, and it was aroused plenty. Corpses don't get up and walk out of ice boxes by themselves. But after all, Mallard had a point. There was nothing to be done without a body. So I went home and waded into a stack of dirty dishes that had been piling up. Then I fixed dinner and started a new stack of dirty dishes. Got a book and ducked into bed. In the morning, I had an idea. After breakfast, I went down to the corner of Broadway and Columbus. That's where North Beach does a neat blend with Chinatown. On the corner was a Joe who sold newspapers. I'd known him for some time, and he seemed to like me. Hiya, Butch. Well, hello there, lady. How are you? Good. Can't complain. Who won the football game yesterday? Yeah, uh, funny thing. I got all the news right inside here for seven cents. Mm, I get your point. Give me a chronicle, will you? Sure. Here. Thanks. Who do you like in the feature of Bay Meadows? A goat named Candy. What? What did you say? There's a pig named Candy running in the seventh. Take it or leave it. What a tip. I don't get it. Well, what's really on your mind, lady? Here. Here's a 20. You can play it on Candy all for yourself. Well. Do you know a gent named Martinello Butch? Mm. He owns the Charlemagne down the block. Sure. What about him? That's what I'm asking you. What about him? Oh, he's all right. A little screwy, but he keeps his nose clean. Is that all? Yeah. Should there be more? I don't know. Thanks, Butch. I hope Candy pays off.
I was getting nowhere, that was for sure, and the rest of the day went the same way. Dead ends, blind alleys. I checked as many loose ends as I possibly could, but I was still stuck in a quandary. But the crusher claim late in the afternoon when I got a copy of the late paper and read where Candy came in at Bay Meadows and paid thirty-two twenty, And I hadn't had sense enough to get aboard. When I got home, the phone was ringing. Hello, Candy Matson. Oh, you're Candy Matson. I should play a fanfare. Oh, hello, Rembrandt, dear. How are you? Like an October morning. Every single one of me paws is breathing great, huge gulps of air. What? I just had a facial dove. Most invigorating. Uh, what on earth for? I loved your old pores just the way they were. Candy, you've forgotten. I have? Forgotten what, Rembrandt? We're going to the opera tonight. Oh, Ducky, I'm sorry. I had forgotten. I'm afraid I'll have to renege. Now, Candy, you promised. And I don't care what you're involved in. It'll do you good. But, Rembrandt, I'm working on it. Perhaps you're right. Okay, I'll get ready. Wonderful, dear. Pick me up about a quarter of eight, will you? Pick you up a quarter of eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and another thing, Lamb. We may have to do some entertaining afterward. Uh, do bring some cash, will you? Mm-hmm. That's the girl. <laughs> That Rembrandt, always stony broke. I guess photography isn't what it's cracked up to be. I didn't mind, though. He's been a friend to me on more than one occasion. Well, if I was going to the opera, I had to start thinking in operatic terms. I fished around in the closet and came up with something that would have done any woman's heart good. One of those strapless affairs that you can't stop breathing in for one moment, otherwise the opera is no longer the main attraction. I powdered perfume, pouted and rouged, and took off after Rembrandt. But just as I started to leave... Just a moment. Well, get a load of the Duchess. Mm-hmm. It won't be Halloween for another couple of weeks yet. Oh, very funny. Come on in, Millard. What are you decked out for, Candy? Something you wouldn't understand. I'm going to the opera. Oh, I love the opera. Any horse opera with Tex Acuff in it. That's what I thought. What's on your mind, Mallard? I've got to pick up Rembrandt in ten minutes. Well, I was just driving by, so I thought I'd stop and tell you the news. News? About what? We found El Diablo. The guy in the icebox? Yeah. Martinello identified him. He was floating in the water off Aquatic Park. Any lead on him? The best. He was Salavini, the second baritone with the opera company. That's all, Candy. I hope you enjoy the performance tonight. <laughs> A baritone with the opera company. Well, that explained the costume, but it didn't explain a lot of other things. I walked down the stairs with Mallard. He got in his squad car, flicked on the flashing red light, and with a burst of his siren, rolled down the street. I'd have to speak to Mallard about that. All the neighbors had their heads out of their windows as I climbed into my car and followed. What an exit. I picked up Rembrandt, and we drove up to the Civic Center. I found a place to park. A minor miracle. The last time I went to the opera, I had to drive almost to Palo Alto and come back by train. Rembrandt's friend must have been very influential. We had seats in the Diamond Horseshoe. They were presenting Tales of Hoffman, and a friend of mine, Dorothy Warrenchild, was singing the role of Antonia. It was a fine performance, and after the last curtain, I took Rembrandt, and we went backstage to see Dorothy. <laughs> This is your dressing room, Rembrandt. Yes? Hello, Dorothy. This is Candy Metz, and I have a friend with me. Oh, do come in, please, Candy. Candy, how are you? Couldn't be better. Dorothy, may I present Mr. Watson? Rembrandt, this is Miss Warrenchold. I'm delighted. You're in magnificent voice tonight, dear, dear. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? I've only a moment. We're rehearsing some of the scenes in Faust tonight. Rehearsing after a full evening's performance? It has to be done, Candy. Our baritone disappeared. We've had to replace him with a new man. Yes, yes, I know. By the way, Dorothy, I heard you on your Standard Hour broadcast a few weeks ago. It was a wonderful performance. I'm glad you liked it, Candy. I always look forward to those. What are your plans, Dorothy? Well, the season closes here, and then we open in Los Angeles. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had guests. That's all right. Oh, Candy, I'd like to introduce Rolf Herberts. This is Miss Matson and Mr. Watson. It's nice to know you, do. Mr. Herbert is our new baritone. Oh, yes. That's why we're rehearsing tonight. I uh, won't take any more of your time, Dorothy. I just thought we'd save a few moments of rehearsal if I told you that I don't uh, move in that last scene. I sing upstage. 
That will leave you free to take as much stage as you like. Fine, Rolf. That will save time. Thanks. Oh, not at all. I'm glad to have met you, Miss Matson. Mr. Watson. Nice to have hey. met you, sir. Yeah, see you on stage, Rolf, eh? Yes, Rolf. Rolf has a wonderful voice, and he's a good actor, too. You know, I think he'll be even better than Salavini. I've seen him before. Oh, yes, he's been in pictures and on the concert stage, and in opera, too. But he's, he's never really had a good break. This might be it. Uh-oh, that's it, Candy. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave. Certainly, Dorothy. Say, why don't you stand in the wings? You can watch the rehearsal if you'd like. Oh, I'd love it. Come on, then. Follow me. All right, the places, everyone. Places. This is all right, Candy. You can stay right here. Thanks, Dorothy. Glad to have met you, Mr. Watson. Also, as we used to say in the theater, go out there and kill him. <laughs> See you later. Where is Miss Warrenshaw? Ah, there you are. Herbert, where's Herbert? I saw him just a moment ago in the dressing room. Well, it's late. We've got to keep moving. Please, somebody find Herbert. Ah! From way up in the heights of the stage, the opera house was pierced with a blood-curdling scream. That was no ordinary scream. It was the scream of death. You wait here, Rembrandt. Keep your eyes open. I'm going up to have a look. That scream wasn't in the score of Faust. I punched the button for the backstage elevator. It's a good thing they work fast and are speedy. Once inside, I pressed the button for the fourth gallery. I got out. This was the top of the opera house. The place was loaded with old sets, props, paper mache alligators, gold goblets. Then, over on the other side of the catwalk, I saw it. The body of a man all crumpled and distorted. I hit the catwalk and ran over. It was a hundred feet above the stage, and as I looked down, I could see a score of strained faces looking up through the darkness. I got on the other side and bent over the body. It was that of Rolf Herbert. Candy, down here. I think your man just ducked down underneath the stage. Again, I did a Mel Patton. The elevator shot me down to the stage level, and there was Rembrandt, wild-eyed. He came down the elevator on the other side, Candy. Then he cut across the stage and down those steps. Come on, Rembrandt, follow me. I may need help. We ran down the steps and into the bowels of the stage. It looked like a nightmare, a myriad of cross beams of steel for the rising stages. We cleared those and went around by the chorus dressing room. There was only one out. I remembered it. A door over in the corner, very seldom used, but it was open. It led into a long tunnel with giant steam pipes running overhead and to the right. This went underground over to the veterans building. Down by your feet, there's a stream of water flowing in a trough. It's the old Hayes Valley Creek. Our killer decidedly knew his opera house. As we entered the tunnel, I could see him up ahead running like crazy, so we took off after him. We made the other side, and it breaks into a big engine room. As we came into the opening, I looked around. The engineer was lying on the floor out like a light blood spurting from his scalp. Then I glanced up. There was another door. This led into the veterans building itself and an avenue of escape onto Van Ness. I ran up. Then as we got into the long corridor, I saw Martinello breaking for the door. Stop! Stop, Martinello! Stop! You think I am a fool? I do if you don't stop! Try and get me! Okay, pal. You ask for it. <laughs> It was the first time I had ever shot a man. It didn't feel good. But he lived. And later, the doctors of law gave him a little pill. The cyanide kind they dropped inside the gas chamber at San Quentin. Martinello paid his debt. Details? Sure, I'll fill him in now. Martinello loved to sing. Ray Mallard had told me that. For years, Carlo had been hanging around the opera house, hoping to step into a role. This season, a director had jokingly told him that if he ran out of baritones, he'd let Carlo take over. Carlo took him seriously. He lured Salavini down to his restaurant on a fake emergency call, costume and all, and did him in. But then he became frightened. That's when he called me. It was worth $2,000 to have me hush things up. But I don't operate like that. He had a hunch I was going to tip off Mallard. That's when he removed the body from the icebox and dumped him into the bay. Carlo had also been at the performance of Tales of Hoffman. That's when he learned that they'd wrestled up Rolf Herbert to sing in place of Salovini.
By this time, Martinello was obsessed with the idea of singing in the opera house and wouldn't stop at anything. Right after Herbert's left Warren Chode's dressing room, he managed to get Herbert's into the elevator and up to the fourth gallery behind the stage. That scream was produced by a six-inch stiletto through Herbert's heart from the hands of Martinello. And that's when our chase began. I hope I never see that tunnel under the opera house again. That Mallard and his sentiments. It was he who gave me that gun just a week before, for my birthday. He said I needed protection. Well, darn it, I do. But I can't get Mallard to believe me. Instead, he just gives me guns. Listen again at this same time next week. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2A209. Heard tonight were Harry Bechtel as Ralph Herbert, Jerry Walter as Carlo Martinello, Henry Leff plays the role of Inspector Mallard, and Jack Thomas is Rembrandt. Dorothy Warren Schold, star of the Standard Hour and the San Francisco Opera Company, was heard as herself. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. With the exception of Miss Warren Schold, any resemblance to actual people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. Candy Matson comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. And now, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. In a moment, Act One of Devil Stone, starring Christopher Carey and Neil Fitzgerald, and written especially for Suspense by Jonathan Bundy. This portion of Suspense is brought to you by the makers of Parliament Cigarettes. Listen, more and more people are smoking to this tune every day. Parliament gives you extra margin. Parliament gives you extra margin. The filter's recess and made to stay unneat and clean. Quarter inch away, Parliament gives you extra margin. Parliament gives you extra margin. You're smoking neat, you're smoking clean with Parliament today. My name is Martin, Timothy Martin. I live here in Dublin, and very nicely, too, thanks to a considerable inheritance and sale of the family estate in County Kilkenny, which bought a very good price. I have a comfortable cottage, a faithful manservant by the name of Everts, and everything else I need to live an easy, contented life, and without the need of applying myself to any sort of labor. Even my financial matters are no bother to me, though, handled by a penny-pinching old solicitor by the name of Ian Carney. And mine was a contented life. Until, that is. Until a long-forgotten uncle died and left me some property he'd owned but never lived on up in County Fermanagh near Inneskillen. A place known as Devilstone. And then... Uh, but let me digress for a moment. I, I should say, let me seem to digress for a moment. And remember this, please. For it may have much to do with the strange, terrifying tale I'm about to tell you. Deep under St. Mikan's Church, here in Dublin is a crypt. It possesses most amazing properties. In it lie scores of bodies in a state of perfect preservation. Albeit they are hundreds of years old. The old ones used to say it's due to some wondrous form of black magic. Uh, but, but modern science, modern chemistry, has exploded that ancient belief. Has shown that certain gases generated by the unusual composition of the dark, dank earth in which the crypt is located, uh, those gases have produced this amazing phenomenon. Uh, very well. Now, a few days ago, I called Mr. Carney, my solicitor, on the telephone. I've been hoping you'd call me, Timothy. I wish to speak with you about that house and property in County Fermanagh that your uncle left you. 
Well, I've certainly no desire to move away from Dublin, Mr. Carney, so I've decided to rent out the old place. Rent it out? And why not, sir? You really think you can? Well, I'm quite certain I can. I doubt it. Well, as a matter of fact, an American couple by the name of Stoker left here only yesterday for a look at it. I see. I expect they'll be back here a moment now to agree to lease it for the summer. Timothy, you uh, showed them the pictures and description of the place? Yesterday morning. They were, so, they were so intrigued by them, they were all for signing a lease then and there. You'd better to have taken their money and let them do it, my boy. Oh? Aye. Well, I, I'm sure I don't see why. Well, surely they're entitled to look at the place over before they take it. After all, Mr. Carney, never having been there myself, there wasn't too much I could tell them about Devilstone. Exactly as it should be, Timothy. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand you, sir. I mean that now, my boy. You will never rent it to them. Not anyone else who goes there. Why not? Now, why do you say that, Mr. Carney? Well? You... you don't know? Well, of course I don't know. Then perhaps your tenants... I should say erstwhile prospective tenants will tell you. If you ever see them again... Uh, now, what do you mean by... Oh, excuse me a moment, Mr. Carney. Uh, yes, what is it, Everts? Uh, I beg your pardon, sir, but there's a Mr. Stoker here to see you. Stoker? Yes, sir. And if I may say so, he appears to be quite excited about something uh, rather angry. Hello? Shall I tell him you're busy and suggest he see you another time? Timothy! Yes? Uh, no, Everts. Have him come in, please. Very good, sir. Hello, hello, Timothy. Oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Carney, but I have someone here to see me. Uh, no, about Devilstone, Timothy. I, I, I think I'd better call you back. Uh, very well, if you like. But there is something about Devilstone, its history, that you might not be cognizant of. All right, well, I'll, I'll get back to you shortly. Timothy. Uh, goodbye, sir. Well, at least you didn't try to skip out on me. Oh, Mr. Stoker, how are you? Nice to see you again. Oh, it is, eh? Uh, did, did you and your wife get over to look at Devilstone as you planned? We certainly did. And by heaven, Martin, if this is your idea of some practical joke... My what? Sending me alone to that ungodly place would have been bad enough. But my wife... Martin, you ought to be horsewhipped. Now, wait, please. I... I'll have you know that as a result of your having let her go there, you and your twisted sense of humor... What? What is the matter with you, anyway? The poor woman nearly went out of her mind. Mr. Stoker, I just... She still hasn't recovered from it. Sure, sure, I got her back to Dublin, all right. But the doctor has ordered her to bed. Had to give her strong sedatives... Now, I warn you, young man, if she doesn't recover... Now, completely... just a minute, Mr. Stoker. Oh, don't bother, Martin. The less you say, the less I have to see of you from here on out, the better. Here. Here are the keys to that... that place. Now, look here, Mr. Goodbye, Martin. If I ever see you again, it will be in a court of law. Now, believe me, Mr. Stoker, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you so upset about? Oh, you don't, eh? Do you mean to say there's something... something wrong with Devilstone? And do you mean to say that you, the owner of it, don't know? You don't know what, sir? You don't know that that ungodly place is haunted? What? You heard me. Haunted! Could I possibly have heard right, sir? Haunted? Well, that's what he said, Mr. Martin. Haunted? Yes, that's what he said. Oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. But really, really, it's too amusing. It's perfectly all right, Everts. You go right ahead and laugh, and I'll join you. Well, that's about an absurd excuse I've ever heard. Excuse me, sir. You don't think he meant it. But the devil's zone is haunted? How could he? Haunted houses went out of fashion a hundred years ago. No, Everts, it was simply a silly excuse for not leasing the place. Well, now that he and his wife have had a look at it. Oh, but what an excuse. Or does he think that we Irish are nothing but a lot of stupid, superstitious idiots? Oh, he's right, sir. What? I, I, I mean, of course not, sir. Well, anyhow, it's completely ridiculous. So we'll simply forget it. Forget about the Stokers. Place an advertisement in the papers and find ourselves some other tenants. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe we'd best reduce the rate on it a bit. Perhaps that's what scared them off. No, that could be, sir. Or who knows? And perhaps Devilstone isn't in as good condition as we've been led to believe. But can you imagine anyone coming up with an excuse so patently absurd, so completely asinine, and so utterly foolish, and expecting us to believe him, to take him seriously? Yes. What is it, sir? Everts. The truth now. Yes. Do you believe? D do you think? Possibly. Oh, no. No, of course not. It couldn't be. And it... Could that have been what Mr. Carney was talking about? Or at least implying? Mr. Carney, the solicitor? Yes. 
But Mr. Canny seems to be a man of good sense. Uh, he was so definite about it, though. Uh, when he told me I should have let them do what they wanted after they saw the pictures, sign a lease immediately. Before they even saw Devilstone? Yes, yes. They would have, you know. They would have signed and paid a couple of months' rent, and Mr. Carney said I was wrong in not letting them do it, in not getting what I could, and immediately. Uh, would, would, that would have been... Would it have been completely uh, ethical, no? You mean if something is wrong with the place? But haunted, sir. No, no, of course not. Ridiculous. Oh, of course. And yet... Uh, well, there's one way to find out. Yes. Shall I put in a call to Mr. Carney? No, 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 no. By doing that, I'd be admitting that I might believe in such ridiculous possibility. No, no, Everts. You and I will drive up to Devilstone and we'll investigate ourselves. Capital, sir. A splendid idea. Now, you like it, eh? Well, never having seen the place either of us, and after Mr. Stoker's reaction to it, it might be quite exciting, sir. Uh, let's see now. If we leave right away, we should be able to reach Devilstone by nightfall. Yes, sir. Uh, so watch the car and a couple of flashlights, too. Very good, sir. And perhaps... Uh, perhaps I'd better take along a pistol, just in case. And of course... What, sir? Well, to conduct our investigation in the ghostly place and style, we'll take along one of the dogs with us. Say, uh, Red Kim of Hellscoat. An excellent idea, sir. Now, let's get underway. Yes, sir. Well, Everts, if the man at the petrol station told us right... The Ramblin' old mansion you now see before you is Devilstone. Yes. I see. Now, what kind of a reaction is that? Uh, not a gloomy old place, if I may say so, sir. Now, don't you start conjuring up some ghosts. Even Kim apparently finds nothing particularly friendly about it. Now, look, Evans. If you're going to become superstitious about Devilstone... Oh, no, sir. Come along, we'll have a look at it. Come along, Kim, come along. Oh, hey. <laughs> now, let me see if I can unlock this door. Yes, sir, here. Yes. I'll hold the flash on it for you. Good. Uh, I believe this is the key. Well, the door is already ajar. Why, oh, yes, sir. So I see. Well, come along, you two. Come on, Kim. He's protesting rather vehemently, sir. We'll just get him inside and we'll close the door. Yes, sir. Kim, uh, what the devil's the matter with you? Oh, come now, boy. Are you a dog or a mouse? Most certainly is frightened of something, sir. Yes. He doesn't look like a ghost hunter crouched down there in the corner that way. And if I remember the pictures correctly, this door here should lead to a small out enclosed court, sir. Oh, and my word. Just another night bird, Everts. Don't let it bother you. Now, now do you mind why, telling me why... Why did you do that? I beg your pardon. What, why, you're still over there at the door. And yet, I distinctly felt something or someone bump against my shoulder. And I thought someone walked on past me. Look here, look here, Mr. Martin. Yes? What is it? In the mud, out there in the court. Shine your light on it, sir, where mine is. Why, why, yes, footprints. Big ones. And fresh. And do, do you see? More of them are being made even as we look at them. No. Yet there's no one there to make them. Impossible. I, I know, sir. But you're right, Evans. You're right. I'm back inside now and quickly. Yes, sir. Now, whatever is making those footsteps can't follow us. It, it does feel a bit safer in here. Uh, no wonder Kim is frightened. There were things like that going on. Uh, but why? And how? Uh, do, do you suppose, sir, that one of the old lamps could be lighted? Well, if they have any oil in them. And it shouldn't take us long to find out if they... 
Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. Now, what are we acting this way for? It's trickery, that's all it is. It's trickery. But by, by whom, sir? And why? Well, that is something we shall have to find out. Now, where is Kim? Oh, there he is, still in the corner. Sigmund Freud. Do you suppose, sir? No. Nonsense. Whoever it was that scared Stoker and his wife out of here is trying to scare us now. And I mean to find him out. Yeah. But the dog, sir. And if it's true about them and, and, and that there is a ghost... Nonsense. Now, we'll just look about here. <laughs> Where? Now what's the matter? <laughs> that door. At the other end. What? Behind you. It's opening by itself into a small room beyond... Uh, good. Then we shall start our investigation in that room. Well, uh, are you coming? Uh, yes, sir. Oh! Oh, clumsy. Now you dropped your flashlight. I didn't, sir. I didn't. It was knocked out in the hand. It what? Honest. Honest it was, sir. I swear it, sir. Now, Everts, don't be silly. Go on back in there and get it. I'd I, I really rather not, sir, if you don't mind. Oh, oh, the door. It's closed by itself. And now we're locked in. Oh, we are, eh? Who did this? Who closed this door? Who's there? Who's there, I say? Same what? What? The same thing. Oh, what are you talking about? The same thing that struck your shoulder, that made the footprints in the mud, and that frightened poor Kim so badly. And frightened you, too. But I say it's trickery. Trickery. It has to be. Who's doing this? Answer me. Answer me. Your death begun. Your death begun. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess we'd better. Yes, sir. Uh, no, no. Not a bit of it. Please, sir. Please. In the name of heaven, sir. No. We're going to stay right here, Everts, until we find Your out. Your death begun. No, no, no. Not until we learn just what's going on and... Where's that voice coming from? I've tried to warn you. Oh, please, sir. They have tried to scare us, that's all. Tried to scare us. Yes. Yes. So that you'd leave this place. Why? Because if you do not, you will suffer the same fate as the dog. Kim? Fate? What are you talking about? Oh, look, sir. The door is open. Again. Yes, look. In the light of the flash that was dropped in there. Kim! Everts. Everts. Kim is dead. Then, Mr. Martin. Oh, please, sir. I, I, I beg of you. Who did this? Who did this? Show yourself. Yes. I will show myself. Look. What? Oh, oh, look, sir. Out, out of thin air. Yes, yes, yes. I see him. Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin. Yes, yes, yes. All right, all right. We'll leave. Come along, Evans. Come on. <laughs> Yes, 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 Mr. Carney. I thought at first it was trickery or perhaps some kind of joint hallucination by Everts and myself, induced perhaps by the gloomy atmosphere of the old house and whatever it was that Stoker had said about his wife and her being so terrified. No, my boy. Uh, but when it actually happened, that he actually appeared there before us out of thin air, this misty, tenuous, impalpable figure, and then when we found there wasn't so much as a little mark on Kim, the dog, who up to that moment had been as healthy as I, 
Why didn't you tell me about whatever it is in that, 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 that inhabits that place when I talked to you on the phone? I tried to, Timothy, but you cut me off. And after all, I'd known about it only as a legend from hearsay. And he was a huge man and powerful, this ghost. Yes, I should say it was Jason O'Flynn, your ancestor, who built the place for his wife. It was to have been her castle. It was? Yes. But the first day she sought to enter into it, she fell, tripped upon the threshold, she struck her head... And she never regained consciousness. I see. The doctor was summoned, did all he could for her, there in a smaller room off the main salon. Yes. But she died that night. And then Jason O'Flynn swore by the book that no one would live in that house but he until his body turned to dust. He walked out of that little room then and was never seen again. And ever since that time... But now you know the rest. Wait. Yes? Until his body turns to dust... His own words. And he wasn't seen to leave? No. What are you thinking of, Timothy? I'm going back there, Mr. Carney, tomorrow in daylight. Hmm. I, I, I just don't get it. And I certainly found no signs of hollow walls or hidden panels on the floors above, sir. And yet, Everett, somewhere... Somewhere close to that small room. Hmm. Don't you think it's best we simply leave the place and... and, and uh... No, no, no. No one but he. Will... What? Until his body turned to dust. What, sir? And although there must have been other people about, he wasn't seen to leave. And to me, Evers, that means only one thing. Somewhere in this house lies the key to this mystery. We've been here most of the day, sir, and we've found nothing. And it's getting on towards dusk. I know, I know, I know. But until I find some... Oh, but sorry, sir. Let me help you. The old rug was so badly wrinkled, it's no wonder you tripped. Wait. Everts. Listen. Very, very hollow floor, I should say. Here. Help me fold this rug back. Yes, sir. Here now. And look, a sort of trap door. And fitted in the floor so tightly. Yes. And this, it looks like a seal around the edge. Why, yes, sir. And a heavy lift and ring. Well, then give me a hand. We'll see if we can raise it. Now. Oh, it's very tight, sir. Yes. Uh, but the seal is giving way a little. Yeah. Put everything you have into it now. Ah, good. We made it. Must have said it hard over coming up out of that place. Yes. Yes, Everts. Like that in the caves, or the catacombs under St. Mikan's. You mean where all the, the, the bodies and, and... Yes, quickly now. The flashlight, give it to me. Here, sir. Now, now, look, 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 look down there on the earthen floor below. Do you see? Do you see? The wrists are cut. He killed himself. No. No, it's he. It's the ghost that we saw. Yes, Everts. The body of Jason O'Flynn. And so perfectly preserved as, as though he died only moments ago. Oh, it's horrid. Until his body turned to dust, he said. So we know now. Now that we've found it. So please, sir, let's leave this place. Uh, wait, Everts. Wait. What do you see? Now the fresh air has reached it. Oh! Oh, good Lord! Yes. The color is leaving the cheeks. The pallor of death is taking its place. And yes, now, at long last, the body will turn to dust. No longer will Jason O'Flynn walk the night. Requiescat in pace. Suspense. You've been listening to Devil Stone, starring Christopher Carey and Neil Fitzgerald, and written especially for Suspense by Jonathan Bundy. Suspense is produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Heard in tonight's story were Gilbert Mack, Walter Grisey, Reynold Osborne, 
and Frank Milano. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical direction by Fred Cusick. Associate director, Bernie Seabrooks. This is Stuart Met speaking. Every weekday evening, Chris Schenkel is anchor man for a globe-girdling roundup of first-hand reports on sports activities everywhere. Make this your address for worldwide sports every weeknight. He who laughs oftenest, here's Arthur Godfrey time weekdays on the CBS radio network. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Outside the Straits of Gibraltar, to the northwest of Cadiz, lie some of Spain's most beautiful beaches, protected by island sandbars. And to the south of Cadiz, the towering mountains begin to rise, on one of which, Monte Alegre, is the hacienda which holds the heart of this story. Approaching it by car at this moment are Chad Reynolds and Elizabeth Monroe. But you haven't told me about the Senora Escobar. La Doña? To give her a full title? Oh, no. She's not to be mentioned. Why not? Because she is dead. You remember that little lodgy I showed you cut into the mountain? The wedding present. Uh-huh. It um, turned out to be her tombstone also. <laughs> mystery drama, The Devil's Leap, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mercedes McCambridge. All men love beauty in a woman. America has worshipped a long line of beauty queens, sex symbols, love goddesses. And today, as of this moment, one of the, perhaps the best loved, is Elizabeth Monroe. Sitting with her agent Mark Burns, a longtime friend, at a table at Madrid's brightest, newest, and most expensive nightclub, La Ronda. What's the matter, Liz? What? You're not eating. Oh, no, no, I, uh... <laughs> Oh, stop worrying about me. I'm uh, washed out. You shouldn't have let me book you into this place. Oh, don't be silly. I was here for retakes on the picture, and I had this... Well, I wanted to sing again, Mark. I mean, in front of people. Listen, you could go home, take the Hollywood Bowl, and fill it and get your heart's desire. The wine? All right. No, I didn't mean that. I meant... Oh. Oh, hey, you spilled it. I, I'm sorry. No, I... no, 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 no. I'm the one that's sorry. Well, why did you start so and turn away like that? I just didn't want that boy crossing the dance floor to see me. You mean Joe College or whatever he is? I mean Don Pedro Escobar de Villarmo. Oh, okay. So outside of his name, what's his particular problem? It's just that he hates me. He's male, and he hates you? Enough to kill me. And with reason. When I think of what I once had to do to that boy, I... <laughs> Mark, I can't stay here. Come on. I'll have to go back to my dressing room. Okay, Liz, well, I'll bring the dinner back here. Why the sudden flight? I told you, Mark. It's that boy. Are you really afraid of him? Maybe I better... No, no, not physically. It isn't like that. I... If he's going to be in the audience tonight, I don't want to sing. Well, that's not in the contract, Liz. Two shows a night, dinner and supper at a queen stipend. Not enough for you, but it's what you insisted on signing. You should be taking a rest between pictures. Who needs this? I told you. I had an unstoppable yen to go back to my beginnings, to be with people... Something that lives and breathes and reacts. 
so that you can feel it. It began a long time before you found me. I couldn't get anywhere at home, but here in Europe they liked me as a singer. And it was here, in Spain, in Cadiz, that I had my first really big success. What was I then? Well, not all that young, really. I was 27, I guess. Have you ever been in Cadiz, Mark, in the height of summer? The waters, a dancing fire, sparkling a thousand colors under that burnished sun. The skies are high and blue and cloudless, and the faces of the people shine with love and laughter. One night at dusk, one of my most insistent uh, suitors, a party boy from the American jet set with too much money and too little else, was driving me to a weekend party at the Hacienda Monte Alegre, which is the home of Don Emilio Escobar de Villarmo. Oh, Chad, for heaven's sake, take it easy on the curves. Have no fear, lady. I wouldn't risk a hair on that blonde and lovely head. Well, I'm just a hard-working nightclub singer who's looking for a restful weekend. I don't promise you rest at Monte Allegro. It's apt to be more fiesta. I, uh, hope. Well, it'll be a change of scene, anyway. Are we getting near it? Yep, very soon now, on this next band. Hey, Look up there at the mountain as we go across the bridge over the gorge. Hmm? You see that little loggio up there like a like an eagle's nest? Yes. Oh, it looks like it's cut right out of the mountain. It was by Don Emilio. Wedding present for his wife. Oh, there's the most magnificent view from there. Cadiz to the north, Gibraltar to the south, and the whole Atlantic beyond the sandbars stretching into infinity. Ah, what a lovely wedding present. Turned out to be a pretty deadly one. Why, well, what do you mean? Oh, let's drop it, Liz. What do I call my host? Well, if you want to be very formal, El Senor Escobar. More intimately, or I mean uh, informally, Don Emilio. Well, which do you suggest? It's up to you. You're going to find him unbending, remote, and very much in the tradition of the Spanish Grande. And the rest of his household? One son. His only son, Don Pedro. His nickname is Perico. He he just came back from a year as an exchange student at Princeton. That's how I met the family, through my kid brother knowing Perico. He's a strange guy. He's shy and intelligent, but he... Well, just let's leave it. He's strange. How old is he? About 17, I guess. He's kind of young in a lot of ways for his age. 17? I'm surprised he's a very young son for Don Emilio because he's he's not that young. Oh, well, he seems older than he is. He's uh, had quite a bit of sadness in his life. But come on, Liz, I don't want to depress you. You haven't told me about Senora Escobar. Ah, La Doña. Well, she's uh, not to be mentioned. Oh, why not? Because she's uh, she's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it recently? No, uh, five years or so ago. Look, uh, do you remember that little loggia I told you about? The wedding present? Oh, yeah. It uh, turned out to be her tombstone also. What? The road down to it is closed up. No one goes there anymore. <laughs> the natives think it's haunted. They call it El Salto de Diablo. You mean the Devil's Leap? That's right. One night five or six years ago, part of the balustrade gave way, and Don Emilio's wife fell a thousand feet down the mountain from there to her death. Well, you're certainly making this weekend sound less and less attractive. Well, to compensate, I guess, Don Emilio has surrounded himself ever since his wife's death with color and gaiety and young people. That's why he asked me to bring you. <laughs> You'll see. Oh, look, look, look. Oh, how gorgeous that is. I don't know how to describe it. The famous carnations of Monte Alegre. Oh. Don Emilio's hobby. I suppose there isn't a color or variety he doesn't grow. They were her favorite flower. They say that when she was found, she had a blood red one clasped in one hand.
And that was how I first came to the Hacienda Monte Alegre. The happy mountain. And my host, Don Emilio, I found to be gracious and formal. Less cold than Chad had led me to be. And while he stood aloof from the merriment, it was not he who brought the chill with the coming of dusk as if the ghosts of long-gone days still lurked in the shadowed halls. No, the most tragic ghost of all was the pale, intense young man with the great liquid brown eyes who hovered on the edge of the gaiety as though haunted and unbearably sad. Hello, Don Pedro. Senorita. We haven't had much of a chance to talk since we met. I am not a very good talker. I saw you talking to my father. Yes, naturally, he's my host. Yes, but... Uh... But what, Don Pedro? Oh, please, it is a formal. You will call me Perico, perhaps? Please, Senorita Monroe. All right, it's a very nice name. And uh, I am Elizabeth. Elizabetta. <laughs> no, my friends call me Liz. I want to be your friend. Would you uh, want to to promenade in the garden before the light goes? Oh, I'd love it. Thank you. So much smoke in here and noise, and those are two things I want to get away from. Come with me, senor. I, oh, I mean, Liz. I must talk with you. Even in this fading light, they are still so beautiful. Los claveles. I beg your pardon. Oh, uh, the carnations. They were my mother's favorite flower. Would you like to see where she died, Senorita Liz? Why, I, I... I want to show you. Because I think you should leave here tonight. Now. If I asked you to, would you? Why, Perico, I can't. I'm a guest. You will come with me so you will understand why you must live here. I went with him, almost mesmerized. I don't know why. I should have thought of danger with this strange, intense, tightly wound boy. It's like the mainspring of a watch ready to snap, like an explosion waiting to occur. But there was something so appealing about him. So I followed him. Beyond the carnations to a gap between the rocks now boarded up by a heavy oaken door. But he veered to the left of it. And then after a moment, he moved aside a heavy rock that swung on a pivot. And we went through. And down some steps in front of us. Until we emerged onto a flat stage that hung almost suspended in space with a summer house built against the mountain and then a balustrade guarding the drop below. And with a start in the twilight, I realized that I was on the devil's leap, the spot Chad had shown me from the road below. Why, why did you bring me here, Perico? Because I had to warn you. There is death here, Liz. My father desires you. I could see it in his eyes. Don Emilio? Oh, really? You... I do not joke. I know my father. He kills everything he loves. And I do not want you to die as my mother died. Come here to the balustrade, and I will show you. In the half-glow of twilight, there is something strange and terrifying about this tortured young man. What wild fancy has opened up his shyness and made him pick on Liz to bring to this deadly spot? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Instinctively, Liz clings to the solid safety of the loggia, backed by the mountain. Invitingly outlined by the last reflected glare of the sun, which has just set, Perico stands by the low balustrade, a few scant inches from a plunge of over a thousand feet. You are in danger here. 
from your father? Oh, I can't believe that. Can you believe that five years ago, by the time I was 12, my mother lay down there, 1,100, 1,200 feet down, crushed and broken on the rocks? Yes, I've heard that she, uh, had an accident that the balustrade gave way. It was no accident. My father threw her over because he had tired of her. The balustrade was broken later to make it seem like an accident. Very cool. Oh, how can you think such things about your father? You, of all people, should be able to see how your mother's death very nearly destroyed him. Not her death. His guilt. Well, how can I argue with you? But I am sorry for you. Sorry for me? Why? To live with such hate locked up inside you. Oh, look, Perico. Look down at those magnificent beaches. They're the best in all of Spain. And there are fiestas, festivals, and bullfights. And even this week, a carnival. Oh, yes, the carnival. Yes, and this year bigger than ever. With real sideshows and a carousel and lots of games. And a Ferris wheel. Yes, a Ferris wheel. I, I've never been up in one. Oh. Could we... Could we go together? Caramba, how I would like that. Will you go with me, senorita? Liz... Uh, yes, please. Would you? Oh, we could have lots of excitement and fun, huh, Perico? Magnifico. Will you let me take you with me? I think that would be just... Magnifico. And exactly what is everybody singing Magnifico about? Don Emilio. Perico, you know who I am? Si, senor. Then do me the courtesy of addressing me correctly. Oh, yes, me. Padre. What are you doing here? You know this place is forbidden. How did you know I was here? It's beside the point. You have not answered my question. Why do you have to spoil everything? Always. You forget yourself in front of a guest. Leave us. It's all right, Liz. You'll be safe. I know you're here. Perico, what do you... <laughs> I must apologize for my son. I hope you will forgive him, Senorita Monroe. But there's nothing to forgive. I found him charming until... Until I appeared, huh? Eh, it's for nada. It was not difficult to know that you were missing and Perico is always on my mind. I had a sudden uh, uneasiness. When I saw the rock was out of place, I thought I might find you here. Well, I should be the one who apologizes, really, but Perico was so anxious to bring me here that I he didn't want I am. I don't know if Perico brought you here. Well, what he has been telling you? Well, he's been telling me that he has never been to a carnival and that he would like to escort me to the one in Cadiz. Senorita, I would not want to impose on my guests. Oh, I've already accepted. Subject, of course, to your approval. What can I say? I am only sorry that I am not the one to be your escort. Ah, the wind is rising. Yes, not a good place to be. You'll forgive me as a bad host, but I cannot stand this place, senorita. El Salto de Diablo, where... Well named. Oh. Senorita, what is it? Well, that lovely red carnation. You've crushed it in your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. It was meant for you. We will find you another on the way back. I lay awake for a long time that night. I wondered about that long ago accident or suicide or... Yes, I wondered too if some guilty secret had laid its pall over this uneasy house. 
But washing all that out of my mind was a wave of pity for two lonely people. A proud, unbending older man and a shy, hurt boy whose world had been shattered before he'd even had time to build it. Both of them were haunted by a tragedy that should have brought them closer together, but which instead had driven them apart. a man who is he then? Fire! How can it not hurt? <laughs> it doesn't seem to. But the torch is burning the paper. See? <laughs> Aya, look here! It don't look a lot. A woman that is mostly fat. <laughs> come, please, come. It was hard to recognize this excited, well, boy. But that's what he was like. To imagine him as he was now, full of bubbling good spirits as being the same person as the pale, retiring, tortured Perico of Monte Alegre. And as I followed him from booth to booth at the carnival, I found that I was feeling as young and as full of life and laughter as he. Now come, we must ride the ferry's wheel. We entered our little cage at the bottom of the huge wheel, and seconds later we were whirling upwards... And suddenly Perico's hand was grasping mine, his eyes darting about the carnival below, all eager and pleased. And then just as suddenly, as we stopped at the crest, his grip was agonizingly strong. What, what, what is it, Perico? I, I am afraid. Why, there's nothing to be afraid of. It is like El Soto del Diablo. So I about... Oh, no, no, forget about that. You don't understand. It is when I am on heights, I have this. I want to to throw myself over or push. No, no, you're not going to fall. Not while I'm with you. Oh, if only you could always be with me, Liz. But then nobody is. Nobody, I... I'm sorry. You're sorry for what? And yet... Oh. There you are, you see? Now there's nothing to worry about. Here we go, down again. Everything is all right. But everything was not all right. A shadow had passed across the bright day. And something twisted in this boy sprang back like a spring released to its original form. And that challenged me. I promised myself that before I left Cadiz... I would try to banish that shadow. In the next two weeks, I saw a lot of Perico. We swam together from the golden beaches. We laughed and danced at fiestas. We sat entranced at the bullring. I stayed too at Monte Alegre a great deal, playing chess in the evening with Don Emilio, or dining at the great carved oak table while he talked of poetry. Or the theater, or the past glories of Spain. But my time with father and son was mostly divided. I could not bring them together. And at the last, at the end of my singing engagement, I had to leave Monte Alegre. Suddenly, without warning, and forever. <laughs> We had gone, Perico and I, that last day on a picnic far from the hacienda. It was a drowsy, lazy summer's day. And after the picnic lunch, we lay back, dozing in the shade of an orange grove. Que dia maravilloso. I could die this moment. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> oh, I mean because I am so happy. I am too... What a pity it has to end. To end? Oh, yes, Perico. I can't be on vacation forever. I've got to leave and get back to work. You cannot leave me. What should I do? <laughs> well, you go to college, find new friends. I do not want new friends. Well, for your father's sake. Don't mention his name. I hate my father. Oh, I don't think that's true. He killed my mother. No, I don't think that's true either. You talk to my father. Have you asked him? No. 
It's as hard to talk to him sometimes as it is to you. To me? Yes, to you. Even though you say we are friends. Friends? You are not my friend. You are... I am what? Oh, tu eres mi vida. I, I adore you with all my heart. Te amo. Te amo. No, Te amo. no, 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 no. No, 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 not me, Perico. Oh, no. Oh, what a fool I've been. I should have known. Why? Because I am so much older. No, when I've been with you, I've been thinking of you as a... Don't say it. It is my fault. Now I'm so ruined. Oh, I never meant to tell you. It's hopeless. Perico. Completely hopeless. Perico, come here. Don't touch me. Of course I'll touch you. Come here now. There. Here in my arms. Listen to me. There's nothing so terrible about love, Perico. Would you wait for me? That's up to you. You have so many things to finish first. There's college. And where you want to go with your life. You have a world to conquer. Oh, if I could, I would lay at that feet. <laughs> so I think that you could. But first, conquer it. And yourself. Then it is not hopeless. Nothing is ever hopeless, Perico. Nothing in this whole wide world. Why did you bring me down here, Don Emilio? I don't quite know... Except it is a place where we can be completely alone. And this is your last night in Andalusia. At least it's before twilight. And the view is indescribably lovely. As you are. I can tell you one reason I brought you here. I have a story to tell you before I... I ask you to marry me. To marry you? But I... I know. It is strange. I never thought love could come to me again. But it has. Well, if for no other reason, for Perico's sake, I can't marry you. He's in love with me, too. Love? A boy? A child? Oh, no, no. A young man. Your child has grown up very fast, Don Emilio. Yeah. Why must something always stand between me and the one I love? This wretched place. The home of the devil himself. Even the moon rises in blood upon it. Well, then, once again, let it rise and sink on it. With the same sudden violence as he had earlier crushed a blood-red carnation in his hand, Don Emilio moves across the terrace towards Elizabeth Monroe, and she, in sudden and unanticipated terror, braces her back against the balustrade that is the only protection between her and the sheer drop below. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Don Emilio moves fixedly toward where she stands at the balustrade of the terrace, a thousand feet above the jagged rocks below, Liz's terror is only momentary, because almost simultaneously she sees that the Don's eyes are not fixed on her, but on the void beyond her, and instinctively she flings herself back against him, dragging him away from the awesome drop. No! No, Don Emilio, no, no, no. No, that's not the answer. That's never the answer. Let me go. Let me go. And repeat your wife's mistake. My wife's mistake? Yes. What do you know about my wife? Nothing. 
Only it's obvious that between you and Perico, who should know best, neither one of you thinks that her death was an accident. How could you know that? I don't know that. It's only my guess. Perico thinks you pushed her to her death, and I think that you believe that Perico was the one who caused it. Would you like to know the truth? If it will help you and Perico. It would be a relief to tell it to someone. And perhaps just once to be believed. She was very beautiful, Dolores. Almost as lovely as you. I loved her. How can one measure? I would have gladly died for her. And even though I was older, I thought she loved me. Then came a summer like this. Five years ago when Perico was 12. We had gone that day to a corrida. And the matador was insolent, slim, young, careless. But Dios, he was magnificent in the ring. And your wife, Dolores, fell in love with him. All that summer... He was to fight in Andalusia, Cadiz, Granada, Sevilla. Sometimes she followed him. And when she didn't, they met by night. Here, in this lodge, in the shadow of my own roof. And all this time you stood by and said nothing. She would not hear me. I kept thinking it would end. She would see this empty, strutting pigeon for what he was and come back to me. Till at last, I knew I must end it. You? You don't mean that Perico is right? No. I bought this strutting peacock of a matador off as I should have in the beginning. He walked out without a backward look. And, and and your wife? One night, Dolores stole from the house down here to the devil's platform. I thought perhaps I... I don't know what was in my mind. I stumbled down here blindly, half expecting to find them together again. And on the way, I have a half memory of looking back and seeing Perico running in the shadows somewhere. But when I got here... I don't know what I might have done if I had found them. Instead, I found... Don Emilio, you'd better finish it now that you started. Cleanse my soul? <laughs> I found myself alone under a blood-red moon till I looked over the parapet. And there, far below, she lay broken and bloodied as the moon and the carnation we found in her hand. An accident. I mean, the balustrade was broken, wasn't it? That had happened in the rain, said day or so before. So it was what I finally guessed. A suicide. I might have learned to live with that. But not... Not what? Oh, you can't think that Perico could possibly have... We both loved her so... Anything is possible. The curse of our heritage is too much pride. Too much pride? You think that Perico might somehow have found out about his mother and that he... I cannot allow myself to think such a thing and to the best of my knowledge he has never known and does not to his day. Uh, well now, what is there left to be said? I had hoped watching you and Perico together and from all the times we have been together that somehow what has been lost could be found again. I had dared to hope 
And she would marry me. To bring you and Perico together? I am not a totally unselfish or incapable of love. No. First, for yourself. Then the other. But for you to marry Perico... Marry him? No, 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 no. I'm much too old for your son. As much as I love him. You have all his trust and confidence. And his heart. I know. I blame myself for that. Senorita, forget the Escobar, Femi. There is nothing you can do for us. Well, maybe I can. If I can face being cruel enough. Okay. First love is full of pain. And it is sometimes better to be cruel in order to be kind. I think perhaps what this situation needs is a new villain. Yes. That's the best thing I can do. What are you going to do, senorita? I'm going to help you try to find your son. Yes, who is it? Perico. Oh, Perico. All right, come on in. When not the Elise? Isn't it a beautiful day? Everybody seems to be smiling. What are you doing? Well, as you can see, I am packing. To leave? Yes, to leave. But yesterday you were not planning to leave. Why not? Oh, don't you know about women, Perico? They're just like the weather. They're subject to change without notice. There is a man. The Chad. Or someone. You are in love with another man. Oh, don't be silly, Perico. Don't treat me like a child. Well, then don't act like one. But yesterday you said... I mean, I thought you were going to wait. I thought you loved me. Yesterday was another day. That was sweet and amusing and it suited my fancy. But today, I am going away. Now, will you please lift that bag off the bed for me? Yes, of course. But I cannot understand you. Well, then don't try. And I'm not going to apologize. Yes, I led you on. Only to find that you are not ready for love. Just as I did with your father. My father? Oh, yes. Did you know he asked me to marry him? He... What? Oh, why do you act like that, Perico? Your father's lonely, too. Well, that is his fault. He got what he wanted. Are you so sure? Have you ever talked about it? You two? No. And I never will. Besides, he has nothing to do with this. What matters is you and me. Oh, there never was a you and me, Perico. Or me and your father. I'm sorry. It was a long, hot summer. It amused me to play with both of you. But now that game is over. I will kill myself. Oh, I hope not. Why don't you talk to your father about it first? You might learn something. All right, I will. At least he is a man. A man you can trust. But I say one thing before I leave, Senorita Monroe. Yesterday, I say I love you. With all my heart. I take back those words. Today, with... With all my heart. And forever. I hate you. And I don't blame you, Perico. Right at this moment. I'm not very fond of myself. And that's the end of the story, Mark It was the last time I saw Perico Until he walked across the dance floor tonight And that's why I fled to my dressing room with you Because I was so afraid to face him But the story isn't finished What happened? Did your gamble work? I don't even know I haven't heard from either one of them since I left Penice. Oh, Lord, look at the time. I've got to get made up and ready. Would you get that for me, Mark? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, she'll be ready. What? Yeah, I sent him in. What is it? Is it my cue? No, no, relax. you got a few minutes. Okay. Excuse me. 
Oh, thanks, Arturo. I'll handle them. What is it? Like about the biggest bunch of carnations I ever saw. With a note. A note? Well, I haven't time right now. What does the note say? I think you better read the note yourself. Oh, dear, where's my fan? And my gloves, too. No, you got time. They'll wait for you. Read the note. Okay, give it to me. Let me see. Oh, dear Liz. The carnations are from my father, who has told me the whole story about how you left Monte Alegre. When I read that you were to sing at La Ronda in Madrid, I had to come to hear you. I wanted to thank you for giving me back my life and my father's. Would it be too much to hope that you might join all of us at our table afterwards? Con todo mi corazón, perico. All of us. Uh, uh, there's a, a postscript there. Oh, yeah. For many reasons. Mainly that I want you to meet my fiancé. Oh, Mark, I'm so glad. It worked for them. That's your intro, baby. Better get going. All right. Except... What? Oh, Mark, I'm so tired of this. The pressure and always being on. I want to be me just the way I was that summer. Okay, Liz. We can arrange that, too. If you want to. Oh, if I want to. It's always been an open contract between us. All right, then. I'm closing it right now. And we can announce our engagement when we join the Escobar. Oh, I don't want to crowd you. <laughs> How can you get any closer? <laughs> I just woke up to what I should have known all along. Yo te adoro, dear Mark. Con todo mi corazón. Reunion with Perico and Don Emilio and the new young bride-to-be after the show was a warm and wonderful one. And Don Emilio, older and frailer now, was exalted beyond belief by the coming marriage of his son and, in a sense, his daughter. I'll be back shortly. some cynics who might phrase marriage as el salto de diablo, the devil's leap. I cannot answer for Perico and his bride because I lost track of them. But as for Liz and Mark, the leap was upwards, never down. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Robert Dryden, Ian Martin, and Christopher Tabori. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>